So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 1045 a.m. session of the November 24th, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regularly scheduled meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying at home to view today's city council meeting. If members of the public would like to comment on an agenda item, please call in at the beginning of the item that you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note that there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen through your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, uh, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes, and you can hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Catherine, you're muted. I. Uh, she means here. Um, Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Present. Watkin? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Okay, so to start off uh, this our open session, uh, we're going to go ahead and have a few presentations. We're going to start with Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz, uh, presented by Emma Usad, Trails Program Manager and Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz. And for presenters, I'd just like to ask that um, if, it's, if you're not presenting, please turn off your video, and we, when, when it's your turn to present, we'll ask you to turn your video on. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Emma. Thanks for giving me the time. I'm just going to share my screen real quick um, and uh, share a quick update with you. All right. So quick update on trail ma maintenance that MBOSD has been doing in City Park. Um, by the way, Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz is a nonprofit trail building organization. So yeah, I just wanted to start off since it's been a while and start from March. So in March, COVID-19 hit, things were pretty quiet. We had to stop all of our volunteer trail work opportunities that we were offering at the time uh, while we figured things out. One thing that we did from March um, through, or starting in May through June, is we started tabling at all the local trailheads and a lot of local parks state parks and city parks um, included. And the two locations that we were at in city parks were at EMT, Emma McCray Trail, and Yukon. So we created a pretty big uh, poster that we put out and we had a really long list of uh, recommendations for trail users. So during those first few months, we spent a lot of our time educating the public on trails, encouraging folks Mass, encouraging folks not to travel from far away, um, things like that. And so we had two shifts of people working every Saturday and Sunday out at all the local trailheads. Then uh, come July, that's when we actually had these protocols that were in the last slide kind of put together and we had permission from City of Santa Cruz Parks and Rec to start volunteer trail work again. So since July, we've been doing quite a few volunteer events each week. Um, pump track maintenance on Thursdays, every Wednesday night until the time change, we were doing a Wednesday evening trail work event um, in Moore Creek Preserve and in Pogonis. And then we've been doing Saturdays at De La Viega, so just like a three hour event. And so we're really lucky that we got to start trail work again and have this kind of cool resource for people to help out with the trails, especially since trails are really reaching an all-time high <laughs> with youth. 
right now. So uh, some upcoming work we're gonna be doing is we have a plan for the Nature Loop reroute to do seven volunteer events there and make some updates there, as well as the upcoming De La Viega work plan for 2021. Um, just kind of outlines all the work that we're, we're gonna be doing for the next year. So here's an example of some of the work we were doing during all of these events. As you know, it's been pretty dry without a lot of rain, so we haven't been doing much digging. We've actually just been picking up trash on all of the trails and also brushing all the sight lines. It's a really important thing to do. It reduces user conflict. These trails get a lot of use, which I'll get to later. Um, so here's a first time volunteer, Erin. This was her first time volunteering. She picked up a bunch of garbage. It was awesome. So our stats for since that time, since around end of July, um, here's all of our stats for all the open spaces that we were working in that are City of Santa Cruz Park. But the totals in short were 109 volunteers were working um, 253 hours total. And so here's a really big stat that I wanted to pull up that why it's just so important. I think this is something that gets lost is these are the these are the numbers for University Connector Trail, Yukon Trail, which starts at the top of uh, Emma McCrary Trail or the Rincon Road and goes up to UCSC. These are the actual use numbers um, of that trail alone. So 3,000 trips last week, 11,000 trips the last month. 62,000 trips in the last six months. So this is wild. I mean, this is showing how much trail use there really is just on one trail and why it's so important that we're out there having this opportunity to work on the trails. So that was my update, nice and short. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions um, or I'm here right now. Great, thank you for that presentation and all the hard work that you all do to help maintain these trails. Um, I'll turn it over to Council Member Golder. I just wanna say thank you to you and your organization for all the wonderful work you do out on the trail. I know Council Member Brown and I walked that trail this week and then I walked it again yesterday. So um, it does get used a lot and I appreciate all of the hard work we see from the volunteers. If people wanna get involved right now, what is the best way they can get involved? To help. Yes, so just going on our website, mbosc.org, um, something fun we're going to do in 2021 is every first Saturday of the month is going to be a first-time volunteer event, so like limited to only people who have never volunteered before, and it's going to be like more of like education about what we're actually doing, why we're doing it, as well as trail work. So I would say that's a really good opportunity as well. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just, uh, Emma, I just wanted to thank you and, and, and Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz. Um, our, as you said, our, our parks and our trails are just, that's where everybody's going. And so it's great to see people discovering the, the amazing parks that we have in Santa Cruz. And so, uh, but with those numbers, uh, 62,000, that's pretty amazing on one trail. So I'm um, really glad you guys are out there and also just really glad that you're able to kind of just maintain in general. Um, I appreciate the trash pickup. Sometimes those things aren't, aren't the funnest things to have your volunteers do, but it, it's just uh, maintaining our open spaces as well in terms of, um, you know, garbage and, and other needs. So thank you for everything you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Council Member Matthews. Just what they said. You're great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, hearing none, uh, it'll be great for us to be able to stay in touch with you all and learn about opportunities for us to be able to get out and help support the work you do. So thank you again, and, and we look forward to hearing more about uh, what you're doing moving forward. Yay, thanks so much for the opportunity. Have a good one. All right, take care. Bye. All right, the next uh, presentation on our agenda is the Neighborhood Courts Program. Um, the presenter is Elaine Johnson, Program Coordinator for Neighborhood Courts. And so I'd like to welcome Elaine to our City Council meeting. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be here this morning to share with you about this amazing program called Neighborhood Courts. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and walk you through a brief presentation and open it up for questions afterwards.
Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. So again, my name is Elaine Johnson. I am the program coordinator at the district attorney's office here in Santa Cruz. And, um, you know, after two, two plus years of having a vision of having a restorative justice program implemented in Santa Cruz, we are launching the neighborhood courts program. Let's see what, not quick. Hold on, let me try to shrink you down here because for some reason it's not clicking. Oh, there we go. So people say, so what is neighborhood courts? Neighborhood courts is an alternative to the traditional criminal justice system. It's a pre-filing diversion program that is community and volunteer driven. So the conference that we that is held is all by members of the community. We use restorative justice principles instead of punitive principles. It's held in a conference that is confidential, participation on behalf of the participant and a victim, if there's a direct victim, is completely voluntary. And we address the needs of the offender, the victim, and the community. So in neighborhood courts, well, we want to use restorative justice principles versus the traditional principles. So in court, you may hear language such as what law was broken, who broke it, and what punishment is deserved. But when we use restorative justice principles, we're looking at what harm was done, who, what are the, the needs of all those involved, and how can we repair that harm for all those involved? And so how the program works? Eligible cases are diverted from the DA's office to the neighborhood courts program. The participant must be willing to take full responsibility for the harm they have caused. That is, is a priority in order to be eligible for the program. We use a restorative justice conference, which consists of community members such as yourself, the offender, who we call the participant in this program, the victim, if applicable, and again, there's no judges, no juries, there's no courtroom settings, no, none of that sort of thing, no attorneys. It's all community driven. And during this confidential conference, we have the volunteer panelists, which will consist of three community members and the participants. And in that conference, they will discuss the harm that was caused if there was a direct victim to the direct victim and the community. And then they will take this time to dive deeper into the root of why this crime may have happened. And then collaboratively, they will work on selecting some directives that are specific, attainable, that are restorative to the participant, the victim, and the community. This program is designed to set the participant up to be successful and not to fail. So during that conference, when the three panelists and the participant come up with some directives, which are agreements for the participant to complete, when they have two months to complete them, once those directives are successful, the case will be dismissed and the DA's office will not press any charges and there will not be any record. The person is free to go. Now, if there are additional services that the participant may need, we will make sure those services are offered to them. Now, if a participant chooses not to resolve the neighborhood courts program, if they don't do their directives that they were assigned to do, the case will be rerouted back to the DA's office. But in that process, in the two months that they have to complete the program, I will reach out to them to make sure they're on track. You know, the agreements are gonna be designed where they're really attainable for the, for the person. Um, and as we get down there, I'll show you some of the agreements, some sample agreements. So as we kick off the program, we've identified 12 low-level misdemeanor offenses that we will start with. And so we have petty theft and shoplifting, vandalism and trespassing, disorderly conduct, drunk in public, misdemeanor assault and batteries, drug possession and drug paraphernalia, receipt of stolen property and possession of burglaries. As the program grows, as we go down the line, the eligible cases will definitely, definitely grow. And for the eligibility of the participants, they need to be 18 and over. This is their first offense, and they only get one, there's only a one-time participation in neighborhood courts. They must take accountability for the incident, and they must be willing to pay restitution if it is warranted. Now, neighborhood court volunteers, who are the hub of this program, are community members. We invite them. We actually just had a two-week training. We just finished up the training this past weekend. 
We asked for a commitment of two years for um, community members and one year for students. And, and what that commitment means is it, it does, doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be participating in every single neighborhood court for the next two years. Is we just like to have a pool of people that we can, can pull from and know that they will be available for at least two years. And of course, they will participate in the neighborhood court conferences. Now, if there's a direct victim involved, they have an option to choose to participate or not participate. You know, they have the option of having somebody from the victim's advocate's office, department in our office to assist with them, to either attend the conference with them or to write a victim's impact statement and have it read at the conference. But the victim has that choice. And here's a list of just some examples of some directives that may be forfeit to the participant um, for them to complete in the next two years. So you, of course we have community service and with community service, um, one of the things that's important is that we wanna make sure we tailor the, the services that that is gonna make the, the participant more successful. So something that they really like and enjoy doing because we don't want them to just, okay, say, do they're gonna do 10 hours community service, but you know, we want it to be some sort of lifelong goal of some sort. You know, of course, we may have them attend some 12 step meetings, apology letters, and that could be to themselves, to their family, to if they, um, a store, store manager, um, you know, just, that's just to name a few. Um, of course, if the victim is, is requesting restitution, they must pay restitution. And we may have them write a reflective paper. Since we're in COVID, a lot of the directors we're looking at right now are, are having them maybe watch some, for example, if someone has been charged with petty theft, um, there is a video that they can go watch for a couple hours and then we want them to write a, a, a paper on what that meant for them. You know, the video will explain to them the, the bigger impact of what petty theft can cause and those sorts of things. And so the goals of the conference is to have community driven solutions. We want the community who is affected by the harm to have a, a voice in restoring the harm. It'll reduce the burden on criminal courts, which will save us a lot of time and a lot of money. And it'll do reduce reoffending. Um, I talked, I spent the last few months um, working with San Francisco, who was the first county to launch neighborhood courts, and Yolo County and the city of Los Angeles. And, the, and their success rates, well, we'll see that toward the end, but their success rates and the testimonials they share with me of people that have gone through the program who have gone on to live successful, meaningful lives is really encouraging. And in the last eight years, uh, San Francisco, as I mentioned, they, that number is, is now over 4,000 cases and their success rate is about 93%, which is very impressive and Yolo County in seven years in 1,600 cases, they're about 93% as well. And I look forward to Santa Cruz County having those promising numbers as well. Well, I'll just pass on. So ways to get involved, um, we just, um, we got about 55 applications, which I was really impressed with to volunteer and we just trained the first 24 um, and, we, and there's people on the waiting list you know, because as we grow, we, we will continue to invite, have more people on, on the panel. So if there's anybody you know that is interested in the program, you know, that you can have a go to the DA's website and fill out an application, and I will definitely put them on the waiting list. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. I will stop here. Okay, well, thank you so much, Elaine, for your leadership on this program and for um, bringing it to the city council and make us aware of everything that's going on. I'm really excited to learn about this because I've been hearing a lot about it, and um, I, will, I will likely be visiting the DA's website to sign up as well because I think this is something that have a lot of positive benefits for our community. Um, so I'll turn it over to Councilmember Golder, and then we have Vice Mayor Myers and Councilmember Watkins for questions and comments. Thank you. This is such an exciting um, change in the justice system that I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, the positive outcomes from. I'm just wondering if someone was to sign up, what would the time commitment be, like, um, aside from the two years, like like a weekly, monthly, so they can wrap their head around um, it? Well, once we get going, um, the plan is right now to do one conference a week as we grow. So, you know, I, I tell volunteers that, you know, maybe every other month they'll be, have an opportunity to do a conference. So the, the, it's not that much time. 
not much time that either. It would be like one whole day or one no, hour? No, no, no. No, the conference is about an hour and a half. Okay, so if someone was going to sign up an hour and a half every other month or something at this point. Cool. That is correct. Exciting. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. I just want to uh, express my thanks, Elaine, for your leadership on getting this mm -hmm. up and running and for the county to um, take the initiative to get this started. It's um, very exciting. I've read a lot about this approach, and I think it really fits well with our, with our community. So I'm just super excited and great that you got 55 people who are interested in participating. I think as, as, as the information gets out, I think more and more people are going to really see that this is really about healing, healing each other and healing our neighborhoods so, um, and our community. So thank you very much for, for putting the program together. Thank you so much, Tim. Councilmember Watkins. I would just echo those comments. Thank you for the presentation and extend our gratitude to the DA's office and for really the leadership to move in this direction. Um, you know that we worked together on restorative justice programming for youth and the, um, the healing is not only for the individual who caused the, um, the harm in the community, but it's also for the community as a whole and that holistic approach of really repairing harm is so much more powerful, especially as an, a diversion option for uh, individuals to go a different path. So mm -hmm. I am really excited that this is happening for the adult setting. I know it's been uh, challenging more so for adults to uh, have this kind of approach to uh, the mm -hmm. criminal justice system, but it's so, uh, it's so important and wonderful. And at some point, if you or the DA's office would be willing to come and present after it's been up and running some mm -hmm. of the outcomes and successes and approaches, that would be wonderful just to kind of keep, uh, keep this on our radar and ways that we can, as a city can also support the work. So thank you very, very much for the presentation, Elaine. Thanks, Martina. I sure will. Thank you. All right, if there's no further questions or comments from council members, Elaine, I want to thank you again for being here today, <laughs> and we look forward to hearing how this program develops over time. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. All right. All right, so the next presentation on our agenda is uh, Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Presenter is Serge Cagno, Executive Director of Recovery Cafe. Um, and I'll just say earlier this year, way pre-COVID, um, I was able to actually sit down with some folks um, from other cities who had developed a Recovery Cafe program. And I won't steal Serge's thunder, but uh, I thought it was a really good uh, model of what day services could look like for homelessness in Santa Cruz. And, um, Serge offered to come and present to council, and so I thought it would be a good opportunity to hear about this uh, potential option for the city of Santa Cruz. With that, I'll turn it over to Serge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good morning, council members, um, and thank you for the presentations that just went, the mountain bikers and all of the work they did, and neighborhood courts is a pretty amazing thing for Santa Cruz. Um, I'm one of the volunteer panelists for that, so really looking forward to how that turns out. Um, today, talking about Recovery Cafe, um, Bonnie, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, Recovery Cafe creates a supportive healing community for individuals recovering from life's traumas. I'll talk about how that happens uh, at, throughout the presentation. The past year has been a time of stress, fear, and community challenges. Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz supports people in their healing from life's traumas, offering a welcoming smile and a free cup of coffee in a safe community setting. Knowing each participant, supporting them in their goals as they define for themselves, we give support and realistic feedback to help personal growth. The cafe helps those in housing stay in housing. We help those who are experiencing homelessness to stabilize and move forward and with their desired goals and job readiness skills, shelter, health, addiction recovery, and more. Bonnie, would you do the next slide? The Recovery Cafe is focused for not any one particular group housed or unhoused, for recently housed people who wanna stay on track with their goals, people who have completed residential treatment or, or are in outpatient care and need additional structure and support, individuals living with a mental health diagnosis who need community to combat isolation, people living on the street seeking to make steps towards recovery and stability, and individuals re-entering the community from jail and prison seeking strong and sober support. Next slide. 
So the Recovery Cafe is a site-based program pre-COVID. Um, in 2003, Seattle started the first program. Uh, different programs started up, and in 2016, they started a network so that other communities could decide whether they wanted to start their own independent program based on that model. There are now 23 different um, sites around the country, each one independent. The Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz RCSC, we received our 501c3 status last month, and we also received our first $50,000 donation. Uh, next slide. The membership is pretty simple, uh, 24 hours of sobriety, um, attend, agreeing to attend a weekly recovery circle, and willingness to help in some way, depending on what somebody's abilities are, um, to help the community uh, within the cafe. Next slide. We have a, a bunch of different programs when it's site-based. Um, we try to do meals. Uh, we try to have peers learning, peer leadership, taking over different responsibilities. Community participation, something in the neighborhood about cleaning up the neighborhood around the site. School for recovery, um, a model for recovery. Um, Drop-in activities, depending on whether that's an art class or a job readiness skill. And a weekly required recovery circle led by a trained facilitator. Next slide. So there's weekly support groups, which we call recovery circles. We have a trained facilitator. We have eight to 10 people per group. Members create their own goals and the facilitator is helping it be a group conversation. So peer to peer accountability and required attendance um, for membership. Next slide. So when it's site-based, which may be post-COVID, uh, guest speakers coming in, um, either somebody from Homeless Garden Project or from different programs uh, coming in to do presentation, health fairs, uh, getting HPHP to come in, community resources, uh, getting people connected, music, art, writing, depending on what sort of groups people ha want, uh, holiday celebrations, always have coffee, caffeinated and decaf for some, meals and getting case management uh, within the program. Next slide. The School for Recovery uh, is about life skills um, because boredom and depression also lead to difficulty with recovery. So there's different aspects for recovery and addiction, life skills, inner healing, healthy living. Next slide. So for the mobile program, what the way that we're creating something new during the uh, pandemic, um, we're offering weekly meetings at partner agencies, like talking to different food pantries, talking about setting something up outside on the time that they have a food pantry on a certain day for a couple hours, offering coffee to people who are willing to be consistent. We're talking to the homeless shelters also, um, talking when they have space, whether that's inside or outside, and different kinds of programs. Mobile program, definitely temperature and symptom checks, required mask wearing, and social distancing. Next slide. We offer, for the mobile program, free coffee, a weekly confidential recovery circles led by trained facilitators. We'll also talk, be talking to people and do referrals for benefits, housing, treatment, job training, et cetera place where people can also meet with their case managers. Some people are a little hard to find in our community. And it's gonna be a place where they definitely have a supportive community, definitely somewhere where they're welcome. Our needs as this moment, uh, we're looking for partner partners for mobile sites. Um, we're in negotiations with a couple different programs and we're willing to have more conversations setting up um, certain groups based on the population, depending whether it's a one of the isolation quarantine motels or whether it's a food pantry, um, depending on whether other members from the community can come or whether it's just that group. Um, we're looking for a little office space and a little storage space just for our, our tents and our stuff like that. Um, we're looking for funding, we're applying for grants. Um, we got our first $50,000 uh, grant um, in the last month or so, looking for volunteers who want to be a part and asking for people to spread the word. 
and just say that we're here. Uh, any contact information, if anybody wants to get in touch with me to talk about programming, um, you can send me an email. We got a website, recoverycafesc.org, also on Facebook, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, well, thanks, Serge, for that presentation. It's come a long way since uh, you first uh, provided a presentation to me, and so I'm really glad to hear that you all are kind of getting this, um, this nonprofit off the ground in our community. So thank you very much for all your work. Um, are there any questions uh, from council members on Recovery Cafe? Council member Golder. So thank you for bringing this and you were pretty clear about how people could um, sign up to help. And again, the same question for the others, what would kind of be the time commitment or, or expectations or you know level of experience that someone would bring if you're looking for volunteers? Uh, good question, thanks. Um, I think it depends on the person. I think we'd, we'd like people who are consistent who can start creating relationships. Um, the hope in the different There are enough volunteers, so everybody is getting one-on-one -on -one conversations and people are able to build relationships. We want to build community. Um, if people want to come for a shorter version of things, you know, whether that's just donating coffee or something or just wanting to make coffee and not really wanting to interact, I mean, that's okay, too. I mean, giving comes in lots of different forms. So we're definitely willing to um, accept people who are, want to be less interactive or people who want to be trained to be facilitators. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it's exciting to see a program like this um, emerging in Santa Cruz, and I appreciate your leadership. I am wondering, um, so obviously things are uh, more in COVID time, so that I imagine that has some effect on you know, how you, <laughs> or major effect on how you um, set these, um, your sites up and all of that. But just it, kind of more generally, um, what's your vision for kind of expansion of this program? You know, how many sites and, you know, what are you thinking in terms of the coverage kind of countywide, um, how, that's, how you'd like to see that roll out? Nice question. Um, in the dream form of things, it was funny that because just before COVID, we were in the final stages of signing, uh, making an agreement for a site in Santa Cruz at, because we had a fiscal sponsor at that point. Um, and then as COVID happens and gathering is a less um, suggested thing. Um, so eventually post COVID when we can have a site um, having a site in Santa Cruz and a site in Watsonville, um, having staff that are there so that, which has enough funding and enough support to actually make sure people get to their medical appointments, make sure they get to their court appointments, make sure they get to whatever other connections they need, um, and case management, making sure people get connected with different services. At the same time, you know, a place where somebody can be safe whether that's getting out of the rain, whether that's just having a place where other people are sober too, whether they want to interact, whether it takes them, they don't want to interact and it takes them months to build relationships before they're willing to really talk much, which is okay. Everybody moves at their own pace and healing. Um, but yeah, that's the goal. Um, I like the idea that right now we can be more, we can offer it to anywhere to any program just based on like having a conversation, making sure there's space and it can be safe. But eventually we're gonna have to have a site-based thing and it's gonna be people are gonna have to find a way to get to us rather than us right now being willing to negotiate to get to them. Yeah, thanks for the question. Serge, I had one question for you. I'm just curious to what extent or have you been engaging with the county at all? Because um, I know you mentioned the, the hotel program, but I was just wondering what kind of communications you've been having with the county and um, especially as it relates to being able to offer these services at places like the Armory and some of the other places where we have uh, shelter currently in town. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I'm actually contracting with the county on helping them with training and policies, procedures for the vet calls. Um, so I've spoken with uh, the motels and we've offered that 
Uh, there's flyers there. We're just trying to figure out um, to have enough people who are interested because it's a completely voluntary thing. Um, we could do a Zoom kind of meeting, um, but depending on if there are more numbers at more places. And the same thing for the vet halls. We're in discussion whether we can use some space um, at the vet hall. Um, and it's there's just, I think for all of us, there's just so many things that we've been working on throughout this year and new things keep cropping up. Programming is the thing that we want to add to our shelters. Um, the armory um, and the, like, the, the bench lids that just moved up there and the vet halls. Like, one of the things that is true is as we try to continue funding for these things, we're not sure of how long the funding goes. So doing some programming to moving people to help get people engaged um, and feel connected um, is a big value. It's really a lot of people don't want to be engaged. So this kind of social program is something that helps them more willing to accept housing and the other kinds of help. So definitely in those negotiations and I will keep you informed how, uh, as those progress. Great. Are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, Serge, thank you again for all the work that you've been doing, and thank you for that update on what's been happening with Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Stay safe, everybody. All right, take care. Okay, so our last presentation is a presentation from the California Homeless Union LLC. The presenter is Roxanne Burdick, California Homeless Union Outreach Coordinator. And um, I just want to clarify, I'd, I'd had some um, – interactions with Roxanne earlier this year when COVID first started and she had mentioned how there was a group that was working um, with food pantries and that were really trying to assist with getting food to um, people who are experiencing uh, homelessness in our community. And this is a group that's separate and different from, um, I know we received some emails from Keith McHenry and from um, Alicia Cool and I think Anthony Prince, and this is a different group from those individuals. And so um, they've been um, commenting on how they've been expanding and making progress at um, offering food to homeless individuals within our community. I thought it would be a good opportunity to have her speak uh, to council today as an alternative for offering food to homeless individuals in our community. So I don't, I'm not sure if uh, Roxanne, if you're on the line, or if there's a representative from the group. Um, why don't we take a short break? I'm going to see if I can um, get in contact to see what might be happening. See if Roxanne will join us. Why don't we take a, a five-minute break and reconvene at about 11.30. turn your videos on and we can go ahead and continue on with the rest of our meeting. All right, so it appears that uh, Ms. Burke had some technical difficulties, so she's just going to be calling in and um, see her on as an attendee. So I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to Roxanne to give us a, a brief update on what the California Homeless Union is doing. Roxanne, if you can hit star six on your phone, it'll unmute you. Oh. Try it again. Good morning. Sorry about that. Uh, first, um, we would like to thank uh, Mayor Justin Cummings and City Council for inviting us to speak. As the Outreach Coordinator for the California Homeless Union, I am happy to report we have been able to accomplish some great things while helping many members of our community experiencing food insecurity. We have been able to accomplish this through many 
community partnerships with local nonprofits that provide vital services and support to those experiencing homelessness and facing food insecurities, victims of domestic violence, so on and so forth. We have done all of this without monetary donations or crowdsourcing. For example, through word of mouth, we were able to connect with the Walnut Avenue Early Childhood Center with a local grocer providing over $15,000 worth of food don donations so they could better utilize their food grant since their needs have for their families have drastically increased because of the pandemic. Additionally, we sought out other struggling pantries and diverted donated food that would have otherwise gone to the trash. And we have continued to provide them with support and resources. Furthermore, we have only partnered with groups that compost any unusable food donated in order to decrease what, what, go, what doesn't go to the hands of the needy people becomes feed and does not end up in our landfills. We, the California Homeless Union, believe in doing this, these things for the betterment of our community. We believe this can accomplish through community partnerships rather than through taxpayer funding, think tank, funded think tanks and committees. Our recommendation to the council to help our community help ourselves is to pass an ordinance requiring grocers and restaurants within the city limits donate more than 50% of their potential food waste to local nonprofits. I myself, Roxanne Burdick, have experienced homelessness in my um, early adulthood, and if any of these services were provided to me, it could have made my life a lot easier and spent more time trying to seek out jobs, housing, instead of having to seek out food. Um, I, I would love the city to partner with us and maybe uh, go with our suggestion of asking the restaurants to um, provide 50% of their, like I said um, prior, of their food waste to the local nonprofits. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from council members? Council Member Brown. I thank you for the uh, the um, overview of what it is that you do. I'm sorry you weren't able to sign on and um, so we could see you as you made the presentation, um, but thank you for being here. I, thank you uh, for having me. Um, um, you know, trying to work more uh, proactively with local restaurants. I know there's a lot of that work goes on, but um, you know, trying to to be more proactive about that is it's a great idea. I I'd love to find ways to support that. Um, and then I was just wondering if you could, because um, I can't. I'm not sure um, if your organization is the California Homeless Union. Do you have how does that work? Do you have chapters in different locations or space? No, here? we we. We are solely based here in um, Santa Cruz, and we um, we have three board members. Um, we are not affiliated with any other chapters. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I had a question. I was just curious. I know that you mentioned um, working at food pantries um, during COVID, and I was just curious if you can maybe speak more to, you know, what kind of food distribution you all have been doing, what food pantries you've been working with, um, other organizations throughout the county that you've been working with? Um, we've been working with, um, we've been working with, we've, the, we've been working with pantries in the Pajaro Valley, helping people who not only are homeless, but are having um, um, problems providing food for their families, even though they are housed and work. Um, we we do anything from, like at the soup kitchen, we we donate a lot of goods to the soup kitchen. We give them because um, they have to do a bagged lunch, so we do protein bars, we do bread, we give them anything that can go into a bagged lunch that gets donated from our grocer. Um, we, I mean, we get so much food that can go that gets distributed throughout from Santa Cruz all the way to the Pajaro Valley. And I, I would just, I guess, follow up with that to whether you can give us an understanding of, you know, how your services have expanded, and I guess what are opportunities, um, you know, to work with the city around the food distribution for homeless, because that's obviously something that's a big deal in the community is ensuring that we can get. Um, homeless individuals or people who are food insecure connected. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. 
Um, well, we would like to, because right now, solely, we are doing all the pickup and drop off to all of our locations. So if the restaurants could help don't deliver their food directly to the places where food can be um, handed out, that would help a lot. Um, also, I mean, we've, we have um, offered to work with the city in the beginning um, to provide a nighttime meal um, because we do have a kitchen. We have access to a kitchen. And so, if, um, but we were never really taken up on that opportunity, but we would still love to do that. Because a lot of these food services are daytime. And so um, what we've seen is that the food is just distributed during the day and then they don't, you know, if they don't save the food throughout the day, they don't ha really have an option for a nighttime meal. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I, I guess I know that a lot of restaurants are really struggling right now, and I'm wondering if you reached out to any restaurants just to sort of start a relationship and pilot kind of opportunity. Okay. Um, we haven't reached out to any restaurants yet. We wanted to bring this forth to the city first to see what they thought. I know that they are struggling, and I know because I um, have spoken to a lot of business owners that they are having a lot of waste because people are afraid to come out, they're afraid to eat out. And so I think it would be a great idea for us to utilize the food instead of it going in the trash. Yeah, I, I wonder if, you know, one suggestion would be to, to reach out to restaurants specifically to see if there's any that would want to partner with you directly. I guess my other question is, is I'm, I was just a little confused about the emails that we received in May, or maybe you have more clarity. In in regards to the, the, the type of organization and then the broader statewide organization and sort of you not being affiliated but having your own sort of thing happening here. Uh, so are you a nonprofit or I was just trying to, I'm trying to. We, we actually are not a nonprofit. We are, um, we, uh, we have, um, we are an LLC. We're operating as an LLC, but we do partner with multiple nonprofits in the town. Okay. Or in the county. Okay. Like uh, like the soup kitchen, the Walnut Avenue Shelter Child Early Childhood Development Center. We feed all the children that go to that school there. Um, some pantries in the Tahoe Valley. Also an animal rescue where our um, compost, anything that can't be used can go into the compost and help feed them. And maybe for clarification, I can just follow up with a question. Is, I, there is another group in the city who says that the California Homeless Union and so I guess maybe to what my colleague was asking is, how do you all distinguish yourselves from that group or what, what kind of distinguishes you all from them so that there's no, because I think that there's a potential for there to be confusion um, when there's two groups with the same name in the community, so I guess. Um, so our main, our main goal for Santa Cruz is not to um, be activists, but to be proactive and to provide and not, you know, I feel like, the other group can kind of stir up some trouble a little bit here and there, and we want to be a positive force in our county and help as much as possible. We've And we've done so much in the little time that we have become the LLC. Okay. All right, are there any further questions from council members at this time? Okay, hearing none, uh, Roxanne, thank you for providing us with an update on the work that you all are doing. And as you continue to grow, let us know if there's opportunities for collaboration um, as it relates to uh, food distribution in our community. Yeah, we'll start um, reaching out like she suggested to local restaurants, and then I'll keep you updated on how that's going. Okay, great. Sounds okay, good. thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes our presentations, and so I have a few announcements and we'll move on to the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If members of the public would like to comment on any item, instructions will be provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note that public comment is only heard on items that council is taking action on and not on regular updates or reports. The items that will be opened up for public comment in, during today's meeting are items numbers 9 through 25 on our agenda. Um, at this moment in time, I'd like to ask council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none, I'd like
like to ask the clerk if there's any additions or deletions to our agenda today. Uh, so, again, uh, I'd like to ask the clerk, are there any additions or deletions? It looks like the clerk, I'll have to come back. It looks like the clerk's, um, it looks like her phone or microphone is, is gone. So I'll come back to that. Um, I'd like to make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to comment and speak on items that are not on our agenda today. And oral communication is anticipated to occur on or around 7 p.m. this evening. Uh, I'd like to ask the, the city attorney to provide an update on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. Uh, this morning, closed session uh, involved uh, one uh, conference with legal counsel regarding liability claims. Uh, those are the claims of Lauren Willis Brown, Bailey Property Management, and Isadora Karcher. And those are also listed today on your afternoon agenda uh, on the consent calendar as item number 13. It was also a conference with legal counsel concerning anticipated litigation, and the council received a report from the city attorney's office on two items of potential litigation. Uh, there was no reportable action. Thank you. Um, I'll circle back. I'd like to ask the uh, city clerk if there's any additions or deletions to today's council meeting. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the city manager uh, to report and provide updates on city events and business items. Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, Council. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to have our uh, Principal Management Analyst, Ralph Demerica, provide the council with an update on the street vending work that he's been doing uh, per council direction. Uh, so I'll turn it over to, to Ralph, who can give you an update on, on the work that's been done with the vendors and uh, those uh, stakeholders involved in, in trying to come up with a way to provide for street vending in our beach area. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mary Cummings and Council. Uh, Ralph America, Principal Management Analyst at the City Manager's Office. And um, it's my pleasure to be here today to provide you um, with a brief update on the progress that staff has been making with regards to sidewalk vending on Beach Street. Um, so hopefully you guys could see my slides. Um, here are the main points for my um, update today, um, just really briefly. And, um, that uh, right now staff is currently conducting an inclusive outreach effort to ensure vendors and um, business concerns are heard and considered in this process. Um, Beach Street is a unique location and it really requires a creative solution. Um, overall, um, public health and safety is our priority and um, there's several city departments involved in finding a, a path forward. And our goal is to have a usable, um, process um, in time for the uh, 2021 season. And um, as, as you saw, I saw, okay. um, we do have an, ex an executive order that was issued in mid August and that prohibited vending on Beach Street, the Wharf, West Cliff Drive, and um, Main and Cal Beach. Um, this expired, but however, due to ongoing COVID 19, um, uh, to, uh, the, due to the ongoing COVID-19 emergency, it was replaced by another executive order. So um, as of today, and um, as it stands currently, vending at these locations, including Beach Street, is still prohibited. Um, we are um, continuing our outreach efforts. We're talking to vendors, um, the community, and businesses along Beach Street uh, on sort of their concerns and their experience with the um, what happened and um, sort of situation overall. And uh, we did have a um, meeting with about a dozen vendors in September, um, and it was in collaboration with Community Bridges. Um, we had PD on there from, from the city. Um, we had PD planning um, and a representative from the city manager's office, which was me. Um, and we wanted
wanted to make sure it was an inclusive um, outreach effort. Um, we provided translation services and the invitations um, and the agendas that were sent out were both in English and Spanish. And it was a really productive meeting. Um, several concerns um, were discussed and um, a lot of uh, the vendors brought up a lot of issues and sort of the challenges they were facing um, with the previous model that we had. Um, but on top of that, we also um, asked them what solutions would work for them. And uh, a couple of the things they brought up was um, the, the limiting of future permits and um, having assigned spaces, um, having clear guidelines and improving communication with the city. Um, so there was sort of that, that ask to have a more um, defined process for them. And uh, we also heard from several businesses in the area and, um, and we're continuing to work with Community Bridges for a follow-up meeting after Thanksgiving with the vendors. So, as I mentioned, um, health and safety is our priority during this whole thing. Um, and B Street is just a really unique situation. Oh, uh, B Street is a really unique location. Um, as you can see here, just even on a really slow day, um, when you have four people walking down, three people walking down the sidewalk, it, it really um, starts to get crowded already. You have the bike lane here and the benches here. And um, right now we do have social distancing signs up and it really creates, um, a, it, it gets really crowded really fast. And um, so with, with that, um, we did have to get creative and really look at different places to consider. Um, and right now finding the location is one of the goals we have. And this is one of the ideas that we're looking at, which is this patio area right here and um, that's how it might look um, but this isn't um, the final uh, location as I said um, finding a location is, is one of our challenges um, another challenge we have is finding a process that's fair and um, works um, for the vendors and the businesses um, you know trying to figure out how many permits how many sites and how to distribute permits moving forward and all of that is another um, priority of ours um, so we're going to have a follow-up meeting with the vendors probably um, after uh, Thanksgiving and before uh, the end of the year. Uh, we're working with com uh, Community Bridges to set that up. Um, there's a few challenges that we're trying to work through with this location. And, um, and um, yeah, and, but we're, we're working with several departments um, to figure that out and trying to see if this is a place that we want to move or this is a location we want to move forward with or if there's other options. Um, but ideally, um, before next season, we want to have a new permit process in place. We want to have a limited number of permits. Um, we want to make sure that the spaces are marked and um, that the, ch the challenges that departments and um, community members and vendors themselves brought up are, are addressed um, in the process. So um, ultimately we wanna have clear guidelines for the vendors. Um, we wanna improve communication between them and the city. Um, as I mentioned, have assigned space, spaces, um, limit the number of permits and have a, a process in place for 2021. Um, some of the challenges we're, we're dealing with right now are um, discussing the, the site that I showed earlier with the Coastal Commission. Um, they had a couple of things that they wanted to discuss. Um, the, the site's also being used by um, salsa dancers. It was last year, but with COVID in place, um, I'm not sure if that's gonna uh, continue next season. And um, the um, sidewalk bending also impacts city staff and um, our day-to-day -day, um, sort of uh, action and activities there too. So we're uh, reaching out to different departments to see how, you know, um, using this site, what would impact them. Um, but that is sort of where we are right now. I'm also available to talk to you guys one-on-one, -on -one, uh, get your um, input and any ideas you guys might have moving forward. And I can answer any questions you might have right now too. All right, thank you for that update. Yeah, I, I would just say with that site in particular on Sundays, I know that right now, you know, we're trying to keep people distance, but I know the salsa dancers have been there for a really long time. And so trying to figure out, you know, how we can accommodate both is going to be really critical because that's a, a site of, of long, um, long use for dancing on, on Sundays. So, uh, 
Okay, Donna Myers, then Councilmember Matthews, and Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, Ralph, I just had a question. Um, thank you for the report, and thank you for all the efforts. Um, it sounds like the communications has really gotten to be much more um, beneficial and, and proactive in terms of really problem solving the way through this for everyone. Um, one complaint that I received from not everybody, but from some of the folks who do have is at least some of the retail locations down in that area is sort of the overlap in product in terms of, of sort of what's being vended um, and then also what's being um, sold in the stores. Did you, was there, was, did that come up in any of the discussions uh, either with the stores along that area? Um, so in other words, people pointed out to me, you know, boogie boards, towel, you know, the, the kinds of things and, and that there was sort of an inherent sort of conflict in the in the actual items being sold as well because if they're being sold at a store then we're receiving the sales tax and other things um so i just curious if, if that kind of communication had come up in any of your work um to date so those discussions have not come up yet um we are holding um another um meeting with the vendors to discuss the details and sort of additional restrictions with the permits moving forward that'll help some of the challenges that the business owners and the vendors are seeing themselves. And um, so I, I will add that to the list of items that we'll, we'll discuss at that meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for your work. Okay, Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, I agree with Justin's comment about the salsa dancers. <laughs> That's really a, a great activity. Uh, very participatory, so keep that in mind. It will come back at some point. Um, it's my understanding that because of court or legislative restrictions that the economic impact of the vending um, has limited applicability. Maybe Tony can speak to it. It is a big issue. It's kind of the unspoken, uh, <laughs> it's the elephant in the room, really, uh, for this whole discussion. So maybe Tony, uh -huh. you can speak to that. And then my other question, then I'll be done, is um, again, my impression is that this is beach specific. It has nothing to do with so what's happening on Pacific Avenue. My own feeling is that we, it would be good to have uh, some greater leverage, let's just put it that way, about depending on Pacific Avenue. Um, when we talk about downtown recovery and trying to keep our local merchants alive, et cetera, that's been an issue for a long time. So those are the two things. Is economic impact on the existing uh, uh, businesses even an issue that can be considered in the permitting? And then how does it relate to downtown? Yeah, I think we need to be pretty pretty careful about um, that the uh, extent to which we can adopt regulations for street vending under the new state law, which um, yeah. allows the city to promulgate regulations for the purpose of protecting public health and safety, but specifically uh, excludes perceived uh, competition with brick and mortar businesses as a public health and safety issue. So we're pretty limited in that in that uh, regard. I would just add, unfortunately. Uh, couldn't agree more. <laughs> All right, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Golder. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for all your work on this, Ralph. I really appreciate the update. Um, I am wondering, in terms of the conversation, um, you know, I know that there are kind of, the, the vendors are a, a somewhat uh, diverse group and, you know, demographically, geographically, et cetera. Um, I'm just wondering how, like, of the vendors who showed up, I mean, how, how did you outreach? I, I know you did, um, communications in English and Spanish, but how did you uh, reach the, kind of the wider vendor uh, community and kind of how many people showed up? I'm wondering kind of what the, um, what the uh, participation level was and who was there. Uh, our initial invite was to the uh, business license holders that we had on file and that was about six to eight. Um, we sent that email, both English and Spanish, to community bridges who had um, connections to more of the vendors that we did not have um, contact info for. And um, 
we um, they also ask the vendors to spread it through word of mouth. Um, that is, um, I, I think, the most impactful way to get the word out in that community. Um, we had about, I'd say, a dozen, maybe 12, 14 vendors on that call. Um, we had a couple of community organizations who were supporting um, their efforts to get permits at the city and county on that phone call as well. And um, we had a couple of translators too, just so ours wouldn't be overwhelmed. But we had about, I'd say about 30 people on that phone call, uh, 12, 14 or vendors. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Golder. Thanks for your work on this, Ralph. I know um, there was an issue with trash. Is that something that's been discussed as well? Yeah, so our executive order um, right now, um, well, the previous one, the first one did mention that vendors would have to take their trash um, out with them and not use um, city trash cans in the process. Um, that, well, that expired, and um, so that was a previous um, sort of regulation we had before we put the executive order in place. And it's also another issue or concern that um, our, uh, our our city staff brought up um, when we are trying to create this permit, <laughs> permitting system moving forward. Um, other cities have similar regulations in place, and um, one thing that we wanted, uh, a takeaway we want from our next meeting with a vendor is to really set um, a number of rules um, that we could um, include in these new permits that we're handing out to kind of um, make the guidelines and expectations clear between them and the city. Um, and that's one of the major issues that's been brought up that we want to include in that permit. Okay. I've got two other ones. Um, one is, is there, if say someone is non-compliant with the structures that are put in place, is there a process where a permit could be re re revoked? Uh, we could we could look into that. I mean, um, well, what's interesting for that um, what's interesting is from that meeting we had with the vendors is they want like more regulations and clearer rules because a lot of the competition was coming from vendors who weren't following the rules and weren't applying for permits, and um, it was really making it challenging for those who were trying to follow um, the city's protocols. Um, so I could, we could work with the city attorney's office and maybe planning on trying to see if we could include that in our permit moving forward. Yeah, I remember it was not really com creating a fair playing field. And my final concern is, um, so I'm all for kids doing lemonade stands and kids selling stuff and little entrepreneurs and even, you know, high school age kids working with a work permit. But more than once I passed down there and I saw kids and so I understand like parents have to bring their kids to work, especially like dirt right now. But I have a huge like concern for child labor and human trafficking. And I just don't know like what measures are in place or if anything could be in place to prevent any children being exploited through um, these types of vending. And, and council member Golder, you guys are, are um, as council members are definitely, you know, in touch with the community and are hearing the community's concerns on, on these issues. So um, after our um, meeting with the vendors and um, talking to local businesses and we have this list of um, regulations and things we want to add to these permits, I'd love to sit down with any, any of you to see if we are missing anything or if anything needs to be considered that we didn't think of. Um, and that's something we could do. Um, so I would say probably early mid January would be a good time frame as to when we could set those meetings up. Thank you for your work. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, to follow up to Renee's comment about um, consequences of not following the uh, guidelines, um, intrinsic in any permit is if you don't follow the guidelines. <laughs> You're either on probation or it's revoked. I mean, that seems pretty straightforward. So, um, and enforcement was a, one of the major issues that yeah. city staff brought up. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, prior we had them really spread out, and um, there, there were um, individuals who had multiple sites using one permit was another issue um, that was raised. So, um, hopefully, by um, having really clear spaces marked out and um, ensuring that you have to have your permit with you on your site and you can't be vending without your permit on you um, will address uh, some of those concerns.
And then, Ralph, I had, I had one more question, which was, um, what's the timeline kind of look like, or what are you all hoping for in terms of a timeline for um, being able to get this program in place, or what are some of the next steps? Because oftentimes members of the community are curious, and you know they want to have updates and information on what's happening. So I'm just kind of curious about what the, the time frame might look like. What we're shooting for, or our goal right now, is to make sure that by March of 2021, um, vendors who have um, who have a permit are have the permit on them and are ready to go. But um, it's a multi-layered situation. There's a lot of moving parts to it, um, but we want to make sure that um, they're good to go and um, expectations and rules are set before next season. Um, with, with that in mind, um, you know, throw COVID on top of all of this, and we're really trying to have like two systems in place, ready to go, or have a system that can address both COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. Um, situations um, in place. So, uh, But we definitely want to make sure vendors who want to vend um, next season um, know the rules and are able to apply for the permit um, before next season starts. And uh, so we're working almost daily uh, to make that happen. Okay. Well, then it might, it might be worth, I think, as we were kind of mentioning earlier, uh, reaching out to the folks who organize the salsa dancing sooner than later if you haven't reached out to them already. Uh, not not to the organizers, but um, park, I've reached out to Park and Rec, and, and they've talked to them. Um, I think um, they did pull um, a few of the permits this upcoming season just because of COVID and social distancing. But um, this this location, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had to get a little creative and move some of the vending sites um, in the future. Um, it, there's just really no good, ideal place for this, and we're trying to do the best we can um, working with um, the Senate bill that's in place, and um, we'll try to protect the health and safety of the community, too. Okay. Uh, Council Member Matthews and Vice Mayor Myers. And probably to state the obvious, but it would be good to connect with the merchants as well who raised concerns on this, so they, they have a sense of how it's unfolding, what they can do and not do, et cetera. That's, that's, that's the other of the coin here. We'll do, and we have, and we'll continue to do so. Yeah. Council Member Matthews. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I think I would just, um, Council Member Matthews brought up what I what I brought up, and I, I guess I just kind of like to state during this time that, you know, it, as much as we are, you know, it's important to provide the, 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 the feasible um, location and uh, rules and permits and things that we would like for the vendors to do while they're vending in our in our city. We also have to recognize that we have a lot of local businesses that are struggling and they're paying their rent. Um, they're buying their um, merchandise. They're paying their taxes. Um, and, and this is not to negate the need for some, you know, individuals in our community to also be able to vend and do things in a, in a way that you know again brings the resources to the to the community, but um, you know to the extent that um, Ralph we can we can make this as we know there was a lot of conflicts down there last year especially in the beach area. Um, you know I've talked to a lot of the businesses down there. Many are right on the edge of closing. We've already lost a lot of businesses downtown. So. As much as we need to follow the law, um, I think it's very important that we really work with our local businesses. Um, they have been here year in and year out. Um, they're holding up these storefronts. They're paying their rents on time. Um, they're, they're driving our local economy. And I want to make sure that it's really clear that the city's investing in all folks who are trying to, you know, make these areas a place where they might be able to, um, you know, uh, have merchandise purchased and, and use the visitation and the tourism that we do gain um, in certain locations in town. But I just personally publicly want to acknowledge that our local businesses do get impacted by these activities. And we do need to make sure that the program is developed in a way that is as, uh, uh, you know, as productive as, as possible for everybody involved. So thanks again, Ralph, for your work. You're welcome. All right, are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'll turn it back over to the city manager if there's any other further updates. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, no, that, that, that's all I have today. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is the council meeting calendar. I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and move into our consent agenda. So this is our first item on our agenda today, and this uh, includes items numbers 9 through 19 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you'd like to comment on our consent agenda, now is the time to call in. Um, you will see instructions to call in on your screen. And once you've joined the meeting, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. Once you've been called upon, uh, you'll be asked to unmute your phone, and you'll be given two minutes to speak to the council. Uh, so all items on the consent agenda will be acted on in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull or have questions or comments on any items on our agenda? Uh, we'll start with council member Byers. Catherine, you're muted. Oh, I'm not. Uh, number 11. You, you want to pull it? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, I have uh, a question for staff on item 16. I'd like to make a comment on item 12 and also a comment, comment on item 18. Councilmember Matthews. Um, on item 16, um, don't, don't need to have it pulled, but I, I would like the staff to, if they could, briefly set the stage of when we take this action, what does it mean for us going forward? I mean, we now are being given the full responsibility for <laughs> the whole levy system. Um, it's been decades and decades of back and forth and changes of direction. So um, just a, a quick comment on what this really means for us would be great. Okay. And then Council Member Brown. Yeah, I think, um, I think Vice Mayor Myers, you said 18, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have a question on that, but I don't need to pull it. Okay. Okay, why don't we start with the questions and comments on the items that have not been pulled. And so um, we'll start with Vice Mayor Myers, if you'd like to start with your questions and comments. Uh, do you want to go by uh, for number 12 first? Item yeah. 12? Okay. And actually what, what I'll do is I'll go through each item so that if there's uh, council members who have questions on the same item or comments, we can just... Um, have them all happen at the same time. So we'll start with number 12, then 16, and then 18. I just have a, a comment on this. I just want to, um, for the public, uh, recognize that this is a, um, a grant submittal approval to the um, NOAA Climate and Societal Interactions Division Adaptation Sciences Program Advancing Climate Adaptation and Coastal Community Resilience. And it's a long way of saying that um, our climate action, our climate manager, Tiffany Weiss West, is submitting this grant um, on behalf of the city. Uh, and the work that is proposed in the grant is incredibly important for our community to understand um, the proactive approach that we're taking to um, continue to study and understand the way that um, sea level rise and climate change will be affecting some of our most vulnerable um, neighborhoods in the in the city. So this grant, um, if we receive it, will help us study both the impacts to um, the lower ocean area and um, beach flats and other areas in the low-lying parts of the city um, with regards to sea level rise, as well as um, potential larger storms um, that may come from the watershed. So. I know I've talked to Tiffany about this approach over the years, and I'm really excited to see that she's um, putting this forward in this grant application. Um, without this kind of study and modeling and effort, um, it's very hard for a community to really understand how to not only plan for existing flooding impacts and risks, but also for future um, risks. So I just want to recognize Tiffany's efforts in this. And again, um, it just talks 
specifically on the importance of our climate change, um, really, really active climate change program that Tiffany oversees. And I just want to acknowledge her and thank her for, um, you know, this is really about helping people survive these kinds of events. Um, so this is not just a study that sits on a shelf. This is the kind of study that actually helps us really understand how to manage, um, you know, a flooding event into the future, um, actually for decades. So thank you, Tiffany. I just wanted to recognize you. Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Myers, for um, calling out this item, and I also extend my, my appreciation and gratitude to Tiffany as well. I think maybe my question might be for uh, Martine Bernal, or, you know, maybe this isn't the place for it, but I know we've talked um, about wanting to support our city staff with uh, grant writing and um, being really poised to receive additional funding, and sometimes there's a conflict for doing the job, but also having the space and time to apply for these grants and to bring these monies into our city. And so I'm wondering um, what is sort of in terms of your leadership, where do you fall and how we can support our staff being able to pursue these types of grants or if they need additional grant writing assistance? Sure, I'd be happy to, try to answer that. So we have a, we have a very, actually very good uh, and dedicated staff that's very good at keeping on top of opportunities for grants. Um, and, um, and, but some departments have more capacity than others. There is some variation there. Uh, and so what we try to do is to uh, uh, support uh, each other uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to accomplish that. And I think we are open to, at times, as necessary, to provide uh, and obtain out, outside assistance in order to be able to uh, be able to uh, access grants. Uh, many times, the an investment in trying to develop a grant application and obtain it is worth it, uh, given the um, potential payoff. So I think what we do is uh, uh, where we have staff capacity to uh, do those applications and, and submit those applications. We we have them do it. Where we don't have it, we look at uh, other ways to make sure that we take the opportunity to either. Uh, get outside assistance or to put a team together or staff that can uh, come together <clears throat> and uh, put together those applications. So I think we have to be really flexible uh, in particular in terms of making sure that we don't lose opportunities for, for, for grants. Great, I, I guess I, I maybe my, comp, my last bit would be just to really, um, you know, support the, the city and the various departments for um, getting additional support if need be to be able to pursue these different funding opportunities, especially right now. And I know we've had actually times where there's been um, sort of a trade-off, whether or not you can pursue the grant or, um, you know, trade-off with the other work that you have. But I think with a number of particularly climate resilience funding coming in in terms of recovery, but others that we're, we're really able to support the staff with getting some of the grant resources that we need. All right, that concludes item number 12. Why don't we move on to item number 16. And so we'll start with Vice Mayor Myers followed by Council Member Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, yeah, I just had a couple of questions for um, Mark Gattle, our, our Director of Public Works on, on this item. So for just for the public, this is the um, approval of a contract uh, for services for the FEMA levy certification for the levy portion of the San Lorenzo River that runs through downtown. And um, first, I just wanted to um, recognize that, yeah, this is a long time coming, Mark, um, and, um, you know, at least over 20 years. I know you guys have been doing a lot of work with the Corps over the last three or four years. Um, getting ready for this moment. Um, and um, also, as you know, it now kind of, you know, puts us square in the center of, of managing this facility into the future. Um, I have a question regarding once the certification is completed, I know that there's a direct um, relationship to people who do have flood insurance within the, within the area um, of, of flood, potential flood risk. Um, what happens for those folks who are carrying that 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 um, insurance mark? Is there also some kind of 
transportation or reduction in their in their flood insurance. I'm just curious about what happens to the properties adjacent to the levy once it, this is done. Right, that's a great question. Um, as you said, um, this project has been going on for a long time. It has been over 20 years. Um, one of the advantages of this project extending that length of time was actually the project under construction gave the people that had flood insurance a reduction of 50% um, of their existing flood insurance rates because of the cons of a flooding control project under construction. Once it once it reached about 50, 60 percent complete, and Joe Hall um, secured that for people. They may not have realized it, but they actually had reduced flood insurance rates for quite a long time. Um, the other thing that happened when this project was so once this project's completed, we have approximately three years to get the FEMA certification before we lose that um, cons in, under construction designation and flood insurance rates are changed, um, that reduction goes away. So we are motivated to get this certification from FEMA and that's why this contract's before you. One other thing that is in this um, agenda item was the acknowledgement of we did get the bridge credit um, of almost $2 million from the Corps of Engineers. I gotta tell you, uh, did not expect that to happen. We really worked very hard to do that and stayed on it for almost 15 years um, and had to go back to Congress twice to get that approved. But we did get a check for $1.9 million um, of our bridge credit. So that money will be used for our certification efforts. So we are funded for the certification um, and this contract before you is to um, award the contract to our consultant who's done certification of levy systems in Sacramento area multiple times so he's experienced um, and we're happy to work with them. So that's why it's for you. Yeah, thank you and congratulations on receiving the uh, payment for the bridges. Um, that's, that's super helpful and you know, I hope with some change in our, in our national uh, leadership, we'll hopefully see some creative ways to, to help communities ensure that these um, facilities, you know, are gonna live into the future as best as they can. Um, my other question, Mark, um, had to do with the um, the tasks that are in the in the actual um, scope of work. Okay. So there's a there's mention of evaluating the vegetation and encroachment, and then also it looks like um, finalizing the operations and maintenance uh, manual for the for the system. And I just want to, I guess, maybe just request that the department in both of those um, situations. Um, if you, we can, you know, we've been operating the maintenance of the system in a pretty unique way in the state of California for decades um, in regards to that we actually leave some of the vegetation in the channel um, and we're able to do the ripping and we've made some adjustments and been able to get those things permitted. But, you know, overall the commitment has been that there's sort of a natural river within our within our flood control system. And so do you see that, I, I mean, I know a few years ago, the Corps was really pushing to really go with just scorched earth and basically cleaning everything out of every flood control channel in California. Um, are you seeing any signs that this, these, these tasks are gonna lead to more um, removal of vegetation or a different way of maintaining the channel? Um, you know, our goal is to keep maintaining the channel the way that we are maintaining it currently. Um, yeah, the core has national standards and that, that is a problem for us, basically. Um, the vegetation was actually part of our design. We overbuilt the channel and built that vegetation in. In that, it was paid with um, federal money as, as well as our, our money. So it's part of the design to have that, that vegetation removed seems inconsistent with the funding. And we made that argument. Unfortunately, we weren't successful. Um, so in our operations manual, we have some language in there that meets what the core needed, but we pushed back pretty strong on giving us flexibility on maintaining the vegetation. So um, we will continue to fight that battle and maintain it the way we are maintaining it. 90% of the time, or even more, 95% of the time, that's an environmental uh, location for, um, you know, the, the, the animals and um, 
plants that live in that, that location and we experience and enjoy it. Um, but when the flooding happens, we need that channel to perform. So I think we've struck a pretty good balance there and we'll continue to strike that balance. Um, we did talk about this item during the operations manual with the Corps before they approved it. Uh, we added a, a little modification to the language so that we can still maintain it the way we are maintaining it and still um, meet any of the core requirements. So I, I think we, we walked a very tight, fine line on the tightrope, but I think we're, we're okay at this point. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and, you know, if there's any outreach or um, I, I think also I just reflect on all the work on the HCP that the water department is doing um, and just the work that I've done on the river over the years and the work that many, many scientists have done. San Lorenzo River is a very, very important steelhead stream. It's, it, it has been found to harbor um, uh, populations from other nearby watersheds and um, the lagoon is incredibly important. So, um, and those temperatures and the water quality that we've seen um, with four, you know, over a hundred degree temperature events this summer, um, having vegetation in that channel is gonna be really, really important. Otherwise I fear that we are going to be picking up fish like they do in Carmel River and trucking them down 10 miles down into uh, a lagoon that is, you know, dry above. So I've right. seen some very expensive steelhead fixes over the years, and I don't think we want to go there. And I, but I do think the endangered species piece in this needs to be carefully thought out. And I hope that your department and the water department can, can cooperate and coordinate on, on an approach to the lower river because, um, uh, I think that we could be looking at some extremely expensive issues with regards to endangered species if we're not proactive and thinking through. Um, I'd hate to see us capturing, you know, fish up in up in the Henry Cal Park and trucking them down to our lagoon because that is happening in rivers throughout California because of damages to the habitat. So, um, thanks for your work on that. That's my last, really, my last comment on that. And um, thanks for all your work. This is a it, it, sort of tucked in the consent, men, uh, consent agenda, but this is a mass, this is the largest, just I'll state it just for the public that may be hearing or watching. I mean, this is the largest public works project next to some of our water projects that are now occurring that the city has done probably in its history. It's, it's massive. So I just wanna thank your work, Mark. You've been working on it for as long as I know. And um, Long time. It's surprising to see something this massive that um, gets tucked into consent, but this protects our downtown, it protects our beach area, it protects countless numbers of um, housing, professional businesses, government buildings. Um, I mean, the value of what this facility does is, is significant. And I just want to make sure that the public understands the significance of what, what this means today. So thanks for your work. Great, thank you. All right, Council Member Matthews. Um, as Donna mentioned, it, it is significant on so many different levels. And um, my, the reason I wanted to just make a comment was um, certainly it now becomes our responsibility for maintenance, both on the environmental issues that have just been discussed and also mm -hmm. maintaining the functionality of it uh, to protect all the obvious homes, businesses, et cetera, and continue to meet uh, the uh, requirements. And Mark, my understanding is, uh, well, I guess my question is the funding for that, because that, that, that comes at a, a price. And, and where does that figure into um, this annual budget operating decision? Well, one thing we did I, I when we got the, oh, one thing that we did when we got the bridge credit is we put that in the, in the overlay fund, so we do have money to take care of, uh, get us through the, the certification effort as well as the yeah. ongoing maintenance. Yeah. So I think we're, we're in good shape for the next four or five years. Hopefully, yeah. I think we um, we'll get through that. We do have an there is an overlay fund, um, so people in the floodplain that that river protects do pay into this uh, okay. fund, and so there is funding for the maintenance. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, now we'll move on to item number eighteen, and so there were um, comments from council members, or Vice Mayor Myers and Council Member Brown. We'll start with Vice Mayor Myers. I'm just uh, being a water geek today, so um, these are the kinds <laughs> of things that get me excited. 
Um, I just wanted to recognize that um, this is for the public. This is the um, an agreement with um, Soquel Creek Water District, um, which was actually, um, uh, we agreed to this uh, work uh, a number of months ago, but this is actually a, um, a land lease with the water district, uh, Soquel Creek Water District and the City of Santa Cruz Regional Wastewater Treatment Facility to construct and locate a tertiary treatment facility um, at our wastewater treatment facility. Um, and for the public, this is, a, again, another very, very significant, um, uh, uh, basically a significant day that this agreement um, is, uh, is before us. Like, again, it's on consent, but in terms of long-term, um, the long-term future of our water supply and um, the way that we manage it with our neighbor, Soquel Creek Water District, um, this is a really, really significant action. And I just, again, want to recognize um, our public works engineering staff and leadership and also our water staff. And I also just express to the Soquel Creek Water District who has secured um, millions in funding uh, that this is um, just uh, the way that most most people, most agencies fight over water in California, and we've been um, lucky enough that even though there's been some bumps along the way that we're making progress. So I just wanted to um, publicly recognize the significance of what this is what this is really about, uh, and it's securing um, a water future for our communities that um, uh, without water, we wouldn't we wouldn't be succeeding. So I just wanted to uh, really recognize the significance of this and thank everyone involved. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, thank you for um, uh, Vice Mayor Myers thank you for calling this one out as well. This is a really big deal, and a lot of these things happen on consent. Um, and so it's you know it's not as obvious to the public uh, what we're doing. Um, so I um, am just wondering a couple of things, and I know we've you know we've moved ahead and and um, voted in support, which I was in support. Um, last year, uh, and maybe this was covered and I just can't remember or I didn't catch it. Um, the, I have a couple of questions about, um, so this, the tertiary, the SoCal pure water portion of this project, um, is there, I mean, what is that gonna affect the kind of broader environment there, the Neary Lagoon environment? Is, is there some expand? I'm just wondering how that is gonna work in terms of space, available space. Um, and then because, some people that um, I've been talking with prior to the uh, council meeting asked about this. I'm just wondering if there's been any analysis um, on potential odor impacts. I know that's been an issue in the past, um, particularly for folks, um, on, you know, near the um, near the treatment plant. Um, and so I'm just wondering about those two things. Uh, those are those are great questions, um, and I'd like to address those. Um, basically, there won't be any impact on Neri Lagoon at all. All of the the actual space for the tertiary is actually on site at the wastewater treatment facility, and that actually will allow us. The first phase is for um, Soquel Creek project, but if the water department decides it's going to go the tertiary we required space available that we could expand and actually treat our water department uh, water as well. So it actually takes um, a better use of our the, the product that we make right now, it's secondary water that goes out to the bay. Um, actually, we're being able to reuse that water and, and re-inject into the groundwater after it's um, been advanced treated. So Kell Creek will do that. So it's a reuse of that, of that resource. As far as odors, there really shouldn't be any odors, additional odors um, by this treatment at all. It's a closed system. Um, we do have um, odor control that we use. Uh, and actually, I think it was last meeting, we actually updated the, came back to you and you guys approved the contract to update the maintenance agreements for those odor control systems. So um, that system actually works very well and we get very few odors um, at the wastewater treatment plant. Right now, so we're we think this is a win-win for the the city as well as the Soquel Creek. I think it's a, a good use of the water and it um, helps secure the water supply system for the region. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for the reminder. I, I it's hard to keep all the pieces in my in sure. my head. Sure, thanks a lot. 
Okay, Council Member Matthews. Well, all of the above, and I just want to mention the context for this is a long, very productive relationship between Santa Cruz City Water and Soquel Creek Water District. This is one, as council members know, many concurrent projects happening, and we are so fortunate that we have the professional and policy sense of partnership about a common shared problem on this. So very pleased to have this going forward, and it's, uh, it's a very promising sign of the ongoing collaboration between our, our and, and also reflected in the Midtown and Groundwater Agency, which involves a few other players as well. But um, this is, as Mark said, win, 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 win. All right, are there any further questions or comments from council members on these items? Okay, hearing none, what we'll do now is we will open it up to public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to items numbers nine through 19 with the exception of item 11, which has been pulled, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, this is Becky Steinbrunner. I want to speak uh, briefly to item number 16, but mostly to item number 18. Item number 16 um, needs to make sure that it addresses uh, the Pure Water SoCal Project's plan um, being put forth by SoCal Creek Water District to do horizontal drilling under the San Lorenzo River and the levee on both sides. This is part of the Pure Water SoCal project, and whatever levy maintenance happens there, it needs to address the possible impacts of this construction project related to Pure Water SoCal. Regarding number 18, I want to say that uh, you don't have to worry about odors, but what you certainly should be worrying about is potential hazardous accidental release of a caustic that w is part of the revised uh, Pure Water SoCal project in this tertiary treatment process that requires an additional treatment process. It's called NBAF, uh, that's Bravo Alpha Foxtrot, because the level of contamination, uh, nitrites, ammonia, and total organic carbon in the secondary um, effluent from the wastewater treatment plant is higher than had been expected. With simple, with the tertiary treatment alone, it would not clean the water to meet Title 22 recycled water standards. So the project is being revised. This is not with any environmental analysis on the part of Soquel Creek Water District at all. Your city should be worried about this because it includes a 9,300 gallon above tank storage of a caustic um, sodium hydroxide that if there is an accidental release, you will have grave implications to your city, to your schools who were not noticed. Please do not approve this until SoCal Creek Water District does a subsequent EIR to study these very critical and significant impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see no other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on these items. I'm gonna close public comment and bring it back to council for action deliberation. So right now before us um, is items numbers nine through 19 on our consent with the exception of item number 11, which has been pulled. And so if there's a council member who'd be willing to make a motion, we can go ahead and um, move on. Council member Matthews. Yes, I'll move consent with the exception of item number 11. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. I'll go ahead and second uh, the consent items with the exception of item number 11. Um, are there any further comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk for the roll call vote. Councilmember Byers? 
Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll move on to item number 11, which was pulled by Council Member Byers. Um, so if you'd like to go ahead, Council Member Byers. Sure, thank you. Uh, I get, um, it, need to address Martine, uh, our city manager, and I know we talked on Friday, but I just hadn't noticed this particular um, number 11. So uh, when I did see it, I kept thinking, I don't know that I've ever seen a list of our grant on a monthly basis. If so, I don't know whether it just missed it or buried in our agenda or wherever, but I, I know what you're asking or wanting to change the policy to move from monthly to quarterly, but where where are they monthly? What we've been doing is we've been issuing those as FYIs, so they're informational reports that get provided to the city oh. council. Um, oh. so they're, they're not on your, in your agenda packet. However, I think we may have, uh, I think because of uh, the uh, limited resources, we may not have been keeping up with those. Um, but I'll ask uh, Laura Schmidt, who's the, the, our assistant city manager who's been working at us, if she, has, if she has anything to add to that. But typically we, we've been doing them as FYIs, basically. Well, it, it might be well, I'm thinking new council members to highlight this, because I would think this is a kind of a curious item. We do apply for a lot of grants. Yes, and it's just a list of all the, the grants that we've applied for in that uh, period and which ones have been received. It's more of a, just like a spreadsheet, basically. Spreadsheet, yeah. No, it sounds it sounds very good and uh, certainly useful. So, okay, thanks, yeah. Um, I didn't Mayor, know Laura wanted to just yeah. add to that. Uh, the FYIs are actually included in the agenda packet. They're in the very end. Of oh, the at, at oh, the, the list very list. end. Ah, yeah. I see those mm -hmm. things. Okay. There's Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, a list of uh, FYIs is included in the agenda packet. But the FYIs go directly to you, they're issued to you. Got it, good. Okay. Uh, I'm prepared to move the agenda forward. Uh, okay. To well, amend the council policy, I'm uh, moved to, as staff recommended, to change the policy. Okay, so why don't we, I'm gonna open it up to public comment okay, first, thank but you. I'll, I'll bring it back um, okay, after that. Sure. So are there any council members who have questions on item or comments on item number 11? Okay, seeing none, we'll open it up to the public. So if there are members of the public who would like to comment on item number 11, now is the time to call in using the numbers that are on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone uh, to raise your hand. And when you've been asked to unmute your phone, you'll be given two minutes to speak. All right, seeing no members of the public who would like to comment on this item, we'll bring it back to council for action deliberation. Council member Byers. Catherine, you're muted. To move from monthly uh, uh, grant FYIs to quarterly. Can you repeat that? Because we didn't catch the first. Oh, so, part. sorry. Um, a staff recommendation. I'll move the staff recommendation to move from receiving monthly reports on the grants to quarterly. Okay. Councilmember Matthews. Second and fully support. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Byers to adopt the staff recommendations for item number 11, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Uh, is there any further questions or comments on this item? Okay, if I none could. Yes, yeah, sure. Wait. I don't know where else to bring this up, so I think I should bring it up before we vote on it. Uh, I was not familiar with being able to speak to an agenda item, uh, a consent item, and really have a discussion and have staff participate. Uh, I wouldn't have, I don't know when you pull something or when you say, I wanna discuss, you know, 18 or 16. 
Uh, and what I realized, pu the public doesn't get to respond, even though staff is giving us more information and going over things. Uh, it was just, um, I, I just think that should be more clarified to the new council, uh, either by Tony or someone. When can you say, I, I just want to speak to this item or I want to pull it in? I, I just, it was, it was brand new to me, let me say that, that people would speak to an item, unless it was just a very thank you or a one-liner, but certainly no discussion. So that's, I just wanted to make that comment, nothing to do about right now, but thanks. Okay, appreciate that comment. Okay, if there's no further discussion, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute break so people can stretch their legs um, and we'll mm -hmm. reconvene at 1 p.m. Justin, what, do, what are you thinking for lunch break? What's, what's your thought on that? Um, well, we have a pretty tight agenda, so. Um, is, is this it? I think or? this is it. Okay, um, it's just a question, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think we're okay. just gonna Take a brief 10 minute break and um, we'll try to keep going pretty tight okay. today. All right. So again, once council members are back, if you could please turn your video on so we know that you're here, we can then go ahead and get started. Why don't we maybe just go ahead and we can start um, the session and hopefully the other council members will, will join in before the presentation gets started. So uh, the next item on our agenda is item number 20, uh, general business, which is our slow streets pilot program. And so for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, please call in. Uh, at this moment in time using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for action and deliberation. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Claire Gologli, transportation planner, to kick off the presentation on the Slow Streets pilot program. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I am Claire Globley. I'm the Transportation Planner for the City of Santa Cruz, and today we'll be reviewing the Slow Sleep Pilot Program that we implemented based on your recommendation in July. I am going to share my screen in the right order of operations. Nope, not that one. I have it up in two locations. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Okay. So the Slow Streets Pilot Program. Claire, if I could stop you, we yes. we see presenter views, so we see all of your notes. 
Oh, okay. Let me get out of that and go into. Um, display settings. That one. There we go. Okay. Sorry, everything updated on my computer. Of course. Um, thank you. So, Slow Streets, uh, today we're going to be going through a, um, a summary of the pilot program and staff recommendation uh, based on what to do for next steps. First things first, what I want to do is thank the group of amazing community volunteers who we had helping run this program. As I'll get into, the program relied on having a neighborhood point of contact for each and every street. And these are folks who stepped up and stepped in and said that they would dedicate their time and energy and effort to really make this program a reality. So I'm, I'm very thankful for all the help that they gave throughout this program. And it's so glad that we have people who are, are willing to volunteer in our community. The next thing that I want to keep at the forefront of our mind as we move through the presentation is that we have a shared value. And I know this is an item that generated a tremendous amount of community feedback in your, in your letters that you have in your packet. And the overwhelming theme of all of that feedback was that our community wants safe places to walk and bike. And one of the reasons I love working in transportation and that makes it so interesting is that everyone needs it and everyone has an opinion on it. And there are so many ways to make that happen. And so I hope as we move through this presentation and we hear a lot of differing viewpoints, we can remember that really this is, this is the theme that everyone is wanting safe places to walk and bike. And the question is, is this the program that, that meets that need? I'm also going to start us with our staff recommendation. And subsequent to this, I'll present the, the differing recommendations from our commission. Our staff recommendation today is that it should say council, this also didn't say, that council recommends that, that they accept a report on the Slow Streets pilot program and then end that pilot program. When we went to commission and presented the information that's going to follow, the Transportation and Public Works Commission, their recommendation was as follows, that uh, council thanks the Public Works Department for their work in developing the program and that the City Council directs Public Works to conduct a request for proposals with a local nonprofit to sustain the program on a subset of streets, so a smaller number of streets than what we have now, and to use up to $20,000 of Measure D funds to fund the program until the end of May 2021. So how did we get here? And I think something key to focus on is that we do have different staff recommendation and commission recommendation that's coming to you. I'll go through um, the staff point. I know that you do have letters in your packet from commission, but how did we get here? Really, it was something that came from community to commission to a subcommittee to commission and then to council through many, many steps before resulting in where we are now. Um, so the process started with a lot of folks writing in to our Transportation Public Works Commission, a lot of other cities starting slow streets programs, and it coming up at our TPWC. Uh, the TPWC kicked the discussion to a subcommittee that they had, and then ended up making a recommendation to City Council to implement a Slow Streets program with a $200,000 budget um, to, to move forward on that. Uh, council then took that under advisement, and on July 2nd, they made the following recommendation. To use up to $30,000 of Measure D funds, to have the program created and operational by the end of July, and then it should include an application process, supplies and materials, an online map, a website, and should be in place for the period that SIP orders are in place or for up to six months with a report back to council at that time. So going through each of these, um, we'll hit the budget at the end, but we, we definitely went through that $30,000 very quickly. Um, the program was created and not operational by the end of July. It ended up taking us a bit longer due to the fires that we had. We did not implement um, on the timeline that we expected to because many of our staff were otherwise diverted working on fire efforts. And so as soon as that was under control, we then launched the program. Um, elements that were intended to be included in application process, we did have an online application that was available in both English and Spanish. It was on our website. It was promoted via our normal channels. It was um, talked about in the Sentinel and on many online local social forums. And it resulted in us receiving 48 applications from which we selected 11 slow streets. 
Um, we had our website up and running, which also had educational materials, including an FAQ, contact information, and other relevant information on it. We had an online map, um, and as the program rolled out, we did continue to produce educational materials. Of note, um, this last point here with a report back to council, this today is that report back to council, and it was reviewed by commission prior to returning to council. I want to go through implementation because many of the letters that you received did talk about some of the hiccups that we had going forward in implementation. And I'll frame this with saying that this, this was a pilot and we were intending as we moved through to work out um, many of the kinks as we went through using low cost materials that were easily movable. When we first launched, we had the two signs that you see pictured here, a bike head warning sign and a road closure through traffic sign. And those are signs that we selected because they were what other cities were doing. No slow street sign exists, so we used what was available and what is a, a legal sign for us to use. In iteration one, we had the signs located side by side at the cross streets of the busier roadways. Pictured here is Darwin at Broadway. We also did this where Melrose crosses Morrissey and other similar locations. And at the more minor street crossings, we only had a single sign. Uh, day one, we heard from our refuse crews that this made it difficult for our garbage trucks to turn on state roadways, especially when, as you see in this picture, there's a car park right there as well. So it led to our refuse folks having to get out of their vehicles, move the sign, move the truck, return the signs, and continue on every step of the way. So we quickly moved to iteration two, which was just a single sign located in the middle of the roadway we had it placed where it was on the center line, if the center line existed, and directly behind the, side, the crosswalk uh, where there was a crosswalk and in the similar location where there was not a crosswalk. And we quickly heard from our friends at the fire department and the refuse folks that this still wasn't working for them. It did not allow enough turning radius for our large vehicles. And in particular, it was not in compliance with fire code. Um, so we worked with our fire department. We went out and walked multiple sites to check out what could we do to make it work, looking for solutions that um, would still have the spirit of what we were trying to do, but also would comply with the needs of public safety. And what we came up with was iteration three, where the signage was moved to seven feet from the curb and 20 feet back from the intersection. This placement in our third iteration did allow for that turning radius of our large vehicles and did allow us to comply with fire code. This placement also was not well liked by many people who were in the community and created a lot of issues with uh, these signs being so movable with them moving to many places that we did not want them to be. Um, so that said, we did go through quite a process. It's different than our normal process. If we were doing an infrastructure project, we have a fairly worked out process where we do plan review with various departments who would be engaged in this. And it would have been the time that you know police and fire and refuse would have looked on, but that was not something that occurred as part of a super quick start pilot program with movable materials. So we were learning as we went. Feedback from the community. We got a lot of feedback from the community. Uh, there was not a single day since we launched this program that I have not talked to, you know, at least one, oftentimes more members of the community, hearing their feedback and, and thoughts on the program, pro and con. Our feedback to November 5th, this is the same slide that I showed our Transportation and Public Works Commission. And while these numbers have changed since then, I wanted to leave this in because I wanted to frame for you the feedback that they had when I was presenting this for their recommendation and decision making. Um, through November 5th, we had received a lot of calls and emails, and of those, 64% were cons, 16% were pro, and the rest were neutral or suggestions. I do want to note that this was just through then. Uh, we've been receiving emails on this program up until I think I got the last batch this morning, and those have not been aggregated in this table. But I think the, the tenor of folks that I spoke with over the life of this program to date, this is fairly representative of the conversations that I've had. Um, of note, though, many of the um, emails that have come into you since this time have been overwhelmingly positive. What we heard
heard? What is a summary of, of the community feedback that we get? Um, the program is awesome and the program is awful. I got lots of things at both ends of that spectrum. People who really liked the program because they liked the places that it created for them and their families to walk and bike. And people who thought that the program was awful because it led to impacts on neighboring streets or they thought that the signs were in the way or it made it more challenging for them to get around. Um, both of those are very real experiences for people in our community. The next and, and big one is a desire for permanent traffic calming. I don't think I talked to a single person who said, oh yeah, this is the program that I want and this should be our long-term solution. Everyone I talked to said, oh yeah, well this is what we have available right now, but what I really want, and this is reflected in many of the letters that were sent to you, is speed bumps or sidewalks or bike lanes or permanent infrastructure solutions. And yeah, this is what you have for right now, but how do we get from here to there? And something I want to be clear on is that, going back to that shared value, that we do all want safe streets, and that's what people are saying, but permanent traffic calming or infrastructure solutions is not what this program is, it's not what it can be, but I do really want to recognize that that is, I think, the, the, the tenor and the singular thing that carries through all of the feedback of being what people want. The signage was in the blank. Um, people had very, very mixed reactions to the signage that we had. Uh, in particular, the road closes through traffic sign. Folks who lived on these streets loved that sign because they thought it really reiterated the message that you should not be driving on the street unless you live here, you're visiting, or it's directly on your route to get where you're going. Uh, folks who lived on surrounding streets really didn't like it because they thought that it was dishonest it took away from actual construction that was going on in other locations, and it uh, caused a lot more traffic onto other neighboring streets. Uh, many folks I talked to wanted Grove Street-specific signage or no other non-compliant signage. Many had seen signs in other communities that they really wanted to do here, and over and over again when I called my colleagues in those communities, they weren't able to say that they were using legal signage. Um, we, we danced around that topic a lot, but there was nothing that said, oh yeah, we definitely are, are covered on liability for this. Um, also of note, we are out of signage. Uh, the program we ordered, as noted in the staff report, we ordered more signage than we needed, and we have had significant problems with theft, vandalism, damage, and at this point, we're not even able to maintain the existing program that we have. We have barricades that are out there without signage. We have street crossing locations that don't have signage or barricades because so many of them have um, either disappeared or become unusable. Communication and outreach was a big one that we heard. Um, as noted, this was a program that Council Directors to move forward on in the beginning of July. We were working on moving forward and we're ready to launch when the fires hit. And as you know, there was a blitz of communications around the fire and people were very singularly focused on fires happening. I'm paying attention to that news. Anything that we did release during that time definitely went to the bottom of people's consciousness and attention. And then when we did launch, I received a lot of feedback of disappointment that we had not done a citywide mailer, such as in your uh, utility bill, or a direct mailer to everyone on the streets and surrounding streets, that I had not gone to uh, knock on folks' doors and tell them about what was happening. Um, also, a lot of people who were just unsure about the rules and didn't know about the program, and many people who wanted to know how they could voice their strong opinions about what they felt and also a timeline for when this program was planned to end. Many folks said, well, I really don't like it, but if it's just gonna be for the next two months, I guess I can suck it up. But if it's gonna be here for the next year, how do I voice my opinion and make it go away because it's really impacting my life? And so not, not really having a timeline there made it challenging besides we'll be going to council at a point in the future to give them an update as directed by the motion was something that was frustrating for a lot of folks to hear. Movable signs were trouble. I think we can universally agree to that, that things that can move generally will. Um, the signs, the biggest complaint I got was the signs were almost constantly in the wrong location. By the time that we got to iteration three and they were supposed to be located seven feet from the curb and 20 feet back from the intersection, um, if people didn't want them to be there, they just consistently moved them. Um, they were stolen, moved, vandalized. We had at least 
three renegade flow streets where folks stole our signs and set up their own flow streets and I would go pick them up in my car or ask our operations team to go pick them up and then have to find their way back to their home where they should be. And it was really, really challenging. And getting on to the immediate next point, the neighborhood points of contact, the lovely volunteers that we had on each of these streets, they had to spend so much of their time and energy and effort moving these signs over and over again to the correct location. And I spent a lot of my time calling them and saying, Hey, I got a complaint from a neighbor that the signs are in the wrong location. Can you please move them? So it was, it was a lot to take on, and it was it oftentimes felt like a, a full, full-time job keeping those signs in the correct location. Um, big things here about neighborhood points of contact that I also covered in the report is there were a couple things that I felt went really well with using the volunteer-based model. I thought that it gave us an opportunity to do deeper outreach in our community, build stronger relationships, talk about shared goals and shared concerns that we have. And then there are a couple things that I think were really challenging and things that I didn't feel as good about with this. Um, Primarily, and one thing I called out in the report, was asking these folks to manage disputes. So we had numerous instances over the life of the program where the police had to be called to neighbor disputes. We also had numerous instances where the neighborhood points of contact or other neighbors reached out to me and said, I was trying to to keep the program running in a state of good repair, and one of my neighbors behaved aggressively to me or was overly hostile, and I don't feel comfortable. And for me as staff, asking a volunteer to engage with that is is not something I felt good about or felt okay doing. Um, That doesn't mean it didn't have to get done, and oftentimes what that meant was that city staff wasn't taking that on. Um, outreach and communications also were another big thing on the neighborhood points of contact. We saw a big difference in the various streets. On streets that had an existing strong uh, community network already, email lists or, or strong relationships, those streets generally had an easier time maintaining the program, communicating with their neighbors, and being able to clearly and concisely communicate with me about how the program was working versus streets that didn't have those existing strong relationships, it was more of a challenging, more of a challenge at times to keep the program running and keep people informed and generally happy. Um, and then also to the, the staff role and the volunteer role with my role generally being um, as this program was set up to really communicate what the program should be, where the barricade should be, communicate around issues. And the volunteer role really for this program was managing the day-to-day. And a lot of that ended up being, you know, asking and needing to monitor and constantly replace the barricades where they should be. So it was a really interesting experience for me. I'm really grateful for the folks that did step up and volunteer their time and their effort. And um, it was a big lesson, a, a different way of doing things. Lessons learned that I think are really important. I think we did learn a lot from this program. We learned, I think I think the biggest thing is that we do have that shared value of folks wanting livable streets in their neighborhoods. And as we rolled this program out, we also learned that it was incredibly labor intensive. As I get to the budget in a minute, you'll see some more specifics on that. But the, the volunteers help, but they don't substitute. Even though we had neighborhood points of contact there who were doing so much work every day and knew many of their neighbors, I oftentimes had folks calling me and saying, yeah, I know that I have a, a neighbor who's supposed to be in charge of this, but I don't want to talk to them because I'm going to have to live next door to them for you know the next coming years. I want to share my opinions with you because they're different. Um, or having to send out our operational teams to replace signs and barricades our fire department and, and other needs there. So it was very, very labor intensive. Um, the movable mar- barriers were something that really fit the needs of a pilot program in the way that they were relatively inexpensive, easy to move, non-permanent. But on the downside of it, things that move will be moved. And that was the biggest issue that we were chasing the whole time since the start of the program. Pilots also still require pre-launch outreach. And what we learned from this was that even trying to utilize our existing structures that we have in place, it was not enough and it would have been worth taking that extra time and delaying the launch and then having a more successful launch after. So I think chasing after wanting to get this up and running so quickly 
did us a disservice in, in doing that deeper outreach in the community. And to reiterate, this was organized neighbors work best. It really did allow for that communication to go both ways and it be more seamless than in some other locations. Getting into the budget, as noted, council directed us to use $30,000 of Measure D funding. We spent through December, through the end of um, October, we have spent $36,000. And as you can see here, 25,000 of that was labor. It was our operations team, my time, our engineering time, um, only about $12,000 of that was supplied. So we are over budget by over $6,000 on that. One thing that I do want to call out here is that this is from Measure D funding. And we are anticipating having a Measure D hit in the coming years. Um, um, I want to make sure I get these numbers right for you. Um, that our Measure D is estimated to be reduced about $1 million over the next three years, which is about a 30% decrease over what we have been expecting to have. As part of our adopted five-year Measure D funding plan, what that looks like is potentially taking away from other projects that we have identified as priorities and programs that we've identified as priorities, including our existing programs that benefit Safe Routes to School and other outreach-based programs. I also do want to highlight here, because I know that talking about a staff recommendation that ends a program that supports biking and walking is incredibly challenging, but as we are in these fiscal times, and as we are looking at making hard decisions, I want to point to your next council item also and highlight the two of the priority areas that you have for your interim recovery plan are to take actions for short and long-term fiscal sustainability, that's priority one, and priority three is to improve and maintain infrastructure. And I think the word infrastructure is really important because what we heard throughout this entire program was people wanting that infrastructure and wanting permanent infrastructure and this program um, continues on without meeting that need. It's a, it's a temporary, it's a pilot, it's a, a program for now that we will, um, if we continue on, continue spending money on. I don't really see a way to lessen the amount of spending and the amount of staff labor that's needed on this program, but we won't be getting to that thing that people are actually asking for and that your interim recovery plan goals or priority areas really support there. That, brings us back to the staff recommendation, which is that the City Council accept a report, this report, on the Slow Streets pilot program, and then vote to end the program. Um, in summary, what I really want to say is that this program sprung from a desire to have safe places to walk and bike during the pandemic. And other cities were using this tool. Our community was really interested in seeing what we could also do to respond. We launched for 11th Street Citywide, which is a small number compared to the entire city and the number of streets that we have. And while folks are so interested in investing in making these safe places to walk and bike, I, in my professional capacity, do not think that this has done what we hoped for. There have been parts of the program that are hopeful, the pilot has been really interesting, but the movable features, the minimal staffing, the surrounding impacts on neighborhood streets have led to an incredible amount of feedback against this program, which is something that I, I feel nervous about as we look to implement long-term projects in our community. Continuing the program would require an infusion of funding to purchase additional signage and barricades, do direct outreach, produce additional information, and fund the staff time necessary to run the program. To date, as noted, we've spent close to $40,000 of Measure D funding, and going into a reduction in the amount of Measure D funding that we're anticipating to get, um, and especially with the reduction of that Projects that we have adopted in our five-year plan, such as the rail trail segments 7, 8, and 9, Swanton Multi-Use Path, and other programs we have, it's, it's a question of prioritization and where this ranks compared to those programs and projects. With that, I will turn it over to you. Actually, I, I would be remiss if I did not again reiterate that the recommendation from our Transportation and Public Works Commission is different than the staff recommendation, and they do not recommend ending the program as noted in slide five that I showed. They do recommend continuing the program through the end of May with an addition of $20,000 in Measure D funding and issuing an RFP to select a local nonprofit to run the program. And I would note that part of that $20,000 would need to go towards uh, purchase of materials, so contextualizing that for the amount of staff time that would be available. 
And with that, I turn it over to you and I'm available for any questions you have. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that presentation, Claire. Um, and Would you so like me to I, stop sharing? Is that easier for you to discuss? Yeah, I think that'd be great if you could. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So um, I'll turn it over to Council if it, um, for any questions or discussion on this item. Councilmember Golder. Thank you, Claire. And um, I think that one really cool thing that came out of trying this was that we saw that with the stolen signs and the renegade streets, I think the community value around having safe places to walk and bike and having safe streets is something that we can all rally behind and it shows that everyone's intentions were good. Um, and I was just wondering, and maybe this is a question for Tony, but I know Claire mentioned, I think twice about the legal signage of the need for the legal signage instead of the signs that maybe some others preferred that other cities have done. And I'm wondering what um, what potential liabilities the city could be open to. I, um, I've heard, and I actually saw two like near car collisions that happened driving around where while um, people were confused about the signage. And I was wondering what, with this temporary program, what um, potential liability the city has? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question, and it's kind of a complicated question, but I think it's fair to say that any time you have a, um, a street feature that's not um, uh, in accordance with applicable standards, like um, Caltrans standards, for instance, then there is a potential liability exposure and whether or not that would arise in a particular case really depends on the facts and circumstances. If, for instance, a, a, an intersection had a series of uh, accidents or mishaps um, associated with the signage, then there would be uh, you know, liability exposure attached to that. Um, but it really depends on a, on a, on a uh, fact-based analysis and so, um, but but I but I agree. Having a non-standard type of signage um, certainly does increase potential um, liability claim possibilities. I mentioned this too, just because I know uh, all the local schools have um, Ecology Action Come Teach Bike Smart program to the kids, and one of the things they train the kids is that you just the drivers expect things to be a certain way, and like you you know you have to keep that in mind as you're biking for um, safety reasons or walking for safety reasons. And then things that are out of the ordinary, I think sometimes cause um, accidents. I mean, exactly that accidents. People don't mean to, 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 to crash, but I saw, I, I, I was worried that because the signs were out and then they were like, oh, all of a sudden, I mean, one, <laughs> I, I shared with you, Claire, that one day the signs popped up on my street and I thought there was construction. Like, I don't know where they came from, somebody, took them and put them here and then they were gone, so. Yep. <laughs> All right, Council Member Watkins, Brown, and then I have a couple of questions as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Claire, for the presentation. You mentioned that some of the areas were more successful than others. About how many, if you were to kind of say out of the 11 that, you know, didn't have as much conflict or issue versus those that did? You know, I think the only street that we had that was fully without conflict was the only street that elected to withdraw from the program. Um, every single other street that we had, I would say, had a, quite a bit of conflict. Um, streets that were able to resolve their conflicts a lot more constructively, we probably had um, three or four streets that solidly could self-resolve conflict, but I don't think that we're to the point where I would say maybe we have one of our streets who is consistently able to keep their signs in the right location and communicate with their neighbors. Okay, okay thank you. Hey, Council Member Brown.
Thank you. Yeah, a uh, couple of questions. Uh, so in terms of this, this um, you know, the, the tensions around this program, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious because you must be talking to a lot of people that are not communicating with the city council. I mean, I just looked at the um, the post packet production, and I I actually did count those. I wasn't I didn't have time to go back and count through all of. I, and I know we did receive some uh, complaints about it in the early on when people just had no idea what was going on. Um, but six against to one oh five four. So I'm just wondering how um, you know how it is that uh, you know method. But the um, opponents, you know, like where that that came in, I, I recognize about the dynamics on street, um, but I just I've not heard the, about those. So I, I'm yeah. I'd like to understand that a little bit more. Thank you. There um, in your I believe it's attachment one to your staff report. Let me make sure it's either one or two, but it's the one that's not photos. Attachment one. Um, that is all of the communications that I received prior to my agenda packet being due. And that is the analysis that I presented in the presentation of the 64 against 16% pro. And that includes um, phone calls, emails, and survey responses because we did have an online survey as well. Um, so those are included in your packet. Those, um, as noted, those that did come in post-packet correspondence that did come through were overwhelmingly in favor. Um, but those that came during the life of the program were more heavily balanced against. And many of those were folks calling me on, I just had this experience, this happened to me today, I've been trying to live with this, I'm really frustrated, or even, I talked to my neighbor, I talked to my block captain, and I feel like I'm not listened to or I'm not heard or that's not resolved. So I spent, I think when I averaged it out, I spent about two hours per day on the phone talking to people about this program over the life of the program. So there were a lot of phone calls that came in and a lot of deep conversations that were occurring. Um, but I don't want to also not respect the many post packet correspondence letters that did come in in favor of the program. Yeah, and we had, a, we had a lot of those prior to the post packet uh, uh, document. Um, so two other questions. The Have you, because the county, um, it's happening in the county as well as those streets, and the RTC has funded this, and we, I have not heard any complaints about, I mean, I've just anecdotally heard that it's been pretty successful, and that, so I guess there are two questions that are connected. So have you, discuss this with the other funders of Slow Streets in the county and where they're at on it, um, and one, and then two, uh, is there a reason that we are not looking to uh, the nonprofit sector to um, for help with administration of this kind of pilot program? I know that's what we did at the RTC, um, and so far, I mean, we'll, we'll see if anybody calls in to comment about that, but I, I have not heard similar concerns. So if you have, I'd love yeah, to hear about that. Absolutely, great question. First and foremost, the countywide program is not launched yet. So it's, it's not in operation. Um, so therefore, you wouldn't have gotten feedback pro or con about it because it, it hasn't been started yet. Although, by Santa Cruz County, um, via RTC funding, it is, will be operating that program is, I guess, and will be operating and implementing that program as they move forward. Um, that said, that, that's using money that previously had been allocated for the open streets programs that we've had at various locations in the county that got repurposed for um, flow streets countywide. That said, I did talk with both Ecology Action and Bike Santa Cruz County, both uh, early on in the program, throughout the program, and then in advance of the recommendation of the Transportation and Public Works Commission and did have that conversation. Um, I don't want to represent for them. I, I hope that they are on the call, but I, from what I gather, no one has the capacity to do more right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna sh uh, save my comments because uh, just looking at the time, um, just want to be mindful of that. So I'm gonna save my comments for after we hear from the public. And so we'll move on to Council Member Byers and then Vice Mayor Myers.
Um, thank you. I'm just looking at my notes here. I'm, I'm, would you um, just summarize the Transportation Commission's um, recommendation that was made? I believe it was unanimous, although two people had to step out. Uh, I can't get to it when I'm looking at yeah. you know the screen. Um, yeah, so again, apologies. Normally, I would have included that in my staff report, but my report was due to you prior to their recommendation, which was last Monday. Um, the key points of their recommendation are to um, thank Public Works staff for implementing, allocate $20,000 of Measure D funding to issue an RFP for a local nonprofit to take on the program and have it be operational through the end of May 2021. Uh, but your, your last statement right before, um, I guess I spoke, You've been told that Bike Santa Cruz was no longer would be a possibility to us to contract with? There, when I, um, I don't want to speak for them, but when I did talk to their executive director last week prior to the commission meeting, the bandwidth that they have as well, their, um, the, I'm trying to think how to, how to say this, well, not speaking for her. Well, I could ask them. Is, yeah. is more limited and the financial capacity that they have is more limited as well and recognizing that this is a labor intensive program to run and is not inexpensive in terms of its needs, both from bodies or from materials. It was a, a point of, at that time of discussion that they didn't feel would be something they could take on. Thank you. And it seems, I, I don't know where I read, that many cities have implemented this. Are you familiar with that? Correct. Many. So, big neighborhoods or cities or something. What What do you think they're successful in loving it uh, <laughs> that we, we did wrong or we didn't do and we could maybe take another stab at it? Yeah, I know. I think that's a really interesting point and a really interesting question because I think categorizing the program as Successful or unsuccessful doesn't quite do it justice. I think that our problems that we've had are not unique at all. Um, in colleagues that I've talked to in other cities, they are having the same issues that we are with signs moving, with pushback in the community against the, the signs, the locations, pushback from side streets. Um, many staff people who I've spoken with have had exactly the same experience that we have had. That said, the community experience also mirrors what we're seeing here, where there are you know, a group of people who really like the program and a group of people who really do not. So I, I don't think that it is unique. I don't think that what we have going on is different. I don't think it's necessarily something that we did right or wrong or that our community is good or bad for this. I do just think and that choosing to move forward the program is choosing what your priorities are for spending the most flexible transportation dollars that we have and where this ranks in terms of your priorities of what you want to see for programs and projects. And so that, that's kind of the context of recommending this forward is that it's not that it's good or bad or that this is a program that we, you know, with endless dollars and endless time wouldn't keep trying to pursue and keep trying to tinker with, but it's, it's a question of priorities. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers, and then hopefully we can move on to public comment. Sorry, I'll make this as quick as possible. I think, Claire, you pretty much were hitting on my question, which was, um, I, thank you for the presentation. It, it just seems to me that, to your point, we sort of rushed into this, and we were not really able to communicate exactly sort of what this was going to be. And it struck me in the in the, all the communications that I read, it was interesting that people's different response to it. Some people were very excited because they could use the street for walking or biking or you know having their kids there. Others were like, it's great, I can pull out of my driveway without getting rear-ended, you know, or I'm really glad you slowed down the traffic on my street. Um, so those kinds of comments just kind of brought it brought it kind of apparent to me that well, you know, the goal of the project was sort of amorphous, right? I mean, some people were sort of thought, oh, this is traffic calming. But to your point, I think, um, you know, a lot of people are interested in solving, you know, the traffic issues, whether that's too much traffic, too, people driving too fast, 
they don't have sidewalks, whatever it is. And that gets to that bigger programmatic question around um, what do we use our limited resources for, and um, how do we how do we how do we publicly discuss that with our community? And so, um, I, I've seen I looked at all the other cities, at least the ones I could find in California. It looks like there's about I don't know 12, 15 cities that are working on these, varying sizes, all the way from Los Angeles down to San Anselmo, um, Glendale. You know big population, small populations. Um, several of them mentioned this program in the context of Vision Zero, and I know we have adopted Vision Zero as well, right? So my question is, um, it, what is the context that this fits into Vision Zero? Is it calming? Is it safety? Is it, and if, and if it's not kind of nested in Vision Zero, then I feel like that, I mean, that would be something, I guess I would, that, it, that would be a comment that I would, you know, kind of want to discuss as we move, after we get public comment. So okay. maybe just talk a little yeah. bit in the context of Vision Zero. Thanks. Okay. Great question. So Council did adopt a Vision Zero resolution about a year ago now. Subsequently, staff went out and we got grant funding to conduct a local roadway safety plan, which is the data-driven collision analysis component of a Vision Zero action plan. We have a consultant on board right now, and actually that is one of the projects that has been delayed as a result of implementing the Slow Streets program. Uh, we delayed our schedule on that by multiple months because I needed to dedicate my time to this and couldn't do that at the same time with everything else. The local roadway safety plan did a five-year deep dive analysis of the collisions that we've had in the city, collision patterns, hot spot locations, corridor hotspots, and correctable activities. I do not, without directly cross-referencing, I do not think that a single street in our slow street program would be highlighted in our Vision Zero plan. They are streets that we do not have collision history on, streets that we do not have um, correctable behaviors on, and the treatments that we've used for slow streets are not treatments that are proven by data to correct type of things that we're looking to solve. Um, our goal is to get you our local roadway safety plan in early 2021. I actually just received the draft of it last night around 11 p.m. Haven't read it all the way through yet with our edits in, in it, but um, as it relates to Vision Zero, while there are many components that go into it, addressing our highest needs, which are the locations that we have patterns of collisions and in particular patterns of collisions that are correctable with um, database solutions, the Slow Streets program doesn't doesn't address those high priorities that we have. Okay. Thank you for that. And then my last question is, um, did you uh, work with Santa Cruz neighbors at all? Not next door, but neighbor, Santa Cruz neighbors. Where, where Did they surface in any of this? I know they have some really sophisticated ways they get, you know, groups of neighbors together. Just curious if there was outreach there. We did not, no. Okay, great, thank you. All right, if there's no further questions or comments from council members, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to public comment. So for members of the public who would like to speak to item number 20, Slow Streets Pilot Program, now is the time to call in if you haven't done so already. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone. And when you've been asked to unmute, you'll be given two minutes. Uh, with the exception of one person who's called in uh, for additional time. Okay, first caller. Hi, this is Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, so I, I want to talk about the lessons learned here. I think that uh, the rollout was bumpy, and a lot of, there's a lot of confusion, some pushback. I think it's uh, smoothed out considerably, and it's gotten more, a lot more popular since then. But the lesson to me is that um, there was a lack of communication between the city council and its transportation commission, because the transportation commission anticipated that the rollout would need some organizing, it would need some pre-launch effort. It would need to be organizing neighbors to understand what was happening. And uh, they actually recommended to the council that, the, uh, that a nonprofit group be charged with that organizing effort. 
uh, unfortunately, their recommendation did not come before the council in the, in those terms, and so the council was not able to figure out, you know, that this might be a bumpy ride on rolling it out. Um, but it's not too late. Um, I think what you could do today is just continue the program uh, and continue the recommendations, the unanimous recommendations of the Transportation Commission. But I want to add one suggestion, and that's that uh, the input from the commission is uh, summarized by Claire, but their whole thinking behind it has been filtered out. And so I would recommend that the commission and the city council have a joint meeting because this communication problem is not just around this. Uh, it was around the Highway 1 and 9 uh, issue where the council charged the commission with developing safety plans for that highway and staff did not bring it to the uh, commission. Instead, they put up a poster during an open house and they called that uh, they're completing their uh, obligation on that. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's continued uh, with the Vision Zero. The council approved Vision Zero. Uh, the staff objected to that uh, and the commission was for it. So you really have a communication problem. I recommend that you get the commission together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Uh, I uh, sure can't speak to every street in the program, but my opinion about the ones I am very familiar with hasn't changed. Uh, these are largely advocated, it seems, by people who want to turn public streets into semi-private ones for their own private purposes. The justifications of unicorns and children playing, more peds walking, more bikes riding have not occurred, and basically the signs are traffic obstacles on the road making pretend gated communities. Uh, the slow streets over here on the far west side are not heavily traveled, are pretty foofy neighborhoods. I did witness a car blowing the stop, scene, the stop sign at speed at David and Oxford, so fat lot of good that sign was. And that was a big reason for the Oxford signs related to me by a resident. Otherwise, Oxford has nothing special traffic and most people walk on sidewalks. I don't get the Mary signs at Grant Park with a sign in front of a cul-de-sac, and I don't get real short, slow streets uh, between stop signs uh, there and anywhere else. Uh, they don't make sense to me. They didn't do nothing for me. I, I think a hard look has to be made comparing uh, the value of streets uh, as actual benefit. Besides the status, I'm special. I want a special street angle. I suspect is behind some of it. Um, got me how to do that, but there must be higher priorities to consider for the money at this time. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, council members. Uh, my name is Ron Goodman, and I serve on the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, and I believe um, I. Get before you get I started, um, if we could give Ron three minutes. I have it. Thanks. Go ahead. Great. When we proposed slow streets, we imagined a program to encourage drivers to slow down on selected streets to make it easier for people to find recreation close to home during the pandemic. That was it. We recommended modeling our program after successful programs in nearby Bay Area cities. Although our recommendation included having an NGO administer the program under the guidance of staff and the commission, staff elected to implement it in-house without commission or NGO involvement. We agreed it made sense for staff to focus on other priorities. That's why we thought it would be better for an NGO. Our entire commission has, invoiced, has voiced our deep gratitude for the work that staff did, but the challenges that arose were largely due to the implementation choices, and they could have been avoided with input from the commission. Most centrally, the choice to use road close to through traffic signs that did not include additional signage mentioning slow streets predictably caused confusion. Many motorists were annoyed as they couldn't understand why the street was closed. After all, there didn't seem to be construction. And since the signs contained no indication of slow streets or references to any additional information, this turned to frustration as there was no guidance revealing what behavior was expected. Nearby neighbors were frustrated that the traffic was being diverted to their streets, but this wasn't the point of slow streets. And it only occurred because motorists through slow, through, uh, slow streets thought they were closed streets. Even some cyclists thought they weren't supposed to use the street since road closed applies to bikes as well as automobiles. 
I'm on the Bike Pedestrian Subcommittee of the Commission, and I personally drafted the original Slow Street proposal for the Commission. And when I saw the first Slow Street, I was totally surprised. I had no idea it was a Slow Street. I looked for construction, too. Still, the program is extremely popular. At our meeting last week, we received a packet with almost 100 letters with more than 10 supportive responses per negative response. Uh, this is exceptional since usually people complain more than think. People love slow streets and the sentiment has dramatically improved as captains have refined the implementation. We heard from street captain after street captain, the folks who saw this project the best support the project. One captain said she had posted information around her neighborhood in advance and that explained the lack of opposition she saw from her neighbors. If we were to stop this program, we'd likely be the first city anywhere to end the slow street program, and we'd be doing so at a time when encouraging decentralized outdoor recreation is more important than, any, than ever. If the NGO, which is managing the counties in Watsonville's slow street program is willing, um, and I've also spoken with them, and I believe they are, but I think they're going to speak later, we believe they can sustain the program in the city starting in 2021 through the end of May for less than $20,000. If staff needs to, uh, I'm going to stop here. If there are other questions, um, we have, uh, I wish we had more time to, for me to cover everything, but I'm available if there are questions. Thank you. The last four digits are 4965. Please press star six to unmute your phone. Uh, City Council, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my number one recommendation is please follow what the Transportation and Public Works Commission recommended. I was at that meeting. I've been a street captain. I want to, uh, I could repeat a lot of what's already been said about early unpopularity due to poor communication and gradual acceptance. It takes people time to get used to things. Um, I particularly want to mention the fact that this program potentially addresses two problems which have not gone away. It uh, addresses the need for more space for people to walk, have good exercise in open air during COVID. COVID is not going to go away for quite a while, and that's why the Commission recommended through May 2021. In addition, we have a climate crisis which was highlighted when a few couple of months ago, none of us could breathe because of the thick smoke. The thousand homes that were destroyed in the Santa Cruz Mountains, we have a climate crisis and getting people used to not driving as much, biking more, walking more is essential. What could be done is to continue this program and for some of the streets to phase into actually having neighborhood discussions on street-specific infrastructure redesign, which of course is what the staff would like to move towards. But we could use this as a launching pad for that kind of progress. So please accept the Transportation and Public Works Commission recommendations. Thank you. Okay, if the last four digits are four, three, five, six, please press star six to unmute your phone.
Okay, next caller, if you're, the last four digits are 1884, please press star six on your phone to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, City Council. Um, my name is Dina Cole. I'm the Executive Director at Bike Santa Cruz County. While we were very disappointed to hear the city staff's recommendation to discontinue the slow speed program in Santa Cruz, um, we, we do have high hopes for the program to continue in some capacity. Um, we supported the initial implementation of the project. We spoke with staff uh, several times prior to and during the rollout. Claire's been amazing. She's done a truly, truly amazing job with the resources that she had available. The least amount of resource that she had was time. Um, and I feel like that was in, in you know, she's, she's given you all the pluses and minuses and, and that was probably one of the biggest as far as we could see. Um, we do support the recommendation of the Transportation Public Works Commission for the city to prepare an RFP utilizing up to $20,000 in measured D funds for a local organization to sustain the program through May. Bike Santa Cruz County is currently working with Santa Cruz County Public Works and the City of Watsonville Public Works on similar slow streets programs. We believe that slow streets are an important piece of coping with the ensuing pandemic. Sidewalks are not built to support physical distancing. And as you know, we can see by the color of our tier and the, the directives that are coming from the state, we are facing that same um, dilemma as to where we can get outside. With kids still being distance learning, I see parents in our local streets out with kids during the day. And while Slow Streets is not a perfect fix, it does make for a more comfortable place for folks to get outdoors and exercise. We really hope that you will consider, um, in, also in light of the fact that the Transportation Public Works voted unanimously twice for this program, you know, voted unanimously to um, prepare an RFP, and that you and City Council also voted unanimously to implement this program in the first place, that you will continue the program. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Hi, this is Phil Gutel from the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, I, I don't need to expand on what our commission recommended. I think my colleague Ron did an excellent job expanding that. And I also want to thank Claire. Um, I, I think it's important to emphasize that the intent of the commission was not to take away from the great work she's doing. Um, and I think we all recognize that that means that was a trade-off, unintended consequence that nobody wanted to, uh, to happen for sure. And maybe that speaks to staffing. I know our commission has recommended in the past that um, staffing for that department is increased, and um, we were able to increase staffing there previously, but you know it was cut back due to pandemic funding. So I hope in the future this can be used to uh, increase staffing again, so we can have more programs like this, whether or not it's this program. Uh, I just my quick comment is uh, addressed to uh, Vice Mayor Myers, who uh, mentioned Vision Zero and wanted to talk about the applicability here. Um, I think Claire did a great job on responding that, to that as well in relation to the report, but um, one key concept of Vision Zero is speed reduction. And um, the speed reduction, it really relates to the physics of it, right? When you're going slower, you have a greater field of vision, you have a quicker reaction time, uh, your car can physically stop faster, and if there is a collision, um, there probably won't be a death if you're actually going slower. And so. The relationship of slow streets with the intent to actually slow cars down to make it safer <clears throat> does directly correlate to Vision Zero uh, in that regard. And that's kind of independent of whatever that report finds around the specific collision locations or other overlying causes for the uh, collisions themselves is that speed essentially is always a factor, uh, even if there was also distracted driving or something else as well. It's kind of a prime time to Vision Zero. So anyway, uh, thanks everyone for whatever you decide here. Uh, I appreciate you considering this. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for letting us speak. Um, my name is Candace Brown. I'm speaking as a private citizen because I was asked to recuse myself as I am on one of the uh, 
slow street um, street. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that the slow street program is solely meant to be an interim intervention to allow safe passage of designated neighborhood streets for pedestrians, runners, bicyclists, scooters, and people of all ages. We found that this program, people have indicated, are saving marriages. They're letting people, kids, feel safe going out for the first time on their bikes. And even senior citizens are coming out in their walkers for the first time in our neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are also cross-pollinating and walking in different neighborhoods. So it's really creating a real sense of community throughout our town. Um, it is basically encouraging people to social distance. At the same time, we're seeing hundreds of percent increase in people biking and pedestrians walking in our neighborhood. It's a really phenomenal. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think there are a lot of lessons learned, one of which is that we do have to follow guidelines, but there are natural guidelines. And the first step in doing so is community engagement. We knew that was going to be important all along. And I would encourage you to work with an organization like Bike Santa Cruz that is set up with the, the right relationships and already implementing two other programs um, to do so. They were led to believe initially that there was no funding, and that's why they were initially discouraging being involved. But with this small amount of money, they think they can proceed with this program. This program is only recommended to be continued through the end of May, and that's all it is. We want to keep it simple. We want people to have a little light and a little sense of community during a very difficult time. We are in the middle of a pandemic, and we got to get through this. So I appreciate your support for the Slow Street program. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you. Okay, next call, our last four digits are 4356. Please press star six on your phone to unmute. Next caller is 5542. Please press star six on your phone to unmute and you'll have two minutes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Ron Pomerantz. Hello, hope all of you as well. I, I would like to strongly encourage you to accept the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Call us 5542. Please press the button. Hello. Go ahead. Good afternoon, this is Ron Pomerantz. Hope everyone's well. I, I really want to strongly encourage you to please accept the Transportation and Public Works Commission recommendation. They're, your, they're the council's, uh, your representatives, they're your eyes and ears to the community. Uh, their unanimous vote speaks volumes. It, it appears as though staff really wasn't too excited about this program, and they, they gave pretty minimal support and encouragement. Um, it, it sounds like a little more public outreach, some education, some better signage, and um, <clears throat> that would, that's all you probably need to support this really innovative program to make for safer, safer streets and for bikes and pedestrians. So I, I really hope you'll continue this program. They're only asking until May. It's not asking a whole lot. Now let's get some results and see how effective we can make it. I thank you for your time and support right now. Yeah. 
Good afternoon. This is John Ware. I apologize. I've been having some technical difficulty getting through, but I am here to tell you I am a street captain on Caledonia Street, and I 100% support this project and this program. It has been a major positive impact on our street. We have gathered a number of our neighbors. We uh, have a mailing list of eight, 18, 20 uh, different neighbors. And I sit where I can actually see the signs. And I can tell you people are walking more, riding bikes more, and people are compelled to slow down. The street, I borrowed a uh, radar gun from the city and measured people driving down the street and even with the signs, we had people driving down our street at 45 miles an hour. That's a football field every 4.5 seconds. We need this program to help provide a space for people to enjoy the outdoors during the COVID crisis. I have seen my neighbors with wagons full of groceries walking down the street, being able to uh, have access to a broader area to carry their groceries. So. I 100% support this program. My neighbors have all written in positive uh, support for this program. I was one of those persons who was confronted by a unfriendly neighbor. We got past it and the program is working. Most of the negative is people who just don't like having to be, be compelled to drive the speed limit, which is 25 which is the average of the people I had driving down the street while the signs were in place. Thank you for your time. Please vote to support this through May, and then let's find a way to make this happen for a long-term solution as well. But uh, short-term, we've got something that's working. Let's keep it going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to close public comment, and so I'm going to bring it back to Council for action and deliberation. We are a little bit behind schedule as it is, um, and I want to appreciate all the work that our staff has done on this. Uh, in addition, our Public Works, uh, Transportation Public Works Commission, and for the public who've reached out. Um, I'm, I'm going to just be honest and say that I'm a bit torn on this because um, I think one of the things that I'm concerned with and is that you know we had a thirty thousand dollar contract and that went from about June until now. Is that correct, Claire? And your motion was July second of twenty twenty, and we really started spending money starting late July when we purchased materials through the budget reconciliation that I gave you was through the end of October. So it was I would say August, September, October. Okay, so I'm a bit concerned too with now, you know, considering a reduction in that budget to 20,000 over the next six months to carry out this work. So that's something um, I'm a bit concerned with. Um, in addition, it sounded like that this would only be on a subset of streets. And so I think that also is concerning where if one street shuts down and another street is disproportionately impacted, if they're not able to get slow streets, then, you know, why should one street, you know, have the privilege of having this over another um, and I think that one of the things that was brought up earlier was this demand for permanent traffic calming. And I think that's something that, I, you know, I think we're all very interested in. We've heard that from the people called in. And I think really focusing on the streets that have the issues. So, for example, Almar Street, um, I've spent time over there and um, – I know a number of employees who work at the parish, and they have said, you know, there's people who blow through stop signs. There's constantly people who are, you know, speeding down that street. And so really trying to identify what are the, which are the streets that have the issues so that we can actually slow down the streets where we're having these impacts where people are speeding or there are collisions. So, you know, I'm hoping, my hope is that we can really target uh, streets that are problematic versus just, you know, having um, rent, slow streets pop up on streets just because people want them versus they're being in need. And so, um, but yeah, I'd like to hear from my that. colleagues. And, and go ahead, Claire. Yeah, um, you, you raise a really good point about looking at the city holistically. And recently, just a couple of years ago, we adopted our active transportation plan, which does have a community based project list of bike and pedestrian and big route to school projects that are community fed through a year and a half long outreach process they would like to see. 
Uh, coupled with that is the local roadway safety plan that we have underway right now, which identifies um, data-based locations that would be well served by infrastructure improvements to promote traffic safety. So what you say I do think is important that we do have these community processes to identify where are our priorities for investment. And we do have right now one adopted roadmap and one underway that I would really continue to recommend looking to. Yeah, I totally agree that that seems like a good approach to really addressing traffic safety. Um, so those are all the comments I have. I, I guess the other comment I've had, I have um, the last one is that, you know, I've seen people use, you know, children at play signs, drive like your children live, live here signs, and people have just voluntarily, you know, had these out in front of their driveways. And I've seen those be effective in the neighborhoods where they occur. And so I think there are ways that we can continue to encourage, encourage people to, um, you know, slow down on streets that doesn't have to be, you know, a program that's put on by the city. I think there are many alternatives and options out there that are that are also effective that don't have to be a city-run program. So I'm happy to hear what other, um, what the rest of my colleagues think. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Brown, followed by Councilmember Watkins. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate the, all of the thought and effort and energy that's gone into uh, rolling this out and trying to um, make it work for the purposes for which it was um, uh, established. And I, I agree that the rollout was bumpy um, and, you know, we're, it's a learning process, right? <laughs> so um, I understand how that, that, why that might be. Um, but I think now that we have those lessons learned, um, and, um, you know, and clearly a significant amount of interest in this program that um, we ought to find a way to try to keep this going and keep these um, neighborhood groups, as I think um, Pauline said, kind of talking to each other, uh, communicating um, around other kinds of improvements. It's, you know, it's a way for us to get additional um, thoughtful community engagement around alternative transportation um, and our uh, Vision Zero po policies and, you know, kind of so on. So, um, you know, I'm really uh, interested in trying to find a way to uh, keep this going. Um, and I think May 2021 makes sense. Um, you know, it seems to me, like what I, from what I'm hearing, I'm hearing just wildly different uh, uh, interpretations of what's happening and, you know, the support level. And I think, you know, if you, if you oppose the program or you don't want to deal with the program, then you focus on those. And if you um, you know, if you really like it and you want to see the program continue, you focus on the positive. And so, um, you know, just trying to kind of find a way through that um, based upon what we know to be true. Um, and, you know, and I also want to say, this is a little bit of an aside, but I do really appreciate, um, Claire, your work to try to make this work. And I, um, I especially, uh, you know, appreciate your patience with you know, fielding all of those calls, trying to figure out how to make this work. I mean, that, I'm sure that was just, you know, that was pretty overwhelming with all of the other work you have to do. Um, and I wouldn't want you to have to continue doing that <laughs> by any means. Um, so I'd really like to see us, um, you know, look at uh, other possibilities. And it sounds like actually, um, you know, we heard from Bike Santa Cruz County that they, they, could, uh, they, they could be ready to um, administer something like this. And um, you know, in terms of the cost, I think for a nonprofit to do something like this, um, it clearly um, will, that will reduce the cost overall. So, you know, I, I think, and, and then having some of the, um, you know, the uh, equipment already, uh, the out, you know, ha we've already purchased that, it's there, it's available. Um, you know, we can work on signage, uh, a contractor could work on signage. Um, you know, it just, and for all of the, the reasons that people have suggested this is a positive program, you know, I'd, I'd, um, I'd like to see a way forward. So with that, I want to make a motion um, to accept the report on, slow, on the Slow Streets pilot program and recommend that staff develop a request for proposals for administration of the Slow Streets pilot program. Uh, in the amount up to, in an amount up to twenty thousand dollars, including an outreach plan, operating guidelines, and appropriate liability safeguards, to allow a local nonprofit to administer the program through May of 2021. 
And I can send that over. I'm sorry I didn't send it um, to our city clerk in advance. I was just make, creating it right now as we're talking. Um, that's my motion. I'll, I'm happy to send it on if people want to look at it. Um, but yeah, it's just to really continue you know, to spend $20,000 to try to make it work uh, as an interim uh, measure, a pilot uh, continuation of the pilot. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Brown. Uh, do we have a second to the motion? Uh, Council Member Byers, I think you're muted. I'll second the motion. Okay, so um, Council Member Brown, if you can send that over, I think it'd be great so that we could have it up on the screen and, and able to see it. I'm sending it. Yeah, my Gmail is just loading, so I'm sending it now. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins and Council Member Matthews. Um, I appreciate the presentation and from hearing all of the members of the community who called in. I too feel a little bit conflicted on this one too, just um, recognizing the, the trade-offs as well as some of the long-term uh, efforts we want to focus on. And while it also acknowledging these extraordinary circumstances and um, kind of now moving back into a more restrictive environment where people are needing to stay closer to their homes, um, the opportunity for us to be nimble. I do um, want to also share my uh, same sort of sentiments around uh, sort of the equity lens as we look at a program like this. And, and I appreciated your comments, Claire, in regards to really looking at um, more of an equity lens as we're looking at some of these longer term solutions. And so I, um, I, I do feel like there's certain areas in communities and, and neighborhoods that, that feel more comfortable approaching government and approaching um, you know, these types of programs than others. And, and we want to be mindful of those that don't necessarily feel as, as comfortable doing that. Um, but that being said, I think that given where we are in terms of the um, kind of the extension of the shelter in place, more restrictive environments and the pandemic, that it could uh, work to extend the pilot for uh, a, a, cer a certain amount of time longer to, to May sounds appropriate. And then um, really thinking about the longer term strategies, because I think what I really hear from you, Claire, and just in general from the sentiments is that what are we doing um, in regards to our shared values around safe, accessible streets and pedestrian and bike walkways, and how are we moving towards um, more long-term strategies? Given the um, short-term circumstances, however, I think it makes you know uh, a good amount of sense to continue for a bit longer. Um, and then I just have one clarifying question, because in the staff report, you mentioned that if we were to continue the pilot, you would recommend a notification to uh, go out uh, to neighbors within a 300 foot range. Is that, is that, do you want to speak to that a little bit in terms of what logistically yeah. that? Absolutely, I'd love to. So, uh, side note is one of the pieces of feedback that we got from folks was that they didn't feel like they were notified. And if um, they had been notified, they would have liked an opportunity to be heard. So, we have an existing process in our muni code for changing traffic control devices. And it's the process that we use when we're installing red curbs or stop signs or new crosswalks, et cetera. We notify all owners and residents within 300 feet of a given location. And there is an appeals process if people would like to appeal to the Transportation and Public Works Commission, who will then hear that and make a recommendation. And that recommendation can then be appealed to council. And so for community members, there is a way to feel heard, to provide their feedback, and to have some level of recourse if they disagree with the recommendation that's been made. Um, as part of this, if we were to move forward, considering that the recommendation is, and now I'm, I'm waiting to see if that stayed in Councilmember Brown's language, but that the recommendation from commission was that it be on a subset of streets. I think that an appeal process there, a notification process there would be appropriate um, to give people some, some level of input and guidance there. And then it would be something that there would be some level of recourse if there was one street that felt that it didn't fit for them. 
Uh, no, for this program, we did only require that one person on a street nominate their street. Um, there didn't have to be any buy-in from their surrounding neighbors. Um, and I solely selected the subset of streets that were represented in our Slow Streets program. And that, that process is imperfect. And, and so having a notification process, that is something I'd recommend. The other thing that I do have in there is that we, we are out of materials. So within that $20,000, that would need to account for new signage and barricades as well. So thank okay. you for flagging that. I think that that's an important point. And then also being able to tell people that there is an end date, because that was also a question that I got frequently. How long will this impact me? And people making a value decision of, is that something I can live with and just be unhappy with or happy with, or is it something that feels untenable to me? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I wonder if um, the maker of the motion would want to include some of those logistical um, elements into the next steps in regards to the continuation of the pilot. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, you know, I was pretty general in my wording there around outreach process, um, but certainly any of those, um, you know, and notification and uh, ability to um, make, you know, to appeal or, you know, or for, for voices to be heard kind of, uh, you know, about the implementation and the, the continuation on particular streets. And then um, the issue of subset as well, that's, Absolutely, I support including that. Um, I have to close, there we go. Um, so I guess, you know, and I just, uh, you know, I'm happy to um, take a lead from you, Claire, if you wanna um, help me think about what the language, what kind of language would be helpful to you for um, moving forward with those conditions attached. Um, so I, I just- think, Yeah, um, maybe, um, Happy to work with you on that. I think my first question would be, is your intent for this to be on a subset of streets? And if so, do you have any qualifiers around that? Well, I mean, for, yeah, I, I would say uh, for me, I think it's, you know, that's not our job to decide which, you know, which streets, but a subset certainly makes sense. And I think, um, you know, if there's, if there's, I don't know if we can do, maybe we could do some kind of re-up, like, you know, street, street leads, you know, can ask to continue and provide some of that additional information um, in terms of making a selection process if there is a winnowing that has to happen. Um, so I would say, you know, the ones that have seemed to be most effective, the ones where there's, let, you know, not as much opposition or no opposition, um, you know, some kind of guidelines for making that decision, but I, you know, I'm not, I don't feel equipped to come up with what they would all be, but I think this is where it makes the most sense um, for kind of um, operational logistical reasons and uh, community support reasons. Um, I would give you the context there. I'm fully able to make that choice and any and every choice I make there will be wrong. And you will hear an intense amount of feedback around the wrong choice that I make there. While it will be based on a value judgment and based on you know, a, a many number of factors that um, I was asked at commission as well, which streets I would recommend ending. And I sent that back over to them because it really, um, there are objective criteria that I can use to make a recommendation, but whatever whatever choice and recommendation I make will be wrong. So per, would it be okay then uh, with the um, council member Watkins to keep this at a general level, maybe include some language about, um, you know, working out uh, selection criteria and process between uh, the qualified RFP applicants and staff and, you know, and the Transportation and Public Works Commission, if that makes sense as well, to kind of have more eyes on, on the um, criteria, decision-making and, and selection process. Yeah, no, it, it does. I, I, maybe if I could ask one more um, clarifying question in regards to sort of the continuation of the pilot, do you anticipate new streets coming on board or would it just be an extension of the existing streets that we've already identified to have this continue? Um, in which case, I think the, the processes would be different, but um, I don't, I don't know how we'd want to move forward if, if the pilot were to continue, if there's additional streets who have 
interest in wanting to be a slow street at this point. Um, maybe that's a yeah. yeah, no, definitely. We, on a rolling basis, have continued to accept applications for this program. I have them saved in a folder called Phase 2. If we were to move to Phase 2, we also do have the whole list of Phase 1 streets, the, the 48 of which um, seven of them were not selected. Um, that said, I do think we could set it up so that the RFP did have the nonprofit non organization develop that outreach plan, operating plan, selection plan of a subset of streets and the um, liability safeguard insurance plan, all of those pieces in there as well. It's all um, it's all doable, um, but what I, what I do want to bring front and center is in saying that it will be a subset of streets. There will be winners and losers. Sure, sure. Right. I understand that. I, if I may, um, in terms of uh, what you also mentioned in terms of supplies, would you include that in the RFP for the nonprofit to purchase, or would that be something that would be deducted from the RFP that would go out to the nonprofit for operations? That's a good point of clarification for you. Here you've identified $20,000. I would interpret, it, interpret that to mean that the um, selected partner in this would be purchasing those supplies, storing those supplies, deploying those supplies in order to minimize the impact on our operations team which is, has been a big lift there. So that $20,000, I think, would need to include that, that purchase. OK, great. Thank you. If I could just add very briefly, I think, to what might maybe we can think about if, if this is going to go forward, is whether if a street wants to continue, they have to, you know, that street or whoever the captain is needs to go out and get, I don't know, 80% of the, the residences on the block need to be um, in agreement. I think there needs to be some inclusion of the perspective of everybody on the street, the people who live on that block, because um, if it turns out that there's one person on the street who wants the program, but the majority of the people who live on the street don't, then I don't think that's that we should continue that program on, on that street. So, you know, to the extent that we can work that into the motion as well as a, you know, criteria, or if that's something that um, the nonprofit has to work out, I think that that, you know, if we move forward with issuing an RFP, I think that that would be appropriate and could be used as a criteria for continuing the program as well. Uh, Council Member Matt. Oh. I was just going to say something that you could point to there is our existing parking permit, residential parking permit program guidelines where we need a 50% plus one of neighbors to opt in. It, it makes sense. That sounds great. Uh, Council Member Matthews and Council Member Golder. Um, thank you. I want to start by acknowledging Claire's comments in the very beginning about the shared values. We all want safe streets. We want uh, places that are walkable, bikeable, have some traffic calming features. Um, and this was a, um, a good effort that came out of the um, um, Transportation Public Works Commission. Um, I do feel, given the experience here, and honestly, my experience over time with uh, neighborhood traffic endeavors, um, that given the amount of staff time, even under the um, contract of the nonprofit, um, and the limited funds, um, that this is not the time to go forward. Even the motion as written here, I think, uh, will pull a lot of staff time. Um, so I'm not prepared to support the motion uh, as presented. Uh, my own preference would be to accept the staff recommendation with some slightly different direction, but I want to take a little bit of time to talk about my reasons for that. Um, I just want to say probably Catherine is the only one that remembers this, but um, I was involved, gosh, how many years ago now? 40. Uh, and I'm going to hold it up here. Livable Streets Program for downtown. <laughs> um, you remember that, Catherine? I do, definitely. Yeah. But you know, you remember it was intense. It took a lot mm -hmm. of. It was. It was. It was neighborhood. It took a lot of feedback. What were the issues? Street by street by street. People had big dreams, big desires, and it boiled down, and it became more modest. And some of the things are things that we take for for granted now. Um, there were some one-way streets, some stop signs, some um, bulb outs for the pedestrian crossings were, were easier. And I think there 
there's been so much, and just in my experience on council, we've done targeted improvements in these different areas, traffic calming, pedestrian, bike safety, around the city, and be, uh, writing down beach flats, west side, east side, Seabright, downtown, Beach Hill, each one of those took a lot of effort, and I think the public, the public work staff will know, as well as anyone, a good, a doing a good job at this, one that will last and not just go for a few months and then up in smoke, um, takes a lot of input, um, um, good conversation, kind of touch with reality, and uh, I was particularly uh, taken by Claire's comments about getting the uh, roadway safety plan um, and really identify where are the places that really need this, because I think it's probably fair to say that everyone in the city would like to live on a street that didn't have much traffic and <laughs> et cetera. Um, but in general, I think we need to look for the cost effectiveness. Where are the most impacted areas and what were the, what are the things that will actually lead to improvement in those areas? Um, these are um, always more complicated than they seem to be setting out. Um, my feeling is right now when we're facing the, um, the fiscal crisis, the crunch on our staff time, this is going to be one more complicated project. And personally, I'd rather see uh, Claire refocus on the roadway safety plan, the Vision Zero, and direct our resources there. I think it's also fair to say that over time, I mean, I'm really proud of what the city has done to, in, in all of these areas for traffic calming, for uh, our green lanes, <laughs> you know, the rail trail, safe routes to school, the ADA crossworks. I'm just walking down the, the list here. Um, the lighted walkways, et cetera. These all collectively contribute to a safer pedestrian bike environment. So um, just to say all of that, I think the, um, the areas of benefit, the scale of benefit, the staff time, the cost, um, the controversy that will inevitably be involved and focusing on other ways to achieve these goals. Um, those are the things that lead me to think that at this point in time, this is not the, um, the best motion. I'm not going to be supporting it. I would support a motion to accept the, the um, staff report uh, and encourage a focus on existing and anticipated city programs that advance the same goals more cost effectively. That's the best direction I just read to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Golder. Um, I'm super conflicted also. I think the mayor has said most of the things I was thinking and, you know, I've really enjoyed wandering around through these streets with the, um, with the uh, program. But I think ultimately, one thing that I keep thinking about is were the decisions that that we made to, to close the streets that we did, they weren't really data driven. You know, like Claire said, it was just kind of like a neighborhood captain, somebody nominated the street. And I think a bunch of them came out really nice. But as I'm kind of thinking of the city um, holistically, and when I look at the streets specifically on a map, and then I think about the safe routes to school, and I'm thinking specifically for Galt and Bayview, our two Title I schools, um, and the neighborhoods where the lower socioeconomic students tend to live down, you know, off of Laurel Street or the Beach Flat. And if and when, and we were making plans to move towards a hybrid reopening, um, those kids are going to be coming back to school. The kids as well at going to Mission Hill that already have to cross Mission Street to get, um, get there, and they typically take King Street. I'm wondering, there's, so the kids, my, my point is, is that these kids that are coming back for hybrid reopening, it's these weird schedules where drivers aren't going to be expecting to see kids on the roads, right? And so in addition, I anticipate that a lot of kids are going to have to get themselves to or from school because the schedules are going to be so wonky and the parents might be working or whatever. And so we're expecting the kids will be having to get themselves to and from school. And like, if I think about it from an equity perspective, like there's no routes where it's just one of these slow streets where the kids can take but um in in fact the one that concerns me is the escalona one and i know it's really a popular one and and really fun 
but I think about all of the kids that are going to be coming down King to get to Mission Hill, and they haven't had an opportunity to be doing this before, and they're becoming at weird times. I, I'm really concerned with, you know, these kids biking, walking, and um, I really keep thinking of long-term infrastructure would be a better use of money. I do understand that um, if there's a nonprofit out there that thinks they can do all of, all of this for $20,000 for a longer period of time, like it would be nice to continue, but I just think realistically, like I, I don't know how that would be possible. So I, I have to say at this point, I'm super conflicted. I have not made up my mind. Thank you. Council Member Byers, then Council Member Brown. And I just want to let uh, folks know we're about 40 minutes behind schedule. <laughs> and Catherine, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, I'll try. I will try to make it quick. Uh, of course, long term planning and uh, calming were really wanted and needed. It's always been something I fought for uh, over time. And But what I see here, everything about our life is different. Everything we're doing, our daily routines, look at downtown. This is just a short-term plan. It's, it's going to end, and what they propose is to end it in May. So I, I can't see that that's going to make a big impact of where we really want to go with um, having a good traffic plan for all our little neighborhoods. So I think it's short term, it's quick, uh, $20,000 is whatever that's going to bring us. People, I think, have loved this program. I, I went back and looked at all the letters and it was just amazing how um, I, I think partly people just got into it after a while. We knew the rollout was kind of awkward. But I think uh, just look at it as a short term. It's going to be over. It's not in perpetuity. Uh, and I think the Transportation Commission, who really are our eyes and ears, spend a lot of time thinking about this more than, uh, more than we are allowing ourselves. So I certainly support their recommendation and would like to move forward with it. Okay, Council Member Brown and Council Member Watkins and Vice Mayor Myers. I'll just quickly say, um, with respect to the questions about um, concerns over uh, street safety for, um, for pedestrians and bicyclists, um, school children and adults, um, you know, we're, this, that is a, that's a very much a concern. And I think that the, um, the plans that we're making around um, safe streets and, you know, kind of Envision Zero, I mean, those are just much larger and longer term. And so the idea that this is somehow going to, um, you know, conflict with or preclude moving forward in all of those other areas, um, resources permitting, um, I, I just don't think that's the case. Um, so I'd like to just move forward as well. I know we are well behind the scheduled time for this item. Um, and, you know, there's, met, I, there's a lot of things I want to say in response to some of the um, concerns and, and questions that have been raised, but I'll, I'll just leave it there um, because I think, you know, we're, we need to move on. So, thanks. Council Member Watkins and Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I'll, I'll keep my, my comments short, too. No, I, I totally understand the um, con you know, feeling conflicted about, about this and the trade-offs associated with it. And I, I do agree that we're in very extraordinary times and um, being kind of nimble. And I also recognize that um, we do want to see how we can prioritize the communities and the areas that aren't necessarily more inclined to pursue that. So however, maybe that could be related to the, to the nonprofit to look at uh, kind of an equity lens to those, uh, those neighborhoods in our city, but also um, really being realistic about what we could get for the 20,000. And I think that that is, uh, this is a big heavy lift for a small, relatively small amount of funding. And so um, I think that has to be acknowledged in terms of what, uh, kind of what will be the ultimate outcome of, of the extension of the pilot. Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll, I'll make my comments very brief. Um, I'm inclined to support the 
program through the end of May. Um, a couple of question, a couple of comments I would offer would be that I do think that if we are going to be buying signs um, to the extent that they're affordable and within the budget of that twenty thousand, you know, try to figure out how to communicate a little better about what the street closure is about. Um, so whether that is purchasing signs that are slow down for kids or what have you, but trying to at least convey through the signage. I, I found the signage pretty confusing as well. So I think to the extent that we could put signage out that is a little bit more in keeping with the intent of the program um, would be helpful. Um, and if those signs could be more ubiquitous, they may be available um, for uh, neighborhoods to keep. Um, as long as they're used within people's yards or what have you after the program. So I, I think it's important to really express what the program is for. Um, I agree with the comments around equity and providing some um, assessment of, of why a street um, would or wouldn't become part of the program. Uh, I do worry about the budget as well to the mayor's comments. Um, and I guess, you know, in that, in that same comment, I, I, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, when the proposal came to the, to the council back in July, we were sort of looking at a historic um, budget emergency that had really no timeline as associated with it. And so um, at that point, you know, the proposal was for $200,000. We had just finished uh, negotiating furloughs with our workers, with our, you know, staff. So. Um, I, I think we need to be realistic about the cost of this and then also just in, in terms of the context of our larger goals around uh, Vision Zero and others. So I, I'll support the program um, through May 2021, but I do, I'd like to just see some tweaks that, that do provide um, more efficiencies for staff or a nonprofit if they're going to be um, running it and then also really recognize that we need to be talking about this kind of work um, in our interim recovery process and through our um, discussions around um, one of our, our three priorities, which is infrastructure. So I do think there's, that there's a context that needs to be put into a longer discussion, but um, I will support the motion for today. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions really briefly. Well, the, the first was I'm wondering if there might be a friendly amendment that could be made um, to state that um, in order for a street to continue, they must receive 50% or more signatures from the residents on the street in support of continuing the program. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, think, um, yeah, I agree. Second. Yeah. Okay. The other question I have is for Claire. I'm just curious. Um, so, I, I guess the next step would be an RFP would be created, it would be sent out. I guess I'm just kind of curious what the timeline generally is, or is that something the council needs to direct that we provide a timeline for how long it's gonna, the RFP is going to be out? And then I guess the other question is what happens if no one um, kind of, you know, what, if no one accepts the RFP or if no one applies? What yes. if we speak to that? Um, part one, I don't believe it takes any other council action. I can draft it up and circulate it in December. It is of a cost that we um, can all work with purchasing on what that looks like. It, it'll likely just be a, a three bid scenario rather than RFP because it's only $20,000. Um, we will review the applicants and make a determination and it's a pretty straightforward award process. And in terms of if we do not get any respondents to our RFP, then I think you'll see me back here soon. Okay, great. And I think with the friendly amendment, if it could um, maybe state that the streets continue, they must receive um, signatures, must receive signatures of support from 50% plus one of residents on the street. Yeah, thanks. And then I'm wondering to, um, this is just something maybe I'll put it out there, but for council member, round of council member buyers, uh, should there not be anyone who applies for this RFP or who weighs in? I'm wondering if that would be grounds for discontinuing the program. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but you know, I think where we're at today is the recommendation from the Public Works Commission is that there is an or there's 
potentially an organization out there that can do this for twenty thousand dollars from now until May. Um, it seems a little. It seems like a pretty far stretch because that's a, a very low amount of money for what sounds like a pretty substantial amount of work, including supplies. So if no one submits an RFP for that amount, I'm wondering if that would be grounds for us to terminate the program. Because what I wouldn't want to see happen is that that then falls on the city employees to then pick up that slack um, with the understanding that, you know, we're the vote that we're making today is to remove this um, workload from our city staff and, and move that over to, um, you know, a nonprofit. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I'll speak. Well, I think we just heard Claire say she, if they don't get any, she comes back to council and informs the council and they take action to not continue the program. I mean, why don't we just do a step at a time and see? But I, Claire is the one, I, of course, she would come back and say, we didn't get any, therefore, I recommend we drop the program. People could weigh Claire, in on that. If I may clarify there, I think, uh, Mayor, what you're asking is to put it into the motion. Oh, I see. So that that step wouldn't have to come back to say, if we did not receive any oh. respondents, then council's direction would be to end the program without coming back to you. And I think procedurally, it's just a procedure question. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Um, Council Member Brown, is that something that you'd be willing to include in the motion? Um, sure. I, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little nervous about um, what uh, the interpretation of not, re not receiving uh, requests. So, not receiving a request from uh, what's considered to be a qualified you know, provider. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can interpret that. So I'm a little nervous about it, but if that's um, gonna make people feel more comfortable, that's fine. Okay. I see um, our public works director, Mark Dettel has his hand up. So just wanna acknowledge you and give you an opportunity to speak. Yeah, I would just um, maybe suggest the, uh, not just to request a proposal, but to request and award if we receive a proposal sure. mm -hmm. so that we don't yeah. have to come back and we can yeah. uh, shift sure. that workload. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good call. Okay. Council Member Matthews. A few odds and ends. I would say in the original motion, I think allow a local nonprofit to administer the program, I think we the conversation implies at a reduced level. Is that, are people understanding that? That's I understand it's been three, pardon? Yeah. I understand it's up to $20,000 worth of. No, 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 the number of streets. Oh, number. Yeah, because initially I heard in the presentation that what the transportation and public works commission recommended was that this continue on a subset of streets. That's correct. So mm -hmm. that would be a yeah. reduction. That's my understanding. Just, Council Member Matthews. May, maybe just put that language, administer the program on a subset of streets. Just to be clear. And then I think on um, the last item, if no responses, I think you want to say um, qualified responses. That's kind of implied. It's implied. <laughs> um, I guess my other question is about timeline. And uh, implied in all this is still a lot of work on Claire's part. Um, you know, managing the RFP and working with the contract nonprofit and ordering new signs, et cetera. So, uh, Time to issue an RFP, time to look at them, time to pick the subset of streets. This, um, and then we have, you know, the holiday season and all this stuff. You know what we get into uh, around Christmas. So um, I guess this is a question for Claire. What do you see as a timeline for this? And I'll just be honest, it seems to me like a lot of work for something that's just going to last a few more months on a few streets. 
given it. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Councilmember Matthews. Realistically, it's the end of November right now, which gives us two weeks of December before most folks are shut down for the holidays, and we have, we have our closure for the holidays as well. I can likely work on this RC in that first two weeks of December. I see this needing to go through our risk department as well, and we have a lot of questions about what insurance we'll want from folks who are doing work in the roadway. Um, I have quite a few things I'll need to review, so I wouldn't anticipate being able to get this out until January after the holidays, and then hopefully have a fairly quick process to get someone on board then. Um, but we'll want to make sure that it's readily apparent in our RFP about what we are asking for and what we do require in terms of insurance liability, et cetera, so that folks know if they're applying, if it's something that they can actually be qualified for. And then I guess the follow-up question is, do we assume that the streets continue as they are now or that they discontinue until this RFP is issued? My plan would be to keep them running status quo mm -hmm. Um, with the, the recognition that because we're out of supplies right now, they're not in, not all in the best shape. Okay. Council Member Byers, Council Member Brown, and then Vice Mayor Myers. No, I have nothing else. Okay. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I, I just... I have to say, you know, I feel like we're micromanaging something that um, Claire has now said she is fully capable of um, making some of those more, um, you know, detailed decisions about what goes into this RFP. And I'm really not interested in continuing to micromanage this well into the um, <laughs> rest of the afternoon. I mean, we have a lot of business to attend to. Um, so I, I really, you know, I'm not going to call the question. I'm hoping that because that could take a long time too. Um, but I hope we can just. Um, you know, proceed and, and um, you know, people who support it, support it. And if you don't, don't. Well, I think you are the last comment. And so if there are no further comments from council members at this time, um, I think we're probably ready to go ahead and call the roll call vote on this item. So there's been a motion made by council member Brown, seconded by council member Byers. Um, to accept the report on the Slow Streets Pilot Program and recommend staff develop a request for a proposal for administration of the Slow Streets Pilot Program in the amount of, I guess the amount, oh, up to 20,000 and award, including an outreach plan, operating guidelines, and appropriate liability safeguards to allow a local nonprofit to administer the program on a subset of streets through May 2021, along with um, friendly amendments by the mayor to ensure that uh, in order for the street to continue, they must receive signatures of support from 50% plus one of the residents on the street. And if no qualified responses to the RFP, the program is to be discontinued. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Can I just confirm that Council Member Byers accepted this friendly amendment? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? No. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with Council Members Byers, Brown, Golder, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, and the Mayor voting in favor, and Council, Council Member Matthews voting opposed. Uh, why don't we take a five-minute break? We're running behind, but I, um, just so that people have an opportunity to stretch their legs, and then we'll move on to item number 21. So if we can come back around 3.05-ish, uh, we can go ahead and get started on the next item.
right, so I'm just going to go ahead and get, get us started, and then as we're kind of moving along, hopefully everybody will join in. So the next item up on our agenda is item number 21, uh, interim recovery plan for members of the public who are streaming in. Uh, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, if you'd like to comment on the item during public comment, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And then when you've been asked to unmute, please press star six to unmute your phone, and you'll have up to two minutes. And so with this, I'd like to, with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Laura Schmidt, Assistant City Manager, to kick off our presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, Laura Schmidt, your Assistant City Manager. I'm just going to do a brief overview of the City's Interim Recovery Plan draft. And um, what we'll cover today is a brief recap and then the main components of the Interim Recovery Draft Plan, which management partners, that is included as a PDF in your agenda packet. The major sections of the plan are the principles and processes, the actual priority focus areas, of which there are three, the metrics that you voted on for tracking recovery, a framework for considering new initiatives, the ideas that came up during the workshop on October 29th for communications and what the next steps are. As far as the recap of how we came to this draft, um, as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic emergency hit us in mid-March and is ongoing through present time. Around June, the council formed a council interim recovery plan committee and that team worked through October, culminating in an interim recovery plan workshop facilitated by management partners on October the 29th. They worked in early November to put together the actual draft of the contents of the interim recovery plan based upon your feedback during the October 29th workshop. And um, today we bring that draft back to you for your consideration. The page reference numbers are the actual uh, numbers in the, yes. Can I stop you real quick? Uh, are we supposed to be seeing your screen? Yes, you should be. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Yep. <laughs> All right. There we go, now we can see it. Thank you. That's just breezing right on through. So that's the slide I just spoke about. And then this is the recap that I gave you. And then now we're on the principles and processes. And I went a little bit out of order of your PDF document. The principles and processes actually come after the focus areas, but I wanted to cover them for it, before it because they serve as the foundation of how I think the council wanted to approach the interim recovery itself. So decisions are consistent with our three pillars of equity, public health, and sustainability in our health and all policies program. And additionally, you guys escalated the green economy from a possible focus area to an actual underlying principle and process. And that overall were to foster opportunities and practices as to accelerate the green economy. And then um, we need to make sure that we access state and federal resources such as the CARES Act prioritize resources to those most in need and prioritize the items on the grand jury response report and then engage the community in maintaining our parks, uh, a focus and a, and a perspective on risk management for us that we approach the recovery with a risk management hat on and then define our core services and focus and prioritize our core services. So those were the underlying principles and processes that you all articulated both in the committee and then reiterated during the workshop on the 29th of October. Ultimately, this culminated in three focus areas. The first one was to take action to ensure short-term and long-term fiscal sustainability invest in downtown and other business sectors. And there was a lot underneath that umbrella and improve and maintain infrastructure. And here, you, you all spoke about not our, just our traditional infrastructure that we normally envision, but also infrastructure of our natural resources in our parks and open space. In order for us to be able to determine our, how are we successfully making progress on those focus areas, you identified several metrics for tracking the recovery 
and all of these were a percent change in. Um, the first few relate to the business and our, our economy. So business licenses issued, business licenses renewed, commercial vacancy rates, business closures, and then on the development and permitting side, the number of permits issued for planning, building, et cetera, by type, uh, new housing units permitted, and then financially, fiscally, our transient occupancy numbers, our sales tax revenues, our admission tax revenues, and our general fund reserves. And then on the infrastructure side, the line of sight is our investment on the general fund side for capital maintenance projects budgeted, and then our labor hours for maintenance of parks and open spaces, as well as our labor hours for maintenance of recreation facilities. So those are our underlying principles. These are our focus areas, and this is how we're going to measure them. How do we facilitate new items and new initiatives coming into the process as we go through the 12 to 18 months of our interim recovery? So the scope of this conversation was um, new requests that might come up, and it was not the council meeting agendizing process. That was not the scope of this. The intent was to figure out, um, as new items should be considered, uh, normally, we, the preference is that those go through the budgeting process, but obviously there are always new items that come up and that if they're council initiated that their requests have a broad sponsoring support of three council members and that the discussion of the proposed item and applying the basis of the rest of the criteria, which is on the next slide. Also by council policy 6.9, if a request is to take more than eight hours of staff time, that goes to council for consideration and approval. So the, the, the framework for consideration and the criteria would be, is it consistent with the interim recovery plan? What is the urgency associated with it? What's the fiscal impact of the item being proposed? Will there be net revenue that we will be the beneficiary of or will it cost cost us additional funding that we would have to find? Um, is it a mandate that there's something out there that is new change in the legislative arena or any other an executive order at the state level? What's the mandate behind it that would be driving the new initiative? And then the city resource impact. Does the, re does the request require additional city staffing, our facilities or any other resources? And will it delay anything else that is currently on the plate or um, will something have to be supplanted or deprioritized or slowed down? So those were the framework for, the, those were the criteria for the framework for considering new requests coming into the pipeline. Additionally, on the communications front, there, was, there were several suggestions brought up. Um, I don't intend to go through every single one of these. Um, I know that Elizabeth is on the line with us today um, via phone. So the intent would be that as we go through the interim recovery plan process, we would work with Elizabeth and this would be one of her community engagement, community outreach projects. And we would wrap the communications uh, manager services around this program as we roll it out into the future. Uh, the next steps, uh, one of the things that the interim recovery plan, we have the three focus areas. Underneath each focus area, we'll need to line up the existing projects that are in the pipeline um, into the different focus areas and get that line of sight developed and bring that back to the council. Uh, that would be a 12 to 18 month work plan underneath the three priority focus areas that you've identified. And uh, back at the end of October, we had said um, bringing that back in January. I added some buffer in there for February because uh, we had originally intended to have this item on the November 10th meeting, but that got pushed due to the length of that meeting. And with the holiday closure, we only have two weeks in December. I don't know that it's realistic for us to coordinate across every department and bring that information back to you in January. We'll do our best to do that, but I wanted to add the month of February as a possibility in there as well. And then the other thing that we'll be developing is the quarterly report format on the metrics and the progress associated with the metrics that were identified. 
and bring those back to council um, with the first quarter ending um, in March. So that would come back to you in April. So we would do every three months, January, February, March, come back in April, April, May, June, come back in July, that sort of thing. So our recommendation is um, asking you to consider and adopt the 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan for the city as showed in the draft document with edits as you describe and discuss today. And I know I've really uh, gone through this at an accelerated pace, but I know we're about an hour behind at this point. So um, that's it. Opening it up for questions and conversation. Martine, I didn't know if you had any context or thoughts that you wanted to add as well. Uh, no, that's fine. Here to answer any questions as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Laura, for that presentation. Um, I do have some uh, comments and changes to language that I don't know if now is a good time, but maybe when we come back for action deliberation, I can make some suggestions. But um, are there any questions or comments from other council members at this moment? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we'll open it up to public comment. So if there are members of the public who would like to comment on item number 21, interim recovery plan, now's the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been called upon, please unmute your device and you'll be given up to two minutes to comment on this item. Okay, seeing no members of the public who'd like to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Um, so as I mentioned before, I did have a couple um, suggestions maybe to make, um, and this can come with, I'll just mention them now and maybe when there's uh, a motion made that they can be incorporated. But on um, the metrics for tracking recovery, I did have one uh, concern that was raised around uh, the third bullet point, which is percent change in commercial vacancy rates. And I'm wondering if that was supposed to be rates or just percent change in commercial vacancy because, you know, the rate at which businesses become vacant over time, I don't know if that's the concern or that's a metric we want to look at rather than looking at, you know, how is the vacancy changing over time? So are we seeing less right, vacancies? Mayor, yeah. I think, I think that we accidentally deleted the word occupancy. So it should be occupancy rates, I believe. And I think that would probably address your concern. It's commercial occupancy rates. Rather it's not the vacancy. rates that we're charging, it's the occupancy rate. Okay. Um, and then the other one I just wanna raise that um, we may wanna exercise some caution around is the new housing units permitted because one of the things that I've heard over time as it relates to construction is that during COVID, there actually hasn't been a reduction in the construction of housing. And so I think that we just need to be cautious if we're using housing as a metric when um, we might continue to see housing being produced and that's not being impacted by COVID. So I just wanna raise those two points. And then the last one, I just, I think that, you know, we've, mentioned a few times now uh, concerns around the framework for considering new initiatives. And I, I just wonder if maybe, you know, if we could pass the, um, the recommendations that are before us today, with the exception that we allow new council members to weigh in on that, since that's really going to um, impact the new council members who are, who are gonna be joining us in the next couple weeks. So that's just one, and then within that, I'd also like to, mentioned that um, one thing that wasn't in the presentation was the for requests less than um, the eight hours that the city manager will make the determination as to how the request will be handled. I wonder if that can actually um, be in conjunction with the mayor. So the city manager and mayor will make the determination as to how to handle items that are less than four hours because you know I think that the mayor plays a pretty critical role in setting the agenda and if there's items that are less than four than eight hours, then, you know, um, I think that it makes, it seems appropriate to have the mayor weigh in on on that and as it relates to setting the agenda, so. 
Can I comment on that? That is the existing policy, and basically what it does is it sets an administrator's uh, uh, parameter so that if the request takes less than eight hours, then you know we will will we will do it. Um, but then it's up to the city manager to figure out how to do it, which is just the existing approach that we've had. So that doesn't just, that, that doesn't change anything. Okay, it just seemed. It just seemed confusing, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. Yeah. Well, I think the idea was to continue to have that same standard, basically, is, is, is just re reiterate it uh, in, in here. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then um, Council Member Matthews. Actually, Mayor, I, I'll go ahead in the interest of time. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, lower my hand. You, okay. you covered some of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions or comments from council members? Seeing none, um, if there's someone who might be willing to make a motion, council member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll go ahead and move the recommendation to discuss and adopt a 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan for the city. And I'll end my motion at that. And the only comment I would add is, um, that there will be a way to onboard the new council members to have their voice be heard in this uh, 12 to 18 month recovery plan as well. And um, however we can support the city manager's office in doing so would be, I think, really beneficial because we want their input and buy-in as well. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. We'll second the motion, thank you. So we have a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers to discuss and adopt the 12 month, 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan for the city. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Council Member Byer? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. And for the record, I just want to, you know, state and that um, I think it's really important that with the framework for considering new initiatives that we also have an opportunity for new council members to weigh in on that as well. So. Um, uh, if I can just uh, add a little bit more to that. the. The work plan will come back to you, so there'll be an opportunity. Obviously, we'll we'll do as uh, as uh, Councilmember Watkins noted uh, during the onboarding process, uh, bring them up to speed on it, uh, and uh, uh, discuss it with the uh, with the new council members. But also, when it comes back to you in the form of a work plan, which is really actually will be the meat of of, of the plan, so it'll be uh, it will be the new council who will uh, ultimately have to adopt that work plan. So there'll be an opportunity for that, that discussion as well in, in that context. And Martine, I have a question too um, before we move on. So when we receive the work plan, um, is it gonna be broken down by department? Because I think it's one of the things that's come up that I think is a concern is just being able to see which departments are gonna be impacted. So for example, you know, it does seem like, you know, economic development's gonna have a big role, planning will likely have a large role, public works, you know, align with infrastructure, but then, you know, there's other projects going on, for example, the work that's been happening with the community around policing and changes uh, to public safety, and seeing as how, you know, police and fire might not have that big of a role in the interim recovery. Uh, I think it would be really good for us to see what departments are gonna be most impacted by this work, so that if there's, opportunities to work with other staff and department heads on other items that we can really see who where are their opportunities to work yes uh, uh, we typically identify all the departments that are impacted by the various initiatives or objectives that come underneath uh, or that are part of the work plan and then uh, who the lead is uh, so we will do that okay thank you Okay, with that, let's move on to the next item, which is item number 22 on our agenda, the Affordable Housing Inclusionary Ordinance Amendments. And so I'll turn it over to Jessica DeWitt, Housing and Community Development Manager.
Good afternoon, council and mayor. I'm actually having a technical difficulty and I'm wondering if Bonnie uh, might be able to jump in and show the slides. Yeah, that um, this is Bonnie. I just wanted to introduce um, this item as well. And um, I think I may be able to do it remotely. Um, so give me just a second. But I did want to just sort of kick this off um, by saying that this is a reflection really of a, of a year's work and a year's work with um, that started with a council uh, subcommittee looking at our inclusionary ordinance with a recommendation to go to 20% and then culminated last December with a direction to staff to work with a planning uh, planning commission subcommittee on a subset of that 20%, which is what we're here today to talk about with a recommendation that has been approved both by the planning commission subcommittee as well as the planning commission. And I'll turn it back to Jessica in just a second um, related to this presentation today. But I did want to mention that we are working on a couple of additional elements related to our inclusionary ordinance. And we'd like to bring back to you in early 2021. And that includes an employer sponsored housing um, element um, that we've been working on with the school district um, and really using the school district as a case study. And we've been working really actively with them and um, we are going to the Planning Commission subcommittee with draft language related to that next week at the Planning Commission on December 3rd and are hoping to bring that back to you, as I said, early next year, along with some additional cleanup language um, that we do have our housing legal counsel looking at in the ordinance. Um, you know, long-term objectives from the inclusionary ordinance, there are other areas of cleanup. At each time we do a change, it requires a pretty thorough analysis. There's so many different linkages um, within the ordinance. So it does take some time to go through, um, but really appreciate the hard work both of our staff um, and the Planning Commission uh, subcommittee that's been working on this as well as the Planning Commission. So thank you for that. And with that, I will turn it back to Jessica. And Jessica, it'll take me just a minute. Let me see if I can pull that up for you. Uh, I'm, I think I might have gotten it. Apologize, guys. I'm almost over you. Oh, there we go. Can anyone see? Yep, you got it. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, what we have before you today is a recommendation to amend the inclusionary ordinance, it's city code 2416 to include an option to allow rental residential developments the ability to make 5% of their required 20% affordable units, <laughs> affordable units available to the Santa Cruz County Housing Authority tenant-based subsidy holders, and only if there is no subsidy holder available to occupy the unit, that these 5% units be restricted to households at 120% of the area median income and rent levels. So per county direction or county council or city council direction, uh, the P planning commission formed a housing subcommittee earlier this year to focus on the inclusionary ordinance, including the potential for adding a tenant based subsidy option in the ordinance. The sub subcommittee met around nine times. Um, to review well over 15 jurisdictions inclusionary ordinances and collected feedback from local agencies and stakeholder groups. Uh, for this, so even though everyone has been super impacted by the pandemic and recent wildfires, we worked really hard to catch up and draft this amendment recommendation as well as others that Bonnie just mentioned that we plan to bring to council in the new year after the, after the planning commission reviews. And for this inclusionary ordinance that we're recommending for proposal today, we spent an extensive amount of time with the housing authority to ensure the policy proposed would have the best chance to be successful at getting more subsidy holders housed. So an older version of the proposed amendment um, was first heard by the planning commission on September 17th. And at that meeting, the Planning Commission provided direction to bring the item back to the Housing Subcommittee for further review on how to strengthen the language uh, to encourage tenant-based uh, subsidy voucher holders. Um, so, so then we brought it back to the Planning Commission on October 15th. In preparation for that October 15th Planning Commission meeting, um, 
staff and the subcommittee compared the latest Housing Authority payment standard rents with state regulated moderate income rents and confirmed there really is, is not a whole lot of difference between those two rent tables. There's, uh, for the two bedroom units, it's less than a hundred dollar difference. Um, and it goes, it does go up to 600 for a three bedroom in terms of a, a rent differential. But really there's, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two rent tables. Um, however, the decision was made to use the lower rent of each of either table in, the, in this instance in the ordinance. So after reaching out for further feedback from the Housing Authority and Legal Council, the subcommittee reviewed um, the amendments and here is the first, the first of the amendments that we're proposing today. Uh, so in the definition section, so this is chapter 2416.15, um, in the affordable rent, we're basically giving a clarification, providing clarification on what moderate income households, um, how that's calculated per, this is a standard state formula that, that's up here um, before you. And then we also provided a definition for what the payment standard unit rent would be. Slide, uh, this is an, a continuation of the same definition section. We're just providing a definition for those 5% units and calling them payment standard units. Um, then the, we're also give, providing a definition for what is a tenant-based subsidy holder. All right, so then in section 2416.25, this basically is just demonstrating that, um, that no discrimination should be given towards a tenant-based subsidy holder when they're going through the rental application process. 2416030. So this is where we're kind of getting into the meat of the of the ordinance amendment proposal. So this walks you through the process for how 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 this five percent is is uh, rented to a tenant based subsidy holder. Um, but essentially, as stated earlier in the presentation. Um, we worked really hard with the housing authority to vet this process and make sure it, it's followed with the internal process of the housing authority. I, I'm sorry, what did you say? Clicking on the link for the appointment. Oh, sorry, I thought someone was talking to me. Um, okay, so uh, so basically, this walks you through what the process is. Um, then in section 9C, um, it, it further defines how is this rent being uh, calculated. And again, that goes back to that information I provided you earlier when we were looking at the different rent tables for a moderate income rent versus a payment standard rent through the housing authority. So basically we're using, we're applying whichever rent is lower if it's, if it's for a, if, if it's for a non-subsidy holder that's renting the unit. If it's for a subsidy holder, then it's always going to be the housing authority uh, payment standard rent. Um, section D goes through the, the requirements for the contract that, um, that the housing authority requires when a, an owner and uh, rent from a, a, a subsidy holder, or when a, when a subsidy holder is renting from a, a from a property owner, um, and then I'd, oops, uh, E is going through the monitoring and compliance, and what, what is the process there? And I know there's been some questions from the public on this. So there is a 30-day marketing period where the property manager or owner has to uh, list the unit on the Housing Authority's website. So this is something that the Housing Authority can actually track to see if if the you know if the owner actually did post it on the, the housing authority's website, in addition, the owner must keep records showing what documentation you know what they did to follow the process, um, and that proof must be retained for five years. In addition, the city does do its own monitoring annually, and the, in working with the housing authority, they're also open to providing reports to us on a request basis if they see that. If they're tracking and they can see that you know an owner doesn't seem to be uh, accessing the five percent that they're actually doing it or renting to non-subsidy holders versus subsidy holders for those payment standard units. Okay, so then section F is basically 
it's really encouraging a property owner to rent to rent the payment standard units first for subsidy holders. And it, what's the whole idea behind this provision is really to keep the low income inclusionary units available for low income households versus filling them up with the payment standard, uh, you know, the payment standard rent when and then subsidy holders when we really want to try to focus on keeping the subsidy holders and the payment standard rent or units and the uh, low income households in the low income uh, inclusionary units, the, the rest of that 15%. So again, before you is the recommendation, um, introduce the publication for an ordinance amending the title 24 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, the zoning ordinance part one of chapter 2416 affordable housing provisions, including sections 24-16-10 through 24-16-60. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, well, thank you for the presentation. And I really wanna thank staff and our commissioners for all the hard work that they put into this. I know that it was, uh, it was quite an effort to try to figure out how to make this 20% work, but it seems like, uh, you know, there was a unanimous decision by the uh, planning commission and it seems like this might be something that um, we can see how it works out moving forward and can really benefit our community with providing more affordable housing. Uh, with that, I'd like to see if there's any council members who have any questions or comments for staff at this time. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, thank you, um, Jessica, for the presentation. And yeah, I want to express my um, my thanks to the um, Planning Commission, Housing Subcommittee, um, and our staff. Um, this bump in the to the twenty percent, um, really, you know, getting there, making it twenty percent is is one thing. Getting there is another, and and actually having it be successful with regards to um, building, you know, building housing is is um, is, is really what we need to be measuring ourselves on. Um, outside of the ordinance today, which I know we're doing the first reading, um, I'm just curious when we come, when, when other additional uh, amendments come back, um, does staff have any ideas in terms of how we assess these policies moving ahead? Um, I feel like we're at a point in time where the state housing policy is almost overtaking our tweaks to some of the work we're doing within our own ordinances. Um, and I'm just reflecting on a couple of the approvals that I think, you know, one approval occurred last week and certainly a few more on, on the books, um, you know, where we're looking at potentially a couple of hundred units potentially being approved um, very quickly here in downtown. Uh, so I'm just curious from a from staff's perspective, um, whether or not you've you've thought about an evaluation kind of um, process for these for these policy tweaks. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can speak from the housing side. Um, I mean, we're tracking. I mean, as you saw in the study session that, that occurred a few weeks ago, we're tracking on all the legislation that's that's going on out there. But there there is a ton going on. Um, but we are trying to track on that legislation and mirror it uh, with, with our current ordinance. Um, I can give you an example is something that we're tracking on is the school district. Um, you know, there's, a, there's some legislation that's been going through on the school district and there's, you know, a potential for a, a, a school district project on the west side. Um, and so trying to, trying to make sure we're aligned correctly to be able to, to you know, be ready when, when that comes about. And I think that's, that's why we're also coming to talk with you about the employer sponsored housing item in a few weeks um, next year. Um, so, so, so yes, we are tracking on it, but um, I, I'm, I'm merely speaking from the housing side. So I don't know if Bonnie or Lee wants to jump in, um, you know, on, on any of the other pieces. Sure. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, as Jessica mentioned, um, there are quite a few bills, and we heard about a number of them uh, the earlier in this month with the study session. But um, with AB 2162 allowing for affordability um, uh, through uh, for 
uh, qualifying 100% affordable projects with supportive housing going through ministerial process. And with SB 330 requiring um, the council or decision-making body to uh, make specific findings um, related to um, adverse public health and safety impacts uh, supported by substantial evidence in the record in order to deny projects that meet all the objective standards of uh, the city. You know, the state is stepping in, as you mentioned, Vice Mayor Myers, uh, and um, putting in um, some very uh, strong uh, regulatory constraints on what we can and cannot do. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure um, if you're, you're speaking to this specifically in relation to the, um, uh, the implications on housing of the inclusionary ordinance, but um, with the inclusionary ordinance, um, you know, this is certainly um, going to, well, I mean, Jessica's looked into this, so she can speak to this better than me, but, um, you know, from the perspective of financing, um, this provides a little bit of wiggle room um, uh, more so than the 20% at 80%, which is, is still an option as I understand it, correct, Jessica? Yeah. They could just pursue this as an alternative. Um, so I think we will wanna keep an eye out on that right now. A lot of the projects that we have are um, predating the, um, the current 20% requirement and um, we do need to look at each project individually. Um, you know, when projects are, are purchased, you know, if they're uh, small ownership units, that's gonna have a different implication uh, than, um, you know, larger units in, in terms of how they're able to meet the inclusionary requirement because that delta between the market rate price for a small ownership unit is gonna be less um, if you've got a very small unit. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to keep an eye on it and um, between economic development and planning, we'll, we'll continue to keep you appraised on what we're hearing in the community and looks like Bonnie might want to add something as well. Thank you, Lee. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is that with the past direction we had as part of the housing blueprint recommendations and the recent direction from council to track housing legislation, it's something that we are constantly sort of monitoring. And, um, and with a recognition that there are increasingly each year more and more uh, bills and legislation related to housing, it's something around our inclusionary ordinance that we realize we're gonna need to be on top of. Um, and as we've mentioned before, and I mentioned at the beginning, our inclusionary ordinance is very complicated um, to the extent that we can streamline it, we would love to take the opportunities to do so. Um, it is sort of an ongoing process that we've been looking at for the last couple of years. Yeah, thanks for those comments. I think that, um, you know, with the loss of houses that were experienced in the fire and um, sort of the blunt force uh, kind of approach by some of the state legislation, I, I just worry that um, achieving the mix that we need and, um, you know, attracting the private market to actually help with some of the, uh, with the building of some of these units, we, it just seems, it just seems um, something that we want to keep keep our eye on. So thank you for the comments. Very helpful. All right. Are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to open up to the public uh, for public comment. So if um, if there's a member of the public who would like to speak to us on item number 22, which is the Affordable Housing Inclusionary Ordinance Amendment. Now's the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll need to listen for when you've been called on. Once you've been called on, please press star six on your phone to unmute, and you'll be given two minutes to speak.
All right. Well, seeing uh, no members of the public who are interested in um, commenting on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action deliberation. I actually have a couple questions, uh, maybe for um, someone in economic development. It was brought to my attention within the language of the ordinance, um, two items. One was within the, and, and it's just to try to make sure that these, that this is consistent, but within, with number six, uh, the in lieu housing fee in item number, it's 6A1, um, for all ownership residential developments uh, or residential subdivisions that would create two, but no more than four additional dwelling units or parcels at one location, the applicant may elect to pay an in lieu fee for the fraction of an inclusionary unit equal to um, 0.15 times the number of units or parcels in the residential development or subdivision reduced by 60%. I was just curious if that 0.15 is reflective of the 15% uh, inclusionary, because if it is, I'm wondering if it would make sense for it to be increased to 0 0.20, if that's what's gonna happen, if we're gonna increase the inclusionary to 20%, because that seems like it would bring it, it would make it consistent. Yeah, Mayor, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica in just a second, but this did uh, come up internally at the staff level and we were discussing this as well. Um, you may recall from our conversations um, and our detailed discussions at council and with the council subcommittee oh, you know, well over a year ago, um, there has been some analysis conducted, independent analysis of the challenge for small um, developers and those who are doing small projects under five units particularly. So um, that is something that we had some analysis regarding um, the challenges of actually developing those units. Um, we would need to go back and that's something that we noted when we were looking through those as well as part of the recommended changes that are coming back to you in early 2021. Um, regarding that. We need to um, see if they're linked together related to the 20%, and if so, we'll come back to you with a recommendation around that. And I don't know, Jessica, if you would like to add to that. Just that, uh, yeah, a lot of these items were also brought up at the subcommittee level, and, and so we're hoping to, that is one of the the next things that we're planning to bring back to council in you know early next year after it gets vetted by um, the planning commission. Okay, and then the next question I had was on item number seven, land dedication. So similar, similarly, for residential developments with an inclusionary requirement of seven or more inclusionary units, an applicant may propose to donate a minimum of 15% of the net developable area of the residential development to the city for the construction of a project with, and it goes on. And I was just wondering, similarly with that 15% donation, if that if it would make sense to increase that to 20 as well, to be consistent we're, with. We're looking at that as well to bring back at the same time. Okay, I just wanted okay. to check on those things because we had heard from members of the public, so appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Council Member Brown. And Sandy, you're muted. Yeah. I think I was off mute, then when I put myself on, but it wasn't loud. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you to really to staff. Much appreciation for going through this uh, really complicated, arduous process to try to figure out how to make this work. Um, as you all know, I this is a major issue for me. I um, am am really happy to be seeing this come forward and. Um, you know, and to think about the possibilities for um, increasing our affordable housing stock through this because we do have a lot of projects that will be coming our way. Um, and so I'm just really happy to see like the problem solving that went on to tr make it work. Um, and I hope that, um, that we can uh, come back uh, and see evidence of that um, in the future. So um, I, with that, I will, um, I'm very pleased to move uh, the recommendation, the staff recommendation to, and planning commission recommendation to introduce for publication an ordinance amending Title 24 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, that's our zoning ordinance, uh, part one of chapter 24.16 uh, affordable housing provisions, including sections 24.16.010 through 24.16060. Just the okay. motion alone will give you a sense of how complicated this is. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and second the motion. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Oh, 
you're, you're muted. Thank you. Long, complicated process. Thank you for all the effort that went into coming up with you. Councilmember Golder. Thank you, everybody. I just had one question. Um, so I am still a little confused. So let's say somebody wanted, because we talked about that mid-size housing in one of the previous meetings. If somebody wanted to build uh, something that was more like a duplex, triplex, or a fourplex, so would they, would they be subject to, to, to this ordinance? So they, do you mean the rental subsidies? If, if they can take that option, if they would like to, if this is one of the options available to an owner is that they can, they can request to use this rental subsidy option, but they don't have to, they could, ju could just do the 20% at 80% of AMI. I guess that I'm still like confused. So let's say they're building a brand new triplex or less than five units. Wait, are we talking about a different topic now? Um, oh, I think I might be. Bonnie looks yeah. like <laughs> so I, I think your question is if they're building a, you know, a, a three unit or four unit, are they subject to the inclusionary, inclusionary ordinance? And yes, they are. They do have the option um, under a certain amount of paying and in lieu fee in lieu of um, providing the affordability on site. But ev everyone in the city is subject to our inclusionary ordinance, all new development. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to state before the vote, um, I'm actually not gonna support the change um, in the ordinance. Um, I do feel like this, um, I mean, I mean, this will work for some of the bigger projects, but I have some concerns about the kinds of projects that we need to produce within our neighborhoods. Um, some of these smaller projects. Um, I do feel like, it, it, especially for the inclusionary, this high for the rentals is really gonna disincentivize um, creation of the types of diversity that we need in, in, the, in our housing stock. Uh, I appreciate um, the interest in trying to, you know, produce affordable housing through this method. Um, but I, I just think that um, it's, it's going to prevent um, some of these um, smaller ones that actually, these infill types of projects that actually provide uh, really important uh, infill opportunities for our neighborhoods. And so I, I fear that our pattern will be um, a, a, not really what we all have envisioned um, once, once this gets in place and we sort of see how it plays out in the market. So um, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the intent behind it um, and I'm thankful that the state is actually paving the way in many ways to um, help us get uh, get projects moving. But uh, I do just want to state that I'm not going to uh, support the amendment uh, amended changes at this time. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, just in response to the, uh, the comments, of Vice Mayor Myers, I, I do understand your concerns and also Councilmember Golder uh, around these smaller projects. But let's not forget that they've already they've always been subject to uh, the requirements at the 15% level on, for that brief window when we re the council reduced it to 10%. Um, but um, so the tw I guess I'm just I, I'm a little confused, um, Vice Mayor Myers, by your opposition. Given that um, if we don't do this, then developers do, will not have the ability to capture those additional rents through the subsidy program. So um, it seems to me that if we don't support, if we don't approve this, then developers are are sitting there with the 20%, which is was the, the problem that we were um, were told was that we were told it would be a problem. So I guess I'm just. Um, I'm just not clear about that, but I understand that if we don't support the um, policy in general, there will be other, you know, other times to talk about that. I need to, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. I need to make a point of clarification. I had staff texting me um, about what I just said. So I need to clarify. Um, so uh, part of our housing team um, has been, you know, furiously in the background, make, you know, confirming everything that we're saying and looking at details. And um, I, so I need to correct what I said earlier. 
So ownership projects where they're not going to rent them can opt to pay a fee or provide a unit through our ordinance. However, for very small rental projects, um, they are not subject. So four units or less are not subject to um, our inclusionary requirements. So it's really important that I clarify what I just spoke a minute ago. Wait, so you, what do you mean by ownership projects? Sorry for interrupting. So those projects that are, um, are built to be sold um, are the ownership projects. And, and J Jessica, you're on, so I don't know if you want to add to that. No, that, that's right. I just I was trying to raise my hand and I didn't know how to <laughs> clarify. So. I apologize for the confusion. Yeah. So they're mapped, Councilmember Golder. Uh, so if you can map a project so that they can be the units can be individually sold, and we do have uh, allowances that allow for mapped units to also be rented. Um, and that's where some of the confusion comes in sometimes because then we um, often will negotiate an interim arrangement for those that have mapped but are rented in the interim that provides affordability um, in that interim period as well. So it, it, is, it is complicated. All right, are there any further questions or comments from council members? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to respond to, uh, to Council Member sure. Brown. Um, I, you know, we've, we've, we've gone from a pretty comprehensive study with 10% outside of the downtown, 15%. We're now, t you know, at 20% um, for both rental and market, or for both rental and purchase. Uh, it's just, for, in my opinion, it's just, we've just moved up um, into an area that I just, I just will be curious to see how everything works out. So I, I'm I'm just not supportive of the leap we've made, um, and um, so I'll leave it at that. So thanks for your comment. Thank you. Um, are there any further comments from council members? Okay, hearing none, um, I think that you know this is a really um, I think that there's a lot of work that went. My headset just died. So um, I feel like there's a lot of work that just went into uh, trying to see how we can make the 20% work. I'm really confident that what the staff is proposing and what the planning commission is proposing, I think it's an opportunity for us to see how we can make this work and to just, you know, and, and if it doesn't work, then we can come back. But I think that, you know, we've seen, you know, we, if, if programs don't have mechanisms that allow them to, to work, then we all often see them fail. Um, and I think this is an opportunity where we can implement something that will um, help meet and address the needs and concerns of developers. It will help us provide more affordable housing in our community. And I think that it's the right step and it's something we should at least give a chance. So um, with that, we have a motion that's made by Council Member Brown, seconded by Mayor Cummings. I, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote on this item. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers. Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Did you say aye? Yes. Um, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? No. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with Council Members Brown, Byers, Watkins, Matthews, Golder, and Mayor Cummings voting in favor, and Vice Mayor Meyer voting opposed. Okay, so um, we are back on schedule. And so if, if I think let's uh, continue through, and then hopefully if we get through this item, we can have a break from 5.30 until, um, looks like, 7, when we'll bring it back for oral communication. So I'll, with that, the next item on our agenda is the Santa Cruz Work Master Plan and Environmental Determination. Um, for members of the public who would like to comment on this item, now is the time to call in uh, using the numbers that are on your screen. Once you've called in, please listen through your uh, headset or your phone and um, know that if you are watching through television uh, or through the online streaming, uh, when we do uh, it's really important that you listen through your phone so you don't miss your opportunity to speak on these items. And so with that, I'll turn it over to um, Bonnie Lipscomb, our Director of Economic Development, to kick us off. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to make just a few brief comments before turning the presentation over to David McCormick, who's our asset manager and property manager for the wharf. Um, that I just wanted to uh, sort of put this in the context of the last sort of decade around the wharf. Um, so the consideration um, this afternoon of the wharf master plan and certification and consideration of certification of the ER has been over seven years in the making. It was actually in 2013, um, the year before the wharf centennial celebration, when we first kicked off the public outreach process for the wharf master plan. We embarked on the master planning process as a result of considerable feedback over the years from our regulatory partners at the state and federal level that we were long overdue for a guiding document and updated regulatory framework. In fact, the last master plan for the wharf was approved in 1980, so it is definitely time for a new master plan. Um, in the last decade, each time, and we frequently have uh, attempted and, uh, and applied and often been successful in the past, but applying for grant funds, most recently Economic Development Administration for major repairs um, or for new opportunities or to the Coastal Commission for approval of outdoor seating, our lack of an updated master plan for the wharf became a point of discussion and a directive from our partners. In fact, EDA provided considerable funds, um, grant funding to enable the current master plan to be brought before you today. We're excited to bring it today for a full discussion. I know that we will have one. Um, and I'll now turn the presentation over to Dave, who has prepared a thorough overview of the plan, its purpose, and the need. Um, he also will go over the public process and recommendations regarding both the master plan and the EIR to date. Um, John Bambachi, the wharf supervisor, is also available and will go over the current state of the infrastructure on the wharf and the need to move forward on critical repairs. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just see here. Okay, I guess I have to phone in the computer un unmuted, so just checking. All right, uh, well, thank you everyone for, um, for allowing us to come here and present this today and, and for your consideration. Um, today we want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the WARF Master Plan and the EIR that goes with it um, and why it's really critical that we move this forward now. Um, and uh, as Bonnie mentioned, my name is David McCormick, I'm the city's asset manager and uh, I oversee the city-owned properties and redevelopment as needed, uh, such as the WARF and Del Mar and things. Um, so I want to just give an overview of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, initially we'll have a, a quick overview of the WARF history. Um, and then a little bit about, uh, want to dispel some myths about what the master plan will do and what it won't. Um, what is the master plan? Uh, what the process was leading to it? Uh, and, and then uh, sort of what's included, what our needs are, and then finally the EIR before we adjourn to comments and questions. Um, as you can see here on the screen, uh, the wharf was originally built uh, in 1914, or began in 1913. Um, and it was overwhelmingly supported uh, through the, the support of the, the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce at the time, um, but also just the, the voters in general. As you can see, it was passed by 3,434 to 74. Uh, I can imagine there's a lot of uh, policy goals that you'd like to pass with a margin like that, um, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty impressive that the, the wharf was, was done so with so much community support. Um, this is just a scene of uh, opening day. You can see the crowds came out en masse to, to visit the new wharf that would, uh, was the last of six wharves built along the, the, the waterfront. Uh, you can see a couple of them still in place uh, in this picture. There's, I think, Pleasure Pier and the railroad wharf there on the left. Um, when it was originally built, it was, uh, as I mentioned, a co commercial wharf. It still is a commercial wharf, uh, although it has a lot of recreational and tourist functions. Um, it was uh, originally a shipping center and, and actually passenger vessels came up and down the, the Pacific coast uh, frequenting uh, Santa Cruz from, you know, anywhere from San Diego up to Seattle. Uh, historically, as mentioned, uh, it was a shipping pier uh, along with uh, fishing and, and other ocean related industries. Um, uh, as those began to decline in the, the 1940s and 50s, uh, tourism began to take greater hold on the wharf. And you can see in the picture there uh, how it had a little bit of that sort of tourist kitsch at one point. Um, the large warehouse building still there in the back, um, but uh, still very much a, a fishing wharf with the boats alongside, but 
increasingly becoming a tourist center. Uh, one of the, the constants about the wharf is that it has changed over time. Uh, the picture at the top shows you what it looked like originally and then today. Uh, a number of expansions have occurred, uh, adapting the wharf to different economic conditions and, and community needs, um, helping to sustain it uh, through business partnerships and really use as a wharf. That's one of the critical historical values of the wharf. Um, as you can see, when, when things change on the wharf, uh, new opportunities present themselves. So that uh, historic warehouse building that once anchored the end of the wharf came down in the 1960s, uh, along with about 45 feet of the, the end of the wharf, you can see in the bottom left, uh, which had deteriorated to a point that it couldn't be repaired. And so it was taken down along with the warehouse building and replaced with a fishing park. Um, the first generation of uh, what we now see as the sea lion viewing holes uh, were produced uh, through a partnership with the, the California Wildlife Conservation Board. Um, back to that uh, series of expansions, uh, this gives you some idea about how the, the major expansions of the wharf occurred. Uh, there's a few changes in there, but in generally that's the, the, the course of adaptation and, uh, and growth as the wharf has changed to support what the community needed. Uh, the most recent ones would be the Agora and the Commons. Um, those two additions created a lot of the public space that was is now in the wharf. Uh, those were added in the 1980s. Um, as Bonnie mentioned, uh, the current plan for the wharf dates back to the 1980 beach area plan. Uh, along with that was the uh, was the uh, Santa Cruz Wharf. Was it the municipal wharf? design framework. Uh, nope, it's not really coming up. I uh, thought I could hold it up. Looks something like that, design framework. Um, so that has this plan, as you can see in the top there, which is a very distinct um, proposal for the wharf, very different uh, and much less, uh, in my opinion at least, uh, sensitive to the historical context of the wharf. It has some of the geometry that we might have found on the Pacific Garden Mall, but uh, along with this kind of odd L-shaped extension at the end. Um, but it goes to illustrate that uh, while a lot of good things came from a, that master plan, uh, like the, the Agora and the Commons buildings we know today where Olitas are and the stage area, not everything in that master plan was built. You know, that's a characteristic of master plans. Sometimes they, they, they always put out a vision, but not all of it comes to pass. It's really a, a, a reflection of what the community needs at any given time. Uh, but regardless, 40-year-old master plan, it's well time for an update. Uh, the wharf today, um, it's important to kind of get a little context on that. Uh, one thing to note is that since the 1980s, when it was, we last passed that plan and last uh, ex expanded the wharf, the population in Santa Cruz County has increased by about 45%, um, nearly, what, yeah, 90,000 people or so. Um, and uh, since 1914, when it was built, it's increased more than 10 times. So while, <laughs> while we think about the wharf as being a, a tourist center and attracting more than 2 million visitors a year, it also supports our local community, which has grown substantially since its last, uh, the, the wharf has last been really reinvested in. And, and I think John will, will go on to elaborate at that, that there's a feeling that a lot of the spaces there are getting increasingly crowded and tight, uh, particularly in the COVID environment, we, we notice that more often. Um, it's also, the wharf is also a top three regional attraction according to Visit Santa Cruz. Um, it's got uh, upwards of 25 business partners, uh, the vast majority of which are locally owned businesses, um, you know, with, with uh, partners that help sustain the wharf and reinvest their earnings here in the, our community. Um, more than 400 employees um, call the wharf home. You know, that's where they get their livelihood. And then roughly 10% of the city's restaurant workforce um, of course, pre-COVID, pre uh, call the wharf uh, their place of work. So it's not an insignificant impact um, economically uh, with over $30 million in yearly sales between the businesses or, or right around there. Uh, and it generates about $2.9 million on average uh, for the city revenues. Uh, nearly most years, all of that goes right back into the wharf and sustaining it. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a model for sustainability, uh, although it needs an update and, and it needs a lot of uh, corrective changes that the master plan puts forward to help us continue that into the future. Finally, uh, a 2018 insurance assessment valued the wharf at roughly $119 million um, in value. So it's a, it's a really high value asset uh, that takes constant care and stewardship, 
um, and we, we should keep that in mind. All right, so uh, moving on to what the master plan will do. We really want to dispel some of the, the notions that have been out there in the public realm. There's been a fair bit of misinformation. Uh, so first and foremost, the MORF master plan will set rules and guide, goals and guidelines uh, for what we do going forward and how the wharf will develop and adapt. It will expand public access and it will increase parking. Although the parking spaces, a few of them may shrink with restriping, uh, they will go to the city standard of eight and a half feet. Um, that's the proposal. Some of the spaces today are, are 10 foot plus, um, which is inefficient. Uh, I mean, it, it can be comfortable if you get one of those spaces, but it also means that, you know, on a busy summer weekend, that many more people aren't able to get out to the wharf, which is, you know, affects the bottom lines of our businesses, but it also affects, um, you know, public access to the coast. It's important. Um, it, the master plan will create opportunities for us as a community to determine, you know, what are the new businesses that go out there, what are sort of cultural and, and, um, and community assets uh, could be developed on the wharf. How do we make it better serve our needs in providing access to the bay? Um, it will also increase the sustainability and resilience of the wharf against changing climates. And, uh, you know, today we're also challenged with economic conditions. So, you know, adopting some of the changes in the master plan will help support those. Uh, it will also increase our eligibility for funding and investment in the wharf. Um, this is really key, as we know that there's, uh, the wharf has a lot of needs and the city is not in a position to fully fund those. So. And then lastly, it will make it that much easier for us as a city and our business partners to uh, get the permits they need, um, both for you know minor improvements and, as Bonnie mentioned, outdoor seating, which has been very popular, as well as uh, things like routine maintenance. Uh, we've been tied up for two years with various state and federal agencies just trying to get maintenance permits to drive some piles um, and, and deck work. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a lot easier once you have a, a, a certified EIR and a master plan go with it. All right, and next, um, the question is, so what will it not do? Uh, a lot of this stuff is what we've seen batting around social media, and I wanna be very clear that it's not the case. Um, the Wharf master plan will not immediately authorize or fund any development. Uh, the city does have limited uh, redevelopment funds that are currently earmarked for the, the gate relocation. Uh, that's the, the primary anticipated use of them. However, uh, all of that is subject to additional approvals by council. You know, it'll have to come back here for budgeting. We'll have to come back with uh, potentially bids and, and contracting. So th th it doesn't make anything happen tomorrow. Um, it also will not allow ocean liners and cruise ships. Um, a lot of people felt that was a little unclear in the original master plan. So we've gone back with staff's recommendation uh, to make it absolutely crystal clear that ocean liners and large uh, cruise ship type vessels are not welcome here, uh, nor are there shuttles uh, to serve them. Uh, we're really looking at you know, fishing boats, bay cruises like the O'Neill's or the, the Chardonnay, um, some, the occasional research vessel from, from Mimbari or, or uh, NOAA. But really, it, you know, we have no interest uh, in, in becoming the Monterey uh, Wharf and supporting cruise, cruise lines. Um, the uh, master plan will also not remove sea lion viewing holes. Um, Although what, what happens at the end of the wharf it is up for, for discussion in the master plan, it does propose a landmark building that appears to, to, to uh, get in the way of the, the sea lion viewing holes. Uh, staff's recommendation is again to, to, to commit to preserving or relocating those with any changes to the end of the wharf. Uh, so we know that the, wharf the end of the wharf has uh, significant structural needs and will have to be readdressed re in the next, uh, I know, in the coming years uh, over the life of this plan. Um, as it hasn't been you know, significantly improved in 60 years. Um, we don't know yet what that will look like and there'll be public process around it, uh, but we know that the sea lion viewing holes are very important to our community and we wanna make sure that we, we preserve them or we find the best way to keep them going forward. Um, it also will not mandate tall buildings. Uh, staff recommendation is to reduce the, the maximum height to 40 feet. Uh, the master plan originally called for 40 feet on the, the tall landmark and cultural buildings. Uh, we propose bringing that down to 40 so it's consistent with the existing zoning that's been in place for decades, um, as well as uh, reducing the height in all other buildings to 35 feet, uh, which is, was in the plan previously. Uh, so there is a, a potential for, for height increases over what's currently there, 
uh, but none of that is mandated. It'll be driven by you know the projects, uh, by the financing required for those projects, and for the community need. Uh, when something comes forward, there'll be a lot of discussions and design review that'll lead to what ultimately gets built. The master plan just sets an envelope and tells us how far we can go and what's the, you know what are the maximum criteria. Um, the EIR also found that it will not significantly impact bird or marine life. There's a few mitigation measures in pl uh, place through the EIR and the mitigation monitoring program that will help us address any of those potential impacts. But it's not, uh, uh, the research suggests that, that we're not going to be severely impacting any of the wildlife out there. Finally, it's, uh, or, or next, it's not going to close the door on community engagement on wharf projects. So just because the master plan is approved doesn't mean we're just going to go out there and build whatever we want. All of it's going to be uh, subject to going back out to the community, talking through uh, what happens next, what's needed, um, and, and building coalitions to hopefully make some of the vision a uh, reality. Um, and lastly, uh, it won't reduce fishing or sightseeing opportunities. So the consolidation of, of boat landings will help open up more of the side of the wharf for fishing and sightseeing, as will the expansions, the, the walkways. Um, and it just, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for additional recreation on the wharf that'll develop through this plan. All right, so what is the master plan? So the master plan is a cohesive vision for the wharf. It's the result of uh, the public engagement process that got us here, as well as uh, weighing that engagement with the, the needs and the findings of the engineering report. Uh, the master plan is a framework. It does not prescribe what has to happen. It just sets the rules and gives us those placeholders for developing solutions in the future. It's a 20 to 30 year plan, so we can't possibly envision what the community will need in 20 years. But what we're doing with this plan is we're setting out the rules and the opportunity sites for our community to decide what the wharf must be going into the future. Uh, it puts us on a pathway to sustainability, so balancing uh, economics, uh, na uh, nature and the environment, and social needs. And finally, it, uh, it's, it's a critical requirement for financing um, and permitting city and private partner par uh, projects. So without having the, the approved, or cer sorry, certified EIR and a master plan, it's that much harder for us to get any outside investment in the wharf. So uh, again, on that public process, um, for anyone that might think that this happened in a vacuum, it, it was a significant undertaking. Uh, beginning in August of 2013, there were a series of eight stakeholder meetings as well as ongoing focus group meetings. Uh, there were over 1,400 mailed notices as well as ongoing, uh, there was an ongoing stakeholder engagement. And then there were updates to City Council, Planning Commission, Parks and Recreation Commission, all within the first nine months or so of the project. Um, that led to the, uh, the draft of the plan. The draft of the plan was released in April 2014 uh, and was uh, released to a public milestone meeting, which again had mailed notices, a twice weekly ad in the Sentinel, um, a press release going out to over 75 organizations, uh, a briefing paper that was prepared and released to the Santa Cruz Neighbors Organization webpage and uh, a showcase at the 100th anniversary celebration of the wharf. All of these were opportunities for public feedback and comment and they helped uh, develop the plan as we know it today. Leading into the EIR and historical timeline, uh, a lot of this, these are all uh, meetings and uh, important dates as far as leading to the EIR. Uh, the ones with the little uh, arrows on the left are all opportunities for public engagement and public comment. Uh, so beginning in 2014, the uh, council accepted the master plan engineering report and directed staff to begin the environmental review through an initial study. Uh, that led to a, a first release of the mitigated neg deck for public comment. It was subsequently brought back and revised for 30 days. And then it was uh, brought to, once that was closed, it was brought to Planning Commission for consideration in November 2016. Uh, Planning Commission unanimously approved it. City Council then uh, heard it about less than a week later. Um, but based on a, uh, a public, what was it, a, a petition that was circulated online uh, from Don't Mark the Wharf, um, and other comments that were received, uh, the city, city staff revised the recommendation to council uh, and suggested that they develop an EIR rather than rely on the mitigated neg deck and initial study for the, the master plan. As a result, uh, council approved that, or, or sorry, directed staff to prepare the EIR, and that process was started the following year. Um, in June of 2017, a scoping session was held in which uh, the public could comment on issues that they were concerned. Uh, might provide uh, environmental impacts uh, as a result of the Wharf Master Plan. That led into the uh, administrative draft of the EIR, which prepared in October 17. 
Um, and then due to some changes on council as well as uh, staffing changes and other, other issues, unfortunately the, the IR was slowed down. Um, so it, it didn't, didn't immediately move forward, oops. Um, but we, we got rolling on as soon as we could and this past spring we released the notice of completion and availability of the draft EIR. Um, and uh, and uh, the public comment period was held uh, from March to May of 2020 uh, and was extended for an additional two weeks uh, due to the, uh, the COVID pandemic and the challenges of access. So traditionally we need a 45 day minimum public comment period. We extended it for two weeks, which is one day shy of the maximum recommended in the CEQA guidelines. So CEQA generally, or the state recommends no more than 60 days of review. Uh, the final notice availability for the IR was this September, um, and we subsequently followed up with three commission hearings. Um, first, an update to the Parks and Recreation Commission, then a hearing at uh, Historic Preservation Commission, and then Planning Commission, both of whom supported uh, adoption of the master plan. Uh, so going into the master plan itself, uh, it's important to note that uh, there's really two great goals with the master plan. First is creating a more sustainable wharf. Um, so as I mentioned, balancing the econ economics, the social needs, and the environmental stewardship. Um, it really fits this project well, that triple bottom line. Um, and it's just a plug for our Green Wharf project where we're, we're investigating uh, sustainable technologies and energy creation on the wharf. Uh, and the second goal is uh, creating a more resilient wharf, uh, one that'll be more up to the challenge of a changing climate as well as, uh, you know, I include the letter from, from Dino up there because we understand also the economics are a serious challenge. Uh, now, perhaps more than ever, um, but we, we need to keep in mind that the cherished local businesses and, and institutions we have out there really subsist on a knife edge um, and they've been pushed to some extent uh, to the ability that they can help sustain the wharf. So we really need to do something to help them as well. So, uh, within the wharf, uh, what's new? Uh, sorry, within the wharf master plan. And so the first element is a uh, is an uh, expanded gateway entrance. And so this would move the existing parking gates uh, in about halfway to the the line of buildings um, from Beach Street. Uh, this the thought here is that it would uh, help alleviate traffic backups on Beach Street as well as making a more efficient queuing and exiting um, of people parking on the wharf. Uh, the proposal includes uh, both self-serve uh, pay stations and as well as I believe there may be a, a pay kiosk or a service kiosk. Um, and the, the gateway entrance is proposed to include um, some artful uh, sort of monument signage uh, to help identify the wharf as a tourist destination and invite people out there. Uh, it also provides uh, security gates and things like that for the three hours a day the wharf closes as well as, you know, in inclement weather and, and other unforeseen conditions where security might be needed. Uh, one of the, the really exciting elements of the master plan is this east promenade. Uh, so along the eastern edge, the wharf would expand uh, by up to about 20, 26, 28 feet uh, in order to provide both an emergency vehicle access as well as a um, as well as uh, additional sort of fishing areas and um, a bike ped path. So it really a, a bicycle pedestrian path that would go along the east side of the wharf. Um, there you go. Alongside that would be a consolidated small boat landing. So currently the wharf has five landings, although several of them are in, in somewhat unusable shape. Uh, and um, none of them are really uh, accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, so the small boat landing proposed in the master plan would be universally accessible, allowing wheelchairs and, and other people with special needs to get down to the water and, and enjoy water recreation. Um, and it would support our, 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 our current boat rentals and kayak rentals, as well as you know conceivably paddle boarding and other recreational uses directly from the wharf and to the wharf. Uh, that east promenade would continue uh, from by the gateway entrance uh, down to the east parking lot and along the east side down uh, really to the end of the wharf. Um, the, it would expand a little bit on the end of the wharf uh, where additional ledgers are proposed. These are the, the sort of struts you see at the end of the wharf that the sea lions love to hang out on, um, but the really lateral support uh, that's intended to keep the pilings from shifting out in the deeper waters where the, the forces of the waves can be particularly strong. Uh, so the, the, the improved ledger system that's envisioned in the master plan uh, would reinforce that end of the wharf and, you know, 
who knows, maybe the sea lions would like it too. That, that's, um, that's been proposed, but you know, we couldn't say for sure. Um, the South Landing uh, is uh, also proposed out there. Um, this is one that, that you know, opponents of the master plan keep saying is for cruise ships, uh, which is of course not the case. Uh, it's designed for a, a vessel of about the size of a, a small Coast Guard vessel uh, with a maximum length of about 120 feet, uh, 200 tons of, of displacement. And while that's not really the size of vessel we see, we expect to see on the on the average. Um, part of the reason of that size is to ensure that it's got the robust engineering needed to withstand uh, being in the water pretty much year round um, in the, the sort of harsh open ocean. So it, it had to be designed in a way that was sufficient uh, to both support the, the potential for vessels like that, uh, but really uh, to ensure that the landing would have longevity. All right, next element is the, oh, okay, next element is the, uh, the stepped overlook. So the master plan proposes um, additional viewing area at the end of the wharf that would be almost like an amphitheater type seating that would step down a little bit from the end of the wharf, uh, allow you a little bit closer access to the waves and the, and the sea lions, uh, but really give you a more intimate experience of being a half mile out in the open ocean. Uh, next is the proposed landmark building. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is really a, a placeholder for, for what sort of structure may come in the future. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, the master plan proposes a building that was reminiscent of the original warehouse building and could serve cultural uses like a museum or um, maybe a, a, a public market or any sort of uh, just large open active space um, to help anchor the end of the wharf and help draw more tourists down to the end. Uh, while we think that the half mile length of the wharf is really an asset and, and a unique feature, uh, making the wharf really uh, alone in its class in the world, there's a handful of wharfs of this length, uh, sorry, wooden wharfs of this length in the ocean worldwide. Um, and not everyone chooses to walk that entire distance. Um, you know, depending upon your fitness and stuff, a little bit extra of uh, enticement down there really goes a long way to ensure that you know people are going out there, they're, they're experiencing all the wharf has to offer, visiting the businesses, and, and just you know really taking it all in. Uh, so the the end of the wharf would also be expanded on the western side uh, to continue the walkway really as a, a an almost a 360 degree circuit around the wharf. Uh, the Coastal Commission has has really pushed and supported the idea of uh, of walkable access all the way around the wharf uh, to improve public access to the water and, and to the bay. Um, this also, again, provides additional lateral stability, also gives a little bit room, more room to work with as far as what happens out at the end of the wharf. As I mentioned, we'll, we'll have to sort of re-envision it at some point in the, in the future. Um, you know, ultimately when, when the future of the dolphin comes into question, but also with the landmark building, the restrooms, uh, and all the lateral support that, that we're getting with the expansion, uh, there'll be a lot of opportunity to ensure that the, the sea lion holes continue and that other uses really fit what the community wants there. Uh, next is the events pavilion. So the current stage uh, structure that we have out there, uh, it, it gets, uh, in a normal year, it gets some decent use through the summer, but it doesn't, it suffers from a lack of seasonality. Uh, it really isn't available or, or highly utilized throughout the year. And events are key to bringing more people out there uh, during the off season when the businesses are really subsisting on, on earnings they made during the summer. Uh, so the, the idea is by enclosing that, uh, that stage area with a, a, an open, seasonable structure that could be opened and closed throughout whatever type of weather, uh, we'll have that, uh, that increased sort of commercially, I guess, I don't want to say just commercial, but event use of the wharf. Um, you know, it could be public public meetings uh, that, we, that we kind of hope to take off Zoom again someday, or, uh, you know, cultural offerings or weddings or any number of things could happen there, um, but it wouldn't matter really what time of year it is because we'd have that extra flexibility. Uh, and then the last bit is this western walkway. So this is a proposed uh, to go along the back side of the buildings at a, at a uh, Reduced elevation, so below deck level, uh, would allow people um, viewing access under the wharf somewhat, a little bit closer access to the water. But one of the cr real key reasons for this is a, uh, is a resilience feature. It creates a buffer zone um, for the pilings under the buildings, which are vulnerable. And so I'll go into that in a minute. 
And lastly is the Welcome Center. So down where the, the Marcella is today, um, at that extension, there's a proposal for a, sort of a gateway building that would be there to welcome people and orient them to the, the wharf. Um, it might host a, an open water swim lounge, um, might you know, be home to community groups that use the wharf and water. It would have proximate access to, to the water on the west side if the western walkway were built. Um, but it's really there to, to invite people in, sort of set expectations and, and orient people to all that the wharf has to offer. Okay, so again, looking at the wharf master plan in comparison to the wharf today, the orange areas are looking at uh, potential expansion um, under the master plan. So you've got the, the extended uh, east promenade is, is the most prominent feature. That would expand the acreage of the wharf by about two and a half acres or, or a little over two acres, that particular element, um, which is 30% you know, increase over the seven and a half acres today. So. Uh, it, it creates a lot more public space, uh, provides that emergency access along the wharf in the event of an incident, um, and uh, stabilizes the wharf against uh, you know, more turbulent seas. All right, uh, so along the lines of greater public access, those expansions, uh, the east promenade on the, on the east side would have these sort of fishing areas, almost like a, like a little lounge um, set off beside the bike path uh, that pedestrians and bicycles you could use to get out to the wharf and, and not have to share the road with cars and, and delivery trucks and everything else that's there. Um, it provides great, great viewing uh, of the beach area. And then on the opposite side, we have that western walkway, which is down at a reduced elevation, uh, providing you know, viewing of, of the underside of the wharf, which is really a remarkable feature. Um, it's, it's still a marvel of engineering when you look at it today, 106 years later. Um, but a lot of people don't get that, ex that experience or opportunity. Um, but you can see how this extra row of pilings uh, potentially can help defend the, uh, the building. Um, this is what that greater public access looks like when you step back a little bit. Uh, it's expanded with the east promenade on the, on the left or the east side. Um, uh, the small boat landing might stick out a little bit uh, as far as uh, providing the universal ramps and access down to the water. However, we've also seen designs proposed where it switchbacks underneath the uh, underneath these promenades so much, uh, somewhat. So it's really a, a d design solutions remain to be seen about how that will be developed. Uh, but the master plan sets those goals and says, hey, if we're going to consolidate these boat uses. Let's make sure everyone can use them, and it provides that. Uh, and then on the opposite side, you can see how the the western walkway might orient to the buildings. And then there's this photo simula simulation that kind of shows what that western walkway might look like down below. I would note that uh, the designer for contrast uh, colored the railings white, um, so you could kind of see that railing. But in reality, another design solution uh, to reduce the visibility of it might be to use more you know, earth tone or wood coloring. Uh, or uh, the master plan also took, talked about minimalist uh, railings, so that it goes back towards uh, what historically was there was no railings. Um, so there's a lot of design solutions that can be there to sort of uh, make things blend in more, um, but the master plan just kind of sets out the framework. Um, so speaking about resilience, again, there's this emergency access. The eastern promenade would expand on the east side. You can imagine that something like Woody's on the wharf, uh, were there an incident down at the end of the wharf, uh, how challenging it would be for an ambulance or a fire truck or, or police to get out there. Um, having this dedicated path that people can step to the side and get out there uh, could really uh, expedite and, and make public safety, you know, a, a higher priority or, or a, an easier thing to ensure. Uh, next is the uh, the boat landings. So the boat landings could serve as emergency evacuation routes. In the 1940s, there was uh, some fires that broke out on the wharf. Uh, it was put out by by boats that had pumps at the, at the time. Um, but if something like that happened today and we weren't able to, to address it quick enough, uh, you can imagine how people would have to get out. Um, and, and so having these boat landings that are universally accessible is a key element to ensuring um, human, human safety, really. Um, and then finally, the resilience improvements on the west walkway. So as I mentioned, it's really there as a protective measure. Uh, however, we're looking at multiple benefits, and the pathway, uh, the western walkway itself, is really proposed as a, as a multiple benefit to a defensive measure. So as you can see in the top left, when we talk about uh, marine debris and obstacles that threaten the pilings under the buildings, we're looking at redwood trees that wash down the San Lorenzo or any number of other tributaries. Um, the, the wharf crew has to remove these and, and chop them up every year. 
and you can see how one of those with one of the waves down the bottom left slamming into a set of pilings under the buildings could really uh, take out one of, you know, one of our cherished businesses fairly easily. And they do lose pilings from time to time. Um, that's why the buildings on the wharf typically have a lifespan of 40 to 60 years, uh, because sooner or later we have to replace the pilings underneath them. Um, but the idea in the master plan is that having this defensive row of pilings on the walkway, they're easier to replace, uh, and they're that first line of defense to ensure that when we do put on new buildings or we do repair what's under there, it has a longer you know, lifespan. Uh, it's also designed to have this lightweight permeable decking uh, that the water can flow through and reduce the, the wave force. And the engineering report for the master plan, when it evaluated the eastern walkway, also looked at the walkway as a, a disruptive measure. So by being there, it breaks up the wave's full force um, as it hits that first, kind of dissipates the wave uh, and, and defends those pilings. So it's there um, for a number of reasons. Uh, the walkway is really there as a multiple benefit to, to give us more flexibility in how it's funded and, and to expand public access. Um, the accessible landings, as I mentioned, um, this is one of the versions where the, uh, up in the top right, you can see one of the versions where the, the small boat landing might switch back under the deck, um, providing storage and educational space under, under it, but also having um, a, a lower profile against the edge of the wharf. Uh, and then at the top left, you can see how it could be kind of built out and kind of almost like a tower spinning back and forth down to the water. There's a number of design options for how that would work. Uh, similarly, down the, the south landing at the far end of the wharf, uh, you can see that that ramp there being more accessible to people with special needs compared to the wharf that's uh, the landing that's currently there today in the bottom right, um, which has no semblance of, of uh, ADA access and, and it's it's in a state of somewhat disrepair. So. And then uh, the three new buildings that are proposed in the wharf master plan. Um, we have the, the new uh, gateway building up in the top right, uh, the pavilion structure. Um, again, these are all just artist renderings of what could be um, and what were, were studied under the IR, but not necessarily what has to be. And then the landmark building down at the end with the, the stepped overlook and the, uh, the lower ledgers kind of proposed down there. Uh, the landmark building, as I mentioned, was really designed uh, and proposed by the designer of, uh, of the master plan uh, to be reminiscent of the old uh, warehouse building that used to be there. Um, you can see how it anchored that view at one point. Uh, the picture in the bottom right gives you an idea what it looked like inside, uh, really this, this large cavernous space that initially was used for shipping and, and, and passengers and stuff and later fishing uses. Um, but it's a blank slate for what you could do in the future. Um, and that's what we, we, we kind of, one of the reasons why it's, we feel like it's a, an essential piece of the plan is it gives us that flexibility to determine what, what the community needs. Uh, and then the view from Pleasure Pier showing the, the Municipal Wharf uh, Warehouse Building when it used to say Wharf on it. Um, the, the master plan envisions uh, those buildings to really be cultural uses. So they, whether they're museums or, or sort of maker spaces or, or whatever they might be, um, they're there to be publicly accessible and to provide, you know, year-round opportunities for engagement uh, out on the wharf. Um, and the, the pavilion, as I said, you can see sort of uh, the space that was created with the last master plan at the Commons, what it looks like when it's activated with events, um, but with the pavilion in place, uh, you know, potentially these walls could open up and have really a, a, a a similar experience to today, but having it protected from the elements and, uh, and really supportive for year-round events. The master plan also calls for limited new commercial. So a bit of, um, uh, sorry, uh, a bit more of uh, commercial infill. So we're looking at um, the, uh, some of the, the spaces along the, the front of the buildings where we've got uh, blank walls right now. We'd be proposing um, liner uses and things like that that are really smaller commercial ventures. Some of the open space by the, uh, or not open space, but some of the, the underutilized area under the walkway um, by the commons could, might be infilled with more like small kiosk retail locations. Um, some of sort of the, the, the uh, strange jogs and buildings potentially could be utilized uh, as redevelopment happens. 
Um, but the idea is really to, to stay within the existing footprint and, and densify it either in some cases with second floor uses, other cases with those liner uses, and a, a limited amount of about 4,000 square feet of, of additional commercial. Um, the entrance gateway signage, uh, this is the revised, proposed revised exhibit uh, for the gateway signage. Down the bottom right, or bottom left, you can see uh, you know, what the, the artist rendering of the design for the entrance gate might look like um, with the signage. But all around, you can see what the ver various ideas and inspirational images about what Santa Cruz can do. You know, we have full flexibility to design as a community what that new signage for the wharf will be. Um, and we wanted to throw those ideas out there. Uh, for public engagement in the future. Uh, the master plan includes a whole host of policies uh, and plans as far as implementing them. Um, it's hard to read these, but there's, there's probably too much to get into here, but just know that it's all in there. I encourage people to look at it and, and read it if you haven't already, um, but it's really there to, to accomplish the goals that we have talked about. Uh, it also highlights design guidelines. So it includes design guidelines to help ensure that the buildings are more reminiscent of their historical past, uh, but also that they're, they're built uh, compatibly and sustainably uh, going into the future. Uh, so there's a lot of information on the design guidelines there. Uh, some of the, the elements that they want to bring forward are, are really increasing building transparency. So opening up our, our businesses and our buildings so that you can see what's happening inside, and in some cases through the space. Uh, the thought is that that's very much more like what the wharf used to be, um, and you can see in these kind of historical images, um, and we want to bring that experience back to the wharf. Uh, it, it seems to have been lost in the, the 60s, or really the 70s and 80s. Uh, a lot of the buildings are more insular, um, so we want to try and bring that back. Um, as I mentioned, the liner uses. Uh, so as you can see up in the top right, the old Miramar, a lot of blank walls uh, hiding things like walk-in coolers and restrooms. The, the master plan calls for lining the front of the, 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 the wharf walkway, uh, the sidewalks really, with smaller liner uses, they call them, um, such as might be a fish market or a gift shop, uh, rather than having um, blank walls like this. We want to really engage people all the way down as they walk. Um, and this is one rendering of what a restaurant might look like on the Miramar site. And again, looking back at what the wharf used to be. Uh, it also talks about second floor uses, uh, primarily for the same businesses that are in there. Um, so you might have a restaurant expand up to a second floor rooftop, um, but uh, it just provides that flexibility going forward. Um, and it may be something like at, we see at Signaro's today where it's, it's fully enclosed and has this sort of, uh, um, you know, cruise ship feel to it. Or it might be something like at the Capitola Pier where you've got really open air dining that's, uh, you know, covered and seasonal. The master plan doesn't say how, just gives us those options. Uh, it also uh, talks about signage. The design guidelines pr provide uh, direction on signage, uh, limiting the, you know, the size of, of uh, individual signs out there, as well as proposing these sort of um, heraldic uh, blade signs for more engagement and visibility going down the wharf. Um, so knowing those things, uh, why do we have the master plan, or why, why did we go and develop one? Uh, as Bonnie mentioned, uh, the Beach South of Laurel uh, plan outlined the need for, for, for basically for an update uh, for objective standards on the wharf, and the Coastal Commission reiterated that need. Um, our current plan from 1980 is unworkable, and they don't really uh, support it, and it makes it that much difficult for us to, to seek anything, uh, any funding. Um, the master plan codifies and lays out that the wharf serves a number of roles, uh, be they historic and recreational, um, habitat values, as well as the, recreation, uh, the real estate value um, for both the city and the local economy. Um, and it sets that framework and guidance for future decisions about the wharf. Lastly, uh, it's needed for grant funding, uh, both for new and existing uh, infrastructure. Um, and so I know that uh, it's been alleged that there's uh, an abundance of, of grants out there that don't need a, an approved environmental report and, and uh, could be there for, for sustainability. And I, the, the two most common places we look are, are the California Grants Portal and the Grants.gov. Both of these are, are really easy to use and you can see what's out there. Um, it's incredibly rare to find grants available for uh, rehabilitation and, and maintenance, uh, almost certainly in most cases. Uh, the federal agencies and state agencies want to see new developments um, as far as what they're going to invest in. They want to expand jobs or they want to uh, expand public access or, or any number of po policy goals they have. 
they do not typically fund uh, deferred maintenance. And so one of the things with the master plan is it, it provides us the opportunity to, to deliver new things, but also to provide um, repairs and expansion to existing infrastructure in the process. And I just want to be clear that CEQA itself uh, clearly outlines, and that's the code at the bottom, that state agencies will not fund anything without CEQA compliant certification. So it, it's right in CEQA, right in that section. And so if, uh, if we can't get an EIR or some sort of certification uh, for environmental clearance on the wharf, we are not able to get funding from any state agencies. Um, the, the greater need, though, is, uh, is going back to these other items. So beyond that, uh, the regional population growth. I think John will probably talk about it, that uh, our neighborhood has grown, uh, and the demands uh, put on our community by people wanting to come here, uh, both from the greater region and, and within, within Santa Cruz County and the Monterey Bay region, uh, have grown as well. And the wharf uh, simply is not positioned to, to support that right now. Uh, the financials of the wharf are unsustainable. Uh, they have been for a number of years, uh, at least back to 2013, um, and, and it, it no longer really pencils. Uh, it, it's reliant on, on subsidies from the general fund. Uh, the city's budget crisis also comes into play, and the wharf businesses themselves. Um, they have, uh, as the city's updated its, its leasing structure uh, since about 2008, Many of their, their rents have gone up at the same time that, uh, that labor costs have increased substantially and continue to, uh, as well as utilities, product costs, food costs, insurance, everything keeps going up. Uh, and they've had to raise, uh, many of them have had to raise prices accordingly, um, even as, as visitation uh, has gone down to some extent, being pricing people out. So uh, it's a challenge uh, to balance all those needs. Um, but we need to be able to support more, you know, the wharf more fully. And then finally, the infrastructure backlog, originally estimated at about 11.6 million in the engineering report, but today is uh, likely escalated to 14 million or more uh, based on inflation. So, and then finally, outside funding is needed to address all of these needs. Um, so just a little clarity on the wharf revenues and expenses. Uh, the chart here shows you um, the total revenue versus total expenses since 2015. Um, and the, the red line at the bottom gives you the balance, showing really where we've been. Uh, so we've been largely underwater every year since at least 2015. Uh, I looked back at some old, uh, I didn't have time to put it into the chart, but I, I looked back at some old uh, statements we made to the state to 2013, and we, all of those were negative years as well. Uh, the two years that we almost balanced uh, were a result of insurance proceeds uh, from the tsunami. Uh, I believe that's where that went from. So, uh, you know, we're not on a, on a good chart to keep funding all the maintenance and the needs the wharf has. Uh, similarly, the wharf has not seen uh, substantial reinvestment in a long time. Uh, long, going back 18 years, we can see all of the capital repairs that were made at the wharf. Um, the two largest items there were the master plan, which was intended to open the door to more funding, um, and the wharf beach intersection, which, you know, improved access at the wharf intersection uh, but did not do much to the structure itself. Uh, mostly there, these are minor repairs and little retrofits uh, over 18 years. So in, in contrast to the, the 14 million or so that we know we have needs of now. So uh, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pump this over to John in just a minute. Um, but the, uh, just the infrastructure backlog is, is detailed somewhat in the uh, engineering report uh, from 2014. It's the result of age, wear, and deferred maintenance. Um, and the costs of rehab are, are outlined in the report itself. Um, it really, uh, the report also evaluates a lot of the improvements in the master plan and, and suggests you know, improving lateral stability and other elements to ensure it can last long into the future. So, John, you wanna take it from here? Thank you, yes I do. Uh, and thanks so much for such a comprehensive overview of the Wharf Master Plan. Um, really a, a, a brilliant presentation, Dave. Um, Mayor Cummings, Council, um, I'd like to give the Council a brief overview of sheer integrity to start, if I may, because it speaks so much to the urgent need to take decisive action towards securing the funding needed to preserve it and the Wharf by extension. Sheer integrity is the synergy of all the fasteners connecting, decking to the joists, the joists to the cap beams, 
and the caps to the piles working together so that the whole of these bo bonds that compromise the wharf structure can absorb and more evenly resist the kinetic force produced by large volumes of moving water that we understand as current and the power of falling water that we know as breakers. The forces working to destroy the sheer integrity of the wharf structure are oxidation or rust, which as Neil Young so aptly observed, never sleeps. Uneven deflection of framing members expressed as vertical movement and vibration, the rattle that you feel when you drive down the wharf. Kinetic energy, the current waves I spoke of, expressed as lateral stress on the structure and a wood fungus commonly known as dry rot. Framing connections weakened by corrosion and a wood fungus lose their grip and allow the warp to sway more freely in wave events. And the more freely the warp can move, the more the, those connections are weakened or broken by this stress. Evidence of how these forces combine to compound damage can be seen in the exploded joist ends at the south end of the warp picture. Uh, as fasteners oxidize, they expand while si simultaneously losing their power to bond decking and framing members together. Additionally, the expanding fasteners open fissures in the framing, me framing members, allowing water and fungus spores to penetrate into the untreated wood interior of the wood framing members, further weakening the bonds as the fungus breaks down the structural integrity of the wood fibers in the joists and decking. The bad news is, is that these forces have gone unchecked for a very long time in long stretches of the warp, as the budget and staff we've had to work with has caused us to prioritize most of our attention on the roadway. The good news is, is that they can all be countered effectively by the use of construction strategies and materials called out in the warp master plan. If all the piles supporting the warp were in perfect condition, which they're not, the erosion of the shear panel formed by the decking joists caps would still be alarming because it could allow large sections of the warp to begin moving independently in a wave event, severing utility condu conduits, exponentially increasing repair costs by damaging structure that's in good repair and causing business disruption and a general erosion of public and investor confidence in the safety and viability of the war. The public area expansions of the 1980s went a long way towards slowing the decline of sheer integrity in those areas of the wharf that were widened then by significantly dampening lateral movement. If we employed that same strategy today using the improved construction materials and superior construction and surfacing techniques that are called out in the wharf master plan, these improvements would substantially extend the value of the investment and the longevity of the wharf. Given the accelerating decline in the wharf's shear integrity and the fact that the wharf's structural building and facilities maintenance program have all been funded primarily through an operating budget that has largely been flat over the last 20 years, and that those scarce dollars have been significantly devalued further by prevailing wage law, I be believe the survival of the wharf to be imminently dependent upon the city's ability to compete robustly for the widest variety of grant funding available and that adopting the wharf master plan and the environmental impact report and allowing staff to move quickly on preparing a public works plan for approval by the California Coastal Commission is the most expedient means of achieving that goal. The wharf has changed many times over my lifetime, and the fact that the wharf still survives when so many others have perished is the legacy of those changes. The Federal Economic Development Grant that funded the wharf master plan funded a plan rather than repairs precisely because we lacked the resiliency planning and permits needed for that agency to fund the work that was needed then. I would most sincerely and respectfully ask that the council adopt this well-conceived plan that we've all worked so long and so hard on so that our ever expanding future generations can enjoy the wharf as comfortably as we have and call that wharf that they grow up with their own. It looks like you're muted. Yeah, there we go. 
Um, so I would just add again to, to John's comment, um, just for a little bit of perspective on uh, the allegation that 91% of the piles, or, or really the finding that 91% of the piles are in good condition. Uh, so of course, yes, that was found in 2014 in the engineering report. It's now been six years since then. But what's important to note is that uh, the location is not evenly spread. There are hot spots in the wharf where piling work is needed more urgently than others. Uh, none more more apparent than the Miramar site, uh, where you can see the, the A-frames and, and issues there with missing piles, uh, but in various places. So it's not an insignificant amount of repairs that are needed just to address the pilings. Uh, but up above here, you can see also a significant uh, deck stringer and uh, cap rot and issues that also need to be addressed. So these are all of those, those sheer elements that John has referenced. Um, the needs are widespread. Um, it's not that the, I think John, one of his favorite things to say is that uh, the, the engineering report can fi found that the patient can tolerate surgery, uh, but it did not find that it was okay on his own. You know, it, sorry, I didn't do you justice, John, but that's, uh, that's in large part uh, what the report found is that, it's, just, it's, it's repairable, um, but it still has significant needs. Uh, and those are quantified in that infrastructure backlog amount. Uh, so uh, moving on to the EIR, um, just a little bit of detail so we can get to you guys and your comments. Um, the EIR during the scoping session uh, built upon what was studied in the initial study, uh, and uh, the scoping session led to targeted study of the, these topics. So the first being aesthetics, uh, and then biological resource impacts, cultural resources, uh, geology, hydrology, and water quality, uh, transportation, traffic, and parking, and water energy demands. So these are the topics that were specifically focused uh, in the EIR and what was studied. Uh, in response, uh, we received comments uh, during the public comment period on a number of uh, a number of questions about what was found, um, namely about aesthetic impacts of the landmark building and west side walkway, um, impacts to birds, uh, concerns that they may not be able to access their nests or that they would be disturbed, impacts to sea life, uh, potentially from uh, chemical leakage from pilings or, or the noise um, uh, from construction, things like that, uh, impacts to historical resources, uh, more on the west side walkway, um, traffic and parking concerns, uh, of course, the, the no cruise ships that was loud and clear and saving the sea lion holes. So those are the, the most common uh, comments that were in the, 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 we received during the public comment period and, and our responses to all of those are included in the final EIR. Um, um, again, those, those impacts to birds, uh, many of the bird species are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, as a result, the master plan talks about uh, or outlines mitigation measures um, and bird exclusion zones during the nesting season such that uh, construction activity isn't allowed to occur within 100 or 150 feet depending upon species uh, of established nests. Um, these relate to things like the pigeon gallimet and uh, some of the gull species and, and other ones that are out there. Um, as well as uh, nesting disruptions, uh, you know, that's to minimize those nesting disruptions. Um, and then re more recent comments we've received have been regarding the Western Walkway, alleging that it would block access to these nests and making it difficult for the birds to, to thrive. Um, our, our findings are published in the, the expanded staff report as well as in the final EIR. Uh, and largely reflect the fact that, uh, according to the bird survey that was done with the master plan, uh, it doesn't appear that there's a, a, a significant trend uh, as to where they prefer to nest uh, throughout the, the wharf. Uh, the EIR acknowledges that there may be impacts uh, to the nesting as, as far as uh, by having people walking along the west side, but that with the expansion of the wharf by two and a half acres, uh, predominantly on the east side, uh, and their apparent, you know, uh, parent flexibility in nesting locations, uh, there should be um, plenty more opportunities that would offset uh, any impacts. There'll be more places for them to potentially nest. Um, so that's all outlined in the EIR uh, biological resource section as well as in com responses to comments and I believe in the staff report somewhat. Um, just an example of what those uh, bird exclusion zones might be. We've been back and forth with various regulatory agencies. Uh, initially at one point looking at 300 foot buffers. Um, which you can see there, uh, a presence of six nests 
uh, if, if not ideally located, could easily shut down all repair work on the wharf uh, under those circumstances. And so working with biologists who've gone out and done um, uh, acoustic assessments and evaluate, like uh, it was Gary Kittleson, I believe, uh, did uh, went out there and assessed uh, ambient impacts as well as behaviors of the, the species. Um, and then in consultation with, with various state and federal agencies, we've been working on uh, determining sort of the optimum nest buffers that would be, come to play. Um, as you can see, uh, just on the left side, all those pilings, those 4,500 4, pilings, uh, create a veritable forest uh, underneath that wharf. Um, and it's, it's just sort of interesting to see how it all goes. But, um, again, well, also with the mammals, uh, the, uh, in addition to the bird exclusion zones as a mitigation measure, uh, the EIR also outlines uh, mitigation for noise impacts from construction. So when we uh, drive piles to, to expand the wharf or to do the repairs, um, they create sound waves that could uh, potentially be harmful uh, to species, uh, marine mammals and fish and things like that. Um, and so working with the various uh, agencies, they propose some potential mitigation measures. Uh, most commonly would be the, the use of a cushion block, uh, which will soften the impact sound and the vibrations created uh, when the pile driver is going, uh, as well as creating, um, again, more exclusion zones around construction sites where the, uh, where the mammals might be present, uh, having uh, a pre-construction survey done and or uh, on-site monitoring to make sure they're not present while work is happening. Um, and they've suggested measures that have worked other places, such as bubble curtains that help mitigate sound um, we, uh, and might, might be also used. But uh, they provide all of those things in the mitigation, monitoring, and reporting plan um, as ways of mitigating potential impacts from construction. And then once the construction is complete, uh, these, these potential harmful impacts uh, largely abate with the exception of ongoing maintenance. Um, so here we go, mitigation monitoring plan. Um, again, it, it outlines the, the, the two impacts that were found in the EIR uh, were potentially to uh, birds and marine life, as well as the water quality of marine debris uh, resulting from construction. So mitigation measures are there uh, to provide for noise dampening and pre-construction surveys, as well as uh, the bird buffers and the underwater exclusion zones to address the biological impacts. Uh, as for water quality, uh, this is really an uncertain um, potential impact, but it's just anticipating that with any construction, uh, some debris may fall into the water, um, potentially a, a, a fuel leak or something like that could happen. And so the, uh, the various agencies have directed us to prepare to have uh, floating booms available, magnets and divers uh, available for, for larger debris or metal debris. And then uh, should you find a, a, some sort of chemical leak, uh, an immediate work stoppage and uh, consultation with the Department of Toxic Substances Control. So um, overall, the EIR did not find uh, significant impacts to most of the things studied, uh, but for these two items uh, where we did find significant impacts or potentially significant impacts, mitigation measures were developed um, to address them. Uh, subsequent uh, to the publication of the final EIR and you know, immediately before our meeting last week, uh, or not last week, two weeks ago, uh, we received a, a letter from a Brant Holly Law Firm on behalf of Don't Morph the Wharf. Um, and uh, the letter alleged that the EIR was inadequate, um, raising concerns over our analysis of aesthetics, uh, recreation, and historical resource impacts. Uh, the letter also demanded the removal of the landmark building, the West Walkway, and a reduction of all building heights to 30 feet. Uh, while supporting the, the requirement for historic alteration permits uh, and review under Sec Secretary of Interior standards. Um, staff uh, found that it would be best to rather wait and, and review these in more detail uh, in, in anticipation that there, there may or may not be anything to them, um, but we wanted to really be sure uh, because of it, it appeared that there may be a, a threat of a lawsuit, um, and we all discussed this, I believe, with City Council at closed session today. So. Um, our, our responses to these concerns are in the staff report, um, but I'll summarize them here. Uh, so overall, um, the aesthetics, the city feels that we've followed the accepted standards, uh, both within the general plan and CEQA guidelines. We found that uh, the proposals in the master plan conform with existing zoning and regulation uh, per the thresholds of significance established in the uh, CEQA guidelines update uh, from 2018. 
Uh, we also provided photo simulations uh, to evaluate the, the real visible uh, potential changes to the wharf. And we, uh, view, we mapped those um, or, or based those photo simulations uh, on views that were identified in the general plan um, under significant views, uh, figure 4.3-1. Um, the study also evaluated uh, light and glare, um, the development around the surrounding area, and the visibility and access to landmarks. Um, so all of those things were evaluated under aesthetics, and we feel that our, our analysis was uh, as complete as, as reasonably could be given our, our established guidelines and thresholds, and um, that the letter did not suggest anything that was missing or, or a higher level of, of evaluation that would have been necessary. Um, and then uh, recreation, uh, the city, uh, they have suggested that the sea lion viewing holes would be removed for the Western Walkway, and uh, that was what was suggested in the letter. Uh, first and foremost, the Western Walkway or the West Side Walkway would have nothing to do with the sea lion viewing holes. Uh, it's a completely different part of the wharf master plan. Um, but also the city has committed in its recommendation, or, or rather staff has committed in our recommendation to preserving and relocating the sea lion viewing holes. Um, they've been moved before, uh, and they can easily be reworked uh, around whatever development might be proposed at some point in the future uh, for the end of the, of the wharf. Uh, there will be an expanded end of the wharf, as well as you know changes in how the buildings and everything are laid out. Uh, so it's, it's not inconceivable, and the city's committed to preserving and or relocating those to optimize uh, the viewing pleasure of the wharf holes. Um, overall, there will be a net increase in fish, fishing, wildlife viewing, and sightseeing opportunities. So there will not be uh, any degradation of those recreational benefits of the wharf, uh, let alone any impacts to the sea lion viewing holes. And then lastly, uh, the, the letter suggested that the, the city should adopt the HPC recommendation um, for historic alteration permits uh, and commit to review under Secretary of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation um, and Rehabilitation of Historic Resources. Um, Staff has reviewed that, um, and out of an abundance of caution, uh, we do uh, we support that, and we have changed our recommendation to do so. However, uh, we would note that it's not a mitigation measure. The EIR did not find any any significant impacts to historic uh, resources on the wharf, namely uh, the historic value of the wharf being derived from its location, its length, its uh, alignment and orientation, and its function as a wharf. Nothing in the wharf master plan is proposed to change any of that, uh, and thus the EIR did not find impacts to historic resources. Um, but nonetheless, the city's historic preservation in, uh, ordinance could be interpreted uh, to apply to all aspects of the wharf uh, rather than just the wharf structure. So while the wharf structure itself is listed on the historic building survey, and it no doubt would be subject to a historic alteration permit under existing ordinance, uh, buildings and other elements on deck and around the wharf uh, have historically been seen as um, non-contributing non-historic structures uh, or accessory buildings and not subject to historic alteration permits. Uh, the HPC suggested uh, an alternative that the wharf essentially is a historic site as a whole in which interpretation anything on or around the wharf that would be built uh, could potentially be subject to a historic alteration permit, uh, whether it goes through HPC or it's administrative. And so out of an abundance of caution, staff is going to concur with the HPC uh, recommendation and suggest that we treat uh, the wharf as a historic site uh, and subject to historic alteration permits until such time that we have uh, better definitions of what a historic site is in the Muni Code, as well as what constitutes a minor project um, and may not be as subject to HPC review. So, okay, and uh, moving on to the HBC Commission, just to, to clear that up so you, you know, uh, the recommendations that they had put forward at their uh, October 14th hearing uh, were to uh, recommend certification of the EIR and uh, adoption or uh, certification of the findings of fact, and then to uh, accept the, the wharf or approve the wharf master plan with the following changes. So they wanted to acknowledge that uh, the wharf is a historic structure and uh, that review of buildings and additions to their site is required by city ordinance. Um, and then secondly, that um, historic alteration permits be reviewed by the HPC and that um, any new buildings uh, over 3,000 square feet as well as the new public buildings would require a review by a historic architect um, to be consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards. 
So this is discussed in the staff report, um, uh, both items really. Uh, the first item is, is more of an interpretation. Um, it is undoubtedly, the wharf itself is undoubtedly in the historic building survey. However, the buildings uh, we maintain are not historic. Um, they don't meet any of the thresholds of historic findings uh, and that they are non-historic, non-contributing structures. But because we want to treat the wharf like a historic site, they would still be subject to, um, to a historic alteration permit review until that's clarified in the Muni Code. And then on the second, um, the uh, staff mentions the basically that the, the same, that there would be historic alteration permits under the existing uh, ordinance. However, some might be administrative, some might be uh, through the HPC itself, depending upon size, and that clarification of what constitutes a minor project. And that currently, um, staff, the staff historic preservation planner is able to determine whether a historic architectural review is required based upon the, the size and certain metrics of any given project. Uh, and so the planning felt that it was not necessarily uh, added value to require it in every instance um, and that that discretion should be left to planning's professional staff. So uh, while we generally support the HPC recommendation, um, there's a little bit of nuance there. And then the Planning Commission, which uh, heard the Wharf Master Plan the next day and, and voted six to one to approve or, or to recommend approval, also uh, voted to support uh, certifying the AR and the findings of fact, uh, and they suggested a couple of minor modifications to the plan uh, that we've incorporated, uh, and that is to revise uh, the language to ensure that cruise ships are not allowed anywhere in the master plan, and that to uh, revise the exhibit showing the, the wharf signage so that it would be, there'd be, the dimensions would be more flexible and, and not uh, specified, and to encourage it to be an inspirational exhibit, not the final uh, determination of what the signage should look like. So we've, we've done that. Um, so summarizing staff's proposed modifications, um, the, uh, the first we wanted to, to engage the HPC early on in any of the new public buildings to try and get the standardized or objective goals for what the, those new buildings should achieve and sort of the historic aesthetic that we want to go after. Uh, and then to require historic alteration permits uh, as established in the Muni Code under the understanding that it, the wharf is a uh, historic site for the time being. Um, and then aligning the language, uh, the second change was to align the language banning ocean liners uh, at an early part in the plan. The third was uh, proposing a uh, wharf interpretive resources plan. So the Historic Commission really wanted to encourage more historical interpretive materials and looking back at the record, uh, a lot of the environmental groups that chimed in on the, as, as stakeholders in the planning process, it's really important to them to also expand uh, the educational offerings, you know, as far as nature and wildlife. Uh, and so we're proposing to sort of a consolidated plan to help balance and, and weigh and organize uh, all of this interpretive material uh, and to include, you know, art and, and different strategies for achieving this enrichment of the wharf. Uh, the fourth item is, again, uh, clarifying cruise ship changes um, so that they're not allowed. Uh, and then the, the next two were about revising the entrance gate signage and the exhibit. Uh, lastly, uh, changing the maximum height on all public buildings down to 40 feet consistent with the zoning. And then that commitment to preserve the sea lion holes uh, with any development at the end of the wharf. All right. Uh, so there's those changes, and then following up on our um, closed session today, there was a concern that we may be subject to, a, a, you know, the threat of a lawsuit. Um, and in consultation with our CEQA attorney, uh, we thought it might be worth uh, including a modification to the, the resolution um, and the findings of fact, such that we would have a severable, severable clause. So under CEQA, currently the courts are allowed to um, allowed to, to decertify portions of an EIR if they find that something fails uh, to meet the, the standards of review and the discretion of the public agency. Uh, while we don't think that's the case here, um, what these, this language, if added, would do is essentially uh, convey our intent under the, the EIR that should uh, anything be challenged, uh, we would like that to be separated while the rest of the work master plan can move forward. Uh, the intent here is to allow us to continue moving forward on those structural improvements uh, and, and the, the ones that we have general agreement on um, while 
while any challenges are settled uh, out, outside of the public process or, or in the courts. Um, so again, this is, this is not something typically done or really we're not sure if it has been effective uh, or ever done in the past, um, but our secret attorney thought it was is worth doing as, as there is some increasing case law on on uh, the courts decertifying portions of EIRs and, and this would convey the council's intent to do that. And last is uh, any of the documents, if anyone's interested for uh, the master plan and the environmental can be found here uh, and we'll adjourn the question. Well, Sorry for the long presentation. <laughs> Yeah, it was long, but it was really extensive and very comprehensive on um, on this work master plan. And I just want to thank you all because this is a massive undertaking. Uh, it's taken years to get to this point. And so I just want to thank everyone for all the time and hours of community outreach and work that's been done to really get us to where we are today. Um, I think this is, you know, this really, the presentation really highlights how critical it is that we move forward a master plan so we can receive um, state funding and really truly invest in supporting and preserving the work for future generations. So thank you all for all of your hard work on this. It's really impressive. Um, we'll go ahead and open it up to council members for questions and comments. And I'll start with council member Byers. Thank you. Um, I have three questions rather all over the place. Uh, the comment about, a, let's see, limited commercial expansion. Uh, maybe you could address that. It seemed to me uh, there was a real increase in commercial expansion. Uh, so in large part, it's, it's using the same footprint. Um, so the, the intent is that uh, the majority of commercial expansion, I think it was up to about 18,000 square feet, uh, would be through the use of second stories. Um, so something like you know, Firefish might consider putting a, a, a second floor outdoor patio or, or even a, a second floor restaurant. Um, the only uh, the other commercial expansion, the limited amount, is really a, a maximum of about 4,000 square feet um, of, uh, of dispersed commercial in some, some sort of opportunity sites. And so that may be, you know, a few hundred feet here, um, but it's, it's not building out any substantial unbuilt areas of the wharf. Um, just to put that into perspective, uh, Gildas is about 5,100 square feet. Um, so the 4,000 square foot expansion would be less than the size of yeah. Gildas. Um, right across the wharf. What, got it, okay. Well, how, how tall is the high, uh, tallest building on the wharf now? I know there's several um, stories. I believe the, the EIR sites it at around 27 feet. So there's some some dispute that plans aren't always developed, uh, you know, are constructed exactly as they're they're written. Okay. But it's but somewhere between 27 and 30. Yeah. Oh, wow. And we're the proposals go to 40. Would that be three stories? It doesn't have to be. Uh, typically, you know, but commercial. It could be. It, it could be a maximum of, of 40 feet, which could be three stories. Okay. Uh, the other one. Uh, and I'd clarify that's only for those three landmark buildings. Everything else would be capped at 35. Remind me of the landmark buildings. So that 35. would be a maximum of 40 feet on the pavilion, the end okay. building, the landmark, and the gateway entrance building. Okay. Oh, or the gateway okay. Good. building. Good. You know, the West Walk, uh, I know the weather is much different on the west side to the east side. And the proposal, I, I didn't quite get it, was to have a walkway, to have structures there or people there. I think it's called a walkway. Yep, uh, hold on a second, I just had it. Oh, sorry. So uh, this one here? I believe so, yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, so the proposal there is, is really to create a defensive barrier. Uh, as you can okay. see down below in the, this picture with right. the waves, it's taking trees and things like that and slamming them into the pilings under the buildings. The only way to really significantly repair pilings under the buildings is to remove the building. 
Um, John's been able to make a lot of headway doing A-frames and things like that that redistribute the weight for a period of time. But ultimately, when we lose those pilings, the building's lifespan shortens. And so the, the designer's intent is to put this row of pilings uh, down along the outside of the wharf uh, as a, a set of guard piles to protect you know, our, our sensitive buildings. And then the proposal for the walkway is really a, a multiple benefit approach. So it's saying, hey, since we put the pilings there, let's give it a little bit more use okay. so that we can get more out of it. I, I, okay. I'd like to add that early on, we collaborated with the Coastal Commission uh, quite a bit on this plan, and this was a feature that they really wanted because they wanted public access all the way around the ward. Right. Yeah, you almost could walk around. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, those are my questions. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown. This is pretty perfunctory. Um, uh, Dave, the last end of your presentation, you talked about new proposed language, uh, severability, severability finding, adding findings of fact regarding the certification of what you In the motion, would that be a fifth item or would that be included now in the recommended um, number three, adopt the plan subject to modification proposed by staff? I mean, tell me where that would go. Does it have to be an additional item in the... I think it might be, uh, I might have to punt that to Bonnie Bush uh, to recommend, but it might be an amendment. Don't, don't even know it right now, but it sounds, look, just, just when the time comes, uh, be clear about how that gets incorporated into the motion. Yeah, I think it would be a, a amending the motion for the, the two resolutions. So it would be the, the I think oh, first. Okay, number two. Number yeah, two. one and two, I think it would be. Okay. All right, Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, all the work you're doing. Thank you, John, for trying to keep that uh, <laughs> the work from falling into the ocean. And I know it's it's been uh, a lot of uh, work trying to apply those band-aids. And so I'm looking forward to being able to move forward with this. Um, I do have a question about uh, the landmark building in particular. Uh, this seems to be the source of a lot of the uh, critique at least what I've heard uh, or the, the opposition that I've heard is to that. And so I just want to ask you to help me understand how potentially, you know, going from 27 to 40 feet with that landmark building is not going to create an aesthetic impact. It seems to me that there, there would be. I mean, that's a pretty significant increase. Um, I think I'm going to pass that to Stephanie Strilo. Um, I believe she's on the line here, who is our environmental consultant with DUDEC. Uh, thank you, Dave. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, yes, we did. Um, I think the staff report does address this um, towards the end of the staff report, but basically, as Dave mentioned earlier, we looked at the, both the CEQA guideline standards and the city standards and addressed um, the aesthetic impacts based on both whether or not there's any existing regulations that would um, uh, need to be considered regar regarding scenic quality as well as looking at whether or not um, the project would lead to a substantial degradation of the visual quality of the surrounding area. And substantial is the word that's used um, both in the, the guidelines and throughout CEQA. And in looking at substantial, we looked at a number of different um, uh, visual considerations, both um, impacts of the new facilities on scenic views, on scenic resources, and then looking at the new facilities themselves in the context of height, mass, and scale of both the wharf and the general surrounding area that you can see from a number of vantage points on West and East Cliff Drive. So in that context, um, yes, the buildings, the three new buildings would be higher than the existing buildings, although they would be in line with the um, zoning requirements of what is allowed. At this point, this is just a program EIR and um, there's no specific building plans. 
So the depictions on the photo simulations in the EIR are just based on very conceptual renderings and uh, models that are in the uh, master plan. But in looking at that with the city staff, it was felt that um, there's not any substantial blockage of views. While the height is higher than the existing buildings, um, there are other buildings in the surrounding area, other facilities that are taller, um, you know, Dream Inn, uh, Coconut Grove, some of the rides at the um, boardwalk. So in that regard, there are some existing facilities in the built environment that um, are similar scale and um, height as what uh, any of these three new buildings might be in the future. So with that in mind, the, the conclusion was that um, it was not a substantial change or degradation in the surrounding visual quality. I suggest since we have um, those uh, renderings that it might be useful to put those on the screen for the council and the public to, um, you know, to, to say a picture, paint a thousand words. I think Stephanie explained that very well. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be helpful. I mean, I've looked at them and I, I just, I still am not, you know, <laughs> it's just still hard to imagine um, that not having an impact, but I'd love to see it and it would be good for the public. David, you're muted. Right. So uh, just to kind of recap the aesthetics uh, issue. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, we studied a number of, of potential thresholds of significance that CEQA lays out for us uh, regarding aesthetics. The first is whether there's a substantial ad uh, adverse effect on a scenic vista. And when you look across the 120 degree arc of a human vision on a panoramic vista, the, the buildings themselves don't overwhelm that view and there's significant ocean views and coastal views still uh, impact uh, without any impact. Um, and then it uh, doesn't block sort of natural aspects. And then it's this, this section C is one of the key ones that has evolved with the change in, in CEQA guidelines that, that was intended to help avert um, sort of, uh, what's the right term, um, frivolous lawsuits on, on the grounds of aesthetics in urbanized areas. Uh, and so what it finds is that if you're, if, if your aesthetic analysis or your proposal aligns with existing zoning and regulations, uh, you've satisfied that threshold, and, and that's certainly what we've, we've done here. Um, the existing zoning allows up to 40 feet, uh, and we've brought the heights down on all the other buildings below that, uh, but for these, these couple of landmark buildings uh, to ensure that they're maintained some variation in, in building heights, uh, there's that additional flexibility up to the existing zoning. Um, so by satisfying that section C there, that, that third threshold, that's one of the, the findings that we needed to, to ensure was covered to not have a significant impact. And then as far as uh, substantial light and glare, all of that's evaluated within uh, you know, existing building codes and, and the, the responses in the EIR. So uh, on to the, the fun part here. Uh, it's the, uh, this is the, the figure I mentioned earlier that's in the general plan uh, EIR regarding what are seen as uh, important scenic views and visual landmarks. Um, and then uh, the places that uh, DUDEC went and evaluated and did photo simulations from. So these roughly align with all of the locations that were identified as important scenic views here. Um, and then uh, the artist renderings of what those changes might look like. Um, and again, these are, these are up to the maximum, originally studied at 45. The, uh, at 40, the buildings would be slightly smaller. Um, and that's, again, the maximum height. Uh, there's no reason we have to build that high. It'll be guided by public process and, and uh, project development going forward. Um, so this is looking from uh, Main Beach. Uh, you can see what the entrance gate might look like, the, the gateway building might look like, and that small boat landing. Uh, this is from Cowles Beach, uh, where you can see what that uh, landmark building and gateway building might look like, as well as a, an expanded lifeguard station that might uh, potentially go up an extra floor. Uh, and then on the right, you've got one from East Cliff Drive, uh, looking down over Seabright. Uh, it shows you that small boat landing, one version of it, 
um, as well as the gates and things like that. And, and pretty clear, uh, still a good line of sight on East Cliff, or West Cliff. And then this is the view from West Cliff Drive, um, looking at those, uh, those new buildings and the, the West Side walkway. Um, and then the, the model that was prepared um, for the 100th anniversary uh, and was put out there for the, the showcase exhibit where people could see the, the, in sort of real scale what these things might look like as proposed. Okay, I'll uh, bring it back. Uh, I had one question, um, and then you kind of touched on it, but I know when you were going through the presentation, um, and, and then when you just showed the picture, and now you mentioned the potential for um, upgrades to the lifeguard station, and I know that that's a building that really needs some um, serious upgrades, and so I was just wondering if you could speak to that and how that fits within the WARF EIR, so like the potential for upgrades to the lifeguard station. Yeah. And <laughs> To be honest, that's one of the elements that I haven't focused a whole lot on. Um, I know that in the, the engineering assessment, it shows some significant needs underneath it. Uh, I think John has probably a better idea of how that fits in. And, and Stephanie, I don't know if you recall how that fit into EIR. Um, yeah, I can um, respond to that quickly. We did mention it's in the project description and part of the um, sort of total square footage that could be included in the future expansion and redevelopment of the existing work buildings. John, did you want to add anything? I, I would just say that the, that the building as it, it stands is, is utterly inadequate for the purpose that it serves. Um, the, the fact that it, it kind of juts out there in the impact zone um, makes it pretty vulnerable as well. And so uh, expanding that, that base and, and uh, getting the building uh, to a size where it can adequately serve its, its purpose is, is why it was added. Great, thanks. Uh, Council Member Brown. Sorry, I just thought of another one as I'm looking back at my notes from the, when I looked at the original, the draft EIR. Um, and I don't think that this has changed based on my recollection of the, my read the other week. Um, so it just, maybe I just missed something here, but in the uh, description of the overall increase in square footage of space available, um, when Council Member Byers asked this question, it was a low number um, that you gave about what the overall expansion of square footage would be um, for new and or renovated buildings. And it was low, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but I'm looking here at the square footage that could be uh, uh, included for the large buildings, and it's it's quite a bit. I mean, it's over twenty thousand, if I'm not mistaken, about twenty more, way more than twenty thousand square feet, twenty five perhaps. Not very good at addition. So that's kind of, I mean, that's just with those three buildings, uh, and not thinking, looking at um, any additional, you know, high, second stories or third stories on some of the existing. So I, I'm just trying to understand that. If you could help me out. Yeah, so previously we were discussing the commercial expansions. Uh, so we were talking about specifically the, like the line buildings and the, the commercial infill. Uh, the three public buildings are a separate element. Um, and yes, I, I forget the exact number, but that sounds about right. Um, and they would be you know, dispersed at the, uh, up to that square footage in the locations proposed. Uh, one of the things to note, though, is that with the overall expansion of the wharf by two and a half acres, uh, a 20,000 square foot or 25,000 square foot is one sixth of that, um, so it's it's kind of balanced by the overall expansion in public access space. Uh, additionally, since the buildings are intended to be publicly accessible and more community oriented structures, uh, because they're enclosed does not mean that you know you have to necessarily pay to enter or to do anything there. The intent is that they're at least in the master plan is is really to promote cultural uses through those structures. And if I could just quickly, quickly add, this is this is Stephanie. What the EIR considered was the three new buildings, which total 15,000 square feet, 
The master plan also has a specific, you know, recommendation for the infill, which is 4,000 square feet. And the recommendations in the plan encourage redevelopment of the existing buildings. So in talking with the planning department and economic development, we um, came up with a estimate of about 12 to 18,000 square feet for redevelopment. So our total um, building square footage is the combination of those two that we look at in evalu evaluating impacts such as water, traffic, things like that. Thanks. So, and so not, there, those, so I guess the, what the confusion for me was not considering those buildings to be commercial, although there may be commercial uses in them. So I, I think that's what I'm hearing. So, so. Yeah, I mean, at the program level, it's uncertain what the use is. So, I mean, it, when a project comes forward, it certainly could be that. Um, that's not the intent of the master plan. Um, I would also note that just the, the added sort of ability to infill is, to some extent, a financing mechanism. We know the buildings will have to be replaced at some point to repair the wharf underneath them. Uh, and at that time, whatever comes forward has to be able to convince banks and financiers that it will be able to pencil. And sometimes that means it needs to grow. Um, that's just a reality of economics, whether or not we like it. Okay, Council Member Byers. I'm just uh, smiling, Dave, that your background shows a picture of the war from Westcliff, maybe? I think so. Um, it looks like it's yeah, backwards. It <laughs> <laughs> and the other, uh, so it's a part of it. It's not way to the end. But I think it was just a few weeks ago when I was um, on Westcliff, actually at the lighthouse, and it was dusk, and it, um, the boardwalk was lit up. It was the most gorgeous view because you looked at the wharf, but then you went beyond it and could see uh, the roller coaster and the lighting and then that row of trees behind it. And uh, then I pulled it all, you know, visually tried to pull the end where that landmark building would be. And it, it, it it's huge. It, it was, it, it surprised me. I mean, 40 feet is, when you think of three stories, I mean, even walking on the wharf along a three-story building it, to me, is so out of place. I, I'm sorry. I'm just having trouble with that lar large building. But uh, I think there's there's a visual impact of itself on the wharf that wasn't looked at. At least I didn't see any comment. And the same thing, looking on not at Seabright, but that wonderful street when when oh when you cross the Trestle Bridge and then you come out, it it's very dominant. Uh, uh, in fact, all the new buildings and the other ones are allowed to go up to 40 feet. It's just, uh, um, from what we have now, I think it's, it'll be just a huge uh, impact, a visual impact almost everywhere. So I'm, I'm disappointed in the, in the size of it. And I would just clarify again, it's, it's a placeholder. Uh, it'll, whatever is developed eventually would be as a result of community process, and it I may or may not be that high. Right. I, I totally understand. But, yep. but we are putting forward parameters. All right. If there's no further discussion from council members, I'm going to open it up for public comment. So if there are members of the public who would like to comment on item number 23 on our agenda, which is the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan and Environmental Determination, now is the time to call in if you haven't already uh, using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine to raise your hand. Uh, when you've been called upon, you'll be asked to unmute your phone and you will be given two minutes unless uh, you've already spoken with me and received communication otherwise. With that, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Uh, before you start the clock, can you hear me? Yes, and Thank yes. Thank you. Um, Mayor and Council Members, my name is Gillian Greenside. I'm representing the group Don't Morph the Wharf. The community is all for maintaining the wharf so it will last another century, fixing the road, repairing the shear panel, and replacing pilings as needed are strongly supported. 
what the community is against is changing the character, the feel, the aesthetics of the wharf, changing its place in our heart. There are parts of the plan that the community can support and parts that are strongly opposed as evidenced by the many letters, emails and petitions. You can, by your vote, take out those aspects of <laughs> that are the most unpopular and by doing so, get the community behind a far better plan and EIR. This will take a little longer, but it was the city's decision, not ours, to wait four years to circulate the EIR. This plan imposed on the community, rather than developed with the community, proposes three new 40 feet tall buildings whose function is to shield people from the ocean breeze, the out at sea experience, that the wharf provides and which is its attraction. The massive landmark building will cover the five sea line viewing holes with no replacement sites identified in the staff report. Where exactly will they fit? The lowered western walkway ruins the aesthetics of the historic pilings and displaces migratory birds. Sheer strength can be achieved in other ways. Staff says this plan is just a vision, a placeholder, that as each project comes up, there will be opportunity for public input. Experience has shown that once a plan is approved, future projects mirror the plan. If public input so far has barely moved the needle for the Warp Master Plan, it is unlikely to do so for individual projects. Staff says that grants for ongoing wharf maintenance can be leveraged only with this plan and this EIR and only if all this new construction is included. We challenge that claim. An amended plan, an EIR, achieves the same result. We are told the wharf is losing money. However, during this year's budget hearings, a department head said, and I quote, the wharf breaks even. If you want to augment, augment the wharf's budget, give the considerable monies from wharf parking fees to the wharf rather than to the general fund. This was suggested in the engineering report. It appears that this is a plan to change the class character of wharf visitors, to attract the more affluent to spend money on upscale restaurants and boat tours rather than lower income visitors fishing with their coolers next to their vehicles. The plan does reduce the usable areas for fishing, turning fishing areas into conflicting use areas. It turns open space into closed space for private weddings and the like. Council, you can do better than to accept this Wolf Master Plan and its deficient EIR. Approve an amended plan that reflects what the community will support. Remove the landmark building, the lowered western walkway, keep heights at 30 feet and adopt the recommendations from the Historic Preservation Commission. That leaves a lot in the plan. With an amended plan and EIR and with community support, it's full steam ahead for grants to fix the maintenance that has been neglected since 2016. It's amazing how smoothly things can go when you work with the community rather than against it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next caller. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hello, esteemed mayor and council. I'm Andrea Rosenfeld, community member. And I'm opposed to some major aspects of the current Wharf Master Plan. I acknowledge the need to make repairs and improve the economic vibrancy of the wharf. However, I question the scope and approach that is being taken to permanently change this beloved historic landmark. I'm glad to hear staff's recommendation to be flexible with the proposed entranceway as the current vision is not aesthetically in keeping with the wharf and surrounding areas. Our waste treatment plant even has a curved gate with turtles on it. The proposed gateway building appears to be nothing more than a large herding area to accommodate throngs of tourists waiting to board a tour and a place to display racks of brochures. 
the improved use of the outdoor pavilion for private weddings appears to be a redirection away from public use. And most objectionable is the 40-foot tall proposed warehouse style landmark building at the end of the extended wharf, which would have nebulous uses. It has no guarantees of educational or regionally appropriate businesses within it. And their selection would be, quote, subject to competitive evaluation from a broad range of nonprofit and for-profit entities, end quote. Although it is stated that a great deal of thought would be required to make the choices for tenancy in this building, there's nothing in the plan that would require this selection to be fitting of our community's priorities and affinities. The plan also indicates this building would be a ripe opportunity for corporate sponsorship, something completely unacceptable in my view. Finally, I strongly object to the destruction of the sea lion viewing areas by this proposed building plan with no designated replacement sites. If the current plan sets the rules for development, I'm urging the council to reject the current plan until it's modified to address the above items of concern within its current framework in order to yeah, better please. mitigate community concerns. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, this is Debbie Hinkey. Um, I appreciate uh, all that has transpired this afternoon. I've noticed a couple things, and I think you know um, pretty much my views on morphing the wharf. Um, but what I've noticed is the incredible amount of traffic. I recently spent some time um, in the summer. The traffic report that's committed to this uh, EIR was done in October. That is not indicative of the traffic that's going to be there in the summer, nor is the amount of enormous projects that you have that will impact the area. Most of them are on the west side or coming to the west side or on the way from Ocean Street. That is a lot of people, a lot more cars, a lot more impact on the traffic that's going to affect the wharf. Um, so I think you need to rethink the flow and the amount of people you want to draw to the area. Um, it just is unbelievable uh, when I look at the impact that it's going to have um, on that area. The other thing is I'm not seeing one iota of evidence of climate change in your EIR, and I'm sorry, even the president-elect has created a position in his cabinet for climate. I think it is crucial that we take a look at what that impact is going to be in Santa Cruz. Are we even going to have a boardwalk? Are we even going to have this area in as much as 10 years from now? Granted, when this was all created, the 2030 general plan, it wasn't in our foresight. Um, I think you need to really rethink and consider the impact that climate is going to have on Santa Cruz. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Susan Martinez. I am a community member here. I am opposed to um, the master plan of the wharf as, as uh, presented. I agree completely with the three speakers before me, so I will just confine myself to just one important point that I think needs to be made. I'm amazed at this so-called final EIR. I've never seen an EIR that was quote unquote only a possible framework. It's not a complete definitive plan. Your presenter used words such as, quote, points that are only proposed, unquote, quote, placeholders, quote, supposed to include, 
quote, design, design, design features that remain to be seen. Um, and other, another quote was, this gives us options. This is not a definitive document, a definitive legal document. That's what EIRs are supposed to do because they guarantee that the final product will comply with California CEQA standards environmentally, biologically, economically. Um, when the concrete plans are finalized before construction, you're going to have to redo the EIR. You're going to have to recirculate any changes as supplements to this EIR. And that means noticing to the public the same way you did the DEIR and then the EIR. So I hope that your staff realizes this um, because this EIR is not adequate. It's, it's, it can't be said that it's up to CEQA standards because we don't know what we're being presented. Everything is just kind of iffy. Um, so, oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Oh, good evening. Um, so uh, my name is Carol Paco, and I wanted to address the EIR um, in the context of um, interaction with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, I, I can see that there was a huge amount of juggling of all the concerns, which is wonderful, and there's a lot of time put into that. I was not hearing a whole lot of time put into the environmental um, in relationship to the, the wildlife, and I want to speak to that. Um, I did not understand the mitigation of the bird nesting uh, site, for example, which had been nesting there for generations. Um, it did not sound like any experts had been contacted. I might have missed that. I needed to briefly step away, but I'd like to... Um, ask if that actually has happened, so if somebody who actually knows about that, um, as opposed to just saying this should be fine, um, because I did not see that. Um, also, I'm very concerned about the pile driving time of year construction. Um, as we all know, you know, uh, sounds travel much extremely further distances in the water, and um, I want to know if um, that, uh, if there are allowed times for that and times that are not allowed that take into account both the nesting and also the major migration of the whales. Um, and um, I also agree with uh, several people talking about the non-specificity. I know that you'll need to basically make some general things so that there's a, an envelope with which um, the specifics can be spelled out in, but um, there also needs to be some specifics when it comes to here is how here is how um, the, the wildlife is going to be protected. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. My name is Michael Becker, and I uh, am a community member also, and I resent the use of this term community member to only represent those opposing the master plan. I completely support this new plan and its guidelines, and a plan is guidelines. It isn't specific. Uh, the work needs to be both repaired and improved to embrace new modern uses for both, both for work visitors, both local and tourists, and, and its uh, users and occupants. Uh, I totally support this plan. I think uh, 40 feet is within the zoning requirements, and you should uh, vote to support it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, next caller, last four digits are 7000. If you can please unmute your phone, uh, you'll be given two minutes to comment. Okay, so next caller, 5362, so those are the last four digits of your phone number. Please press star six to unmute your device and you'll be given two minutes. Good evening. Um, this is Judy Grunstra. Uh, I agree with Jillian Greenside. Uh, this is way too much. And um, let me mute my TV. Um, yeah, when you're walking, just because 40, a 40 foot building is allowed doesn't mean it's desirable. Uh, if you're walking on the wharf itself, it's going to be massive, these buildings in front of you and on the side. Uh, you know, the wharf is funky. Let's put it that way. You know, it doesn't have to be some slick Santa Monica kind of um, attraction. So repair what needs to be repaired, possibly expand it, but uh, don't make a uh, slick, ugly commercial endeavor of it. It's fine the way it is. We enjoy the sea views and the ocean, proximity to the ocean and the feel of it. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Hi, uh, it's Fred Geiger here. Well, first of all, I think we can all agree that the reason people come to the wharf is for the ambiance, obviously. And whatever you do that affects that ambiance by changing it is obviously counterproductive. So you've got 27-foot buildings, and you're allowed to build 40-foot buildings, but as the old uh, SUV commercial said with the guy jumping his SUV off the cliff, just because you could doesn't mean you should. So, I mean, why would you want to tamper with something that's attractive and, and, it, and uh, brings people into town and creates business by mucking it up with some out-of-scale, non-authentic type buildings? Uh, it, it just isn't in the benefit of the wharf. It's not in the interest of the wharf. It's in the interest of the community. Um, also, I think the, the um, report said that the uh, viewing ports would be relocated if possible. If that's still in there, uh, that's not good enough, folks. If possible, we don't know what that is. That's a real fluff up. Get it in writing. Also, the cruise ship stuff, we were told originally cruise ships couldn't come in the marine sanctuary. Well, we found out that wasn't true. Cruise ships are not going to land at the dock, yes. It's going to be shuttles. And if you don't want shuttles or tenders, you have to put the language in there to prohibit that because future councils, future staff members, whatever you're being told tonight, yeah, fine, great, sounds good. But if it's not written down and guaranteed, then it could easily change. It could it change without public notice. It could change without public acceptance. So don't mess up the wharf. There's no point in changing it drastically. Do the repairs that are needed. Keep the ambiance. Keep the viewing ports for sure. The outdoor dining at the end of the wharf is where I take my friends when they come to town. If you destroy that, that's one of the best things about the wharf. And what are these 200 feet of landings for marine? We heard it was marine uh, vessels, marine research vessels. There's three harbors on the bay already. That's where they go. So you're wasting the taxpayers' money by building these landings because there's really no use for them. So thanks for looking at these things and taking care of these problems. Good evening. Thank you.
Okay, so last call, uh, the last four digits of your phone number are 7000. Now is the time uh, for public comment. You'll want to press star six to unmute your device, and you'll be given two minutes. Uh, hi, my name is Charles Meyer, and I'm a, um, a business owner on the wharf. I just wanted to say that I support the, the wharf plan, and I, I think that it's positive to create a uh, a nicer place for people to come, and also for um, the people that have been going there for years, and also the new generation of people that would like some changes. But I think it would be good. So I just wanted to say that I support the project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is the last call. If there's anyone who wants to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes. Hello? Good evening. <laughs> good, e good evening. This is John Aird. I don't think I've quite worked out your system here, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I strongly agree that uh, this program needs some additional work. Uh, fundamentally, this plan, I agree with lots that is in the plan. There are essentially uh, 11 or 12 major items and I'm comfortable with eight of them. So it's, uh, you know, 75% uh, batting average. I think overall, though, uh, the issue that I really take exception to is best uh, typified. If you take kind of a macro, veil, uh, macro view of this whole uh, plan, the overall 33% increase size of the wharf is too much, and the 40-foot maximum height for the new proposed buildings are just too high. The overall effect of these two alone, when combined, is to totally change an individual's experience from being one on a wharf jutting into the Monterey Bay sanctuary, one that immerses oneself in the beauty of the bay and the environment, to one that effectively is visiting an entertainment and restaurant platform that happens to be over water. Uh, this is particularly highlighted by the landmark building. The construction over it, it's going to be constructed over the existing sea uh, line by the size. It's 6,000 square feet, which is described as relatively small, but that is uh, much bigger uh, than the existing, it's twice the size of our current civic center, our c civic auditorium to give you a feel for it. Its mass will effectively block the view of Monterey Bay off the wharf's end. It's also absent any evidence of it being a response to a defined market or community need or what potential negative effects, it, if built, it would have on the other comparable existing commercial. I would suggest take that out for sure and do the other adjustments and you'll have the community behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, Council Members Byers, Brown, Boulder, Matthews, and Watkins. Uh, this is Casey Byer. I'm the CEO of the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have written before on behalf of uh, uh, the Chamber members to support this Force Master Plan. I wanted to point out again uh, that in 1910, the Chamber established a committee to construct a municipal war. The chamber issued $165,000 in bonds to build the new wharf in 1913. I was at the 100-year anniversary celebration of that wharf, and at that time, it was very clear from the, the, the attendees that the wharf was in need of major repairs. I want to remind you that the chamber represents over 600 businesses countywide, individuals, community leaders, and public officials, and is considered the voice of the Santa Cruz County business community since... 1889, that's 131 years ago. The war
wharf, like the boardwalk, as well as the Monterey Marine Sanctuary Center at the entrance of the wharf, reminds us of the direct connection between protecting the natural environment and while balancing economic benefits that the wharf brings to the city of Santa Cruz. These iconic attractions for residents and tourists alike draw hundreds of thousands of people to visit annually. The wharf is known as one of the, the county's premier tourist attractions. And we all understand that tourism is one of the core economic engines of our community. That is why the wharf master plan needs to be improved, updated, and the wharf's infrastructure and management system must be designed so it is maintained for ongoing protection of our ocean paradise. I can go on uh, in extensive detail about the master plan that is for you, but it's the chamber's 131 years of promoting economic vitality, environmental enhancement of the city and county's infrastructure projects that is a simple response to this plan. Please approve this plan now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. Um, well, thank you for this um, WARF uh, master plan. I think it's been a very involved process, and there has been a lot of community involvement. But we are at a pivotal moment where this can go forward, knowing that there's a major lawsuit before you, and it probably will go to that level. And maintenance and critical structural issues will be delayed, and that's a great concern to me. Um, so I would encourage you to maybe have a third party and negotiate and delay the master plan until you, such time as you can work out some of these details. Otherwise, you're going to cause a very challenging uh, situation for the city. And um, the city attorney was just um, asked for $400,000 overage. And uh, I just wonder how we can continue in some of these lawsuits. So. I think it's worth trying to negotiate further, even if, if it's with another third party, as a go-between between, between the parties of the city and the people involved with the lawsuit. I'm also concerned about extreme weather conditions and how that will affect the lower um, pathways. Um, we obviously want them to be safe and well-maintained, but can they really, really withstand these major weather events? And if so, what are the maintenance costs going to be? And I am going to look at the plan more closely because I haven't heard a lot about how these, these landmark pavilions are going to generate enough income uh, versus the cost of delaying this and the cost of going through this lawsuit. And so I think it's worth reconsidering the hype. I find it interesting that you talk about a variation, whereas people, when they look at the horizon and they look at a line, they don't necessarily, when you're dealing with the water line, have to have variation in building sizes. So I find that argument a little bit strange. You're using land use considerations for the wharf. I can't think of many buildings or wharfs that actually have a three-story building. So I think it's worth doing an equal comparison. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, um, I have some questions. Oh, the, the TV, okay. Hello, my name is Kathy Haber and I live within a half a mile of the wharf. I frequently walk on it, so I'm very familiar with it. Um, and I have questions about the wharf master plan that I think have not been answered. Um, first, it's been presented that the wharf is weak and needs strengthening. Um, and I don't understand if that is the case, how it can support second stories and 40-foot buildings. Has the weight and the wind shear from these higher buildings been considered? Will the wharf actually have to be made beefier to support these heavy buildings and more pilings driven? Second question, the landmark building will generate more visitors with their cars. Otherwise, why build it? Where is the additional parking for special events? 
When people come for a special event, they expect to be able to park their car reasonably close. And you are not adding really any significant additional parking. It sounds like it's just mainly restriking. Um, the, my third question is, I don't understand the source of funding for this massive project. If you don't have the funding to repair the wharf the way it is, where is the money supposed to come from to build these new buildings, these walkways, et cetera, et cetera? That is going to cost a very great deal of money. I do not think that the city should issue general obligation bonds for these projects when there is so little community support and a lot of community objection. Um, so Thank you for your comments. <laughs> the next caller, and you'll be our last caller. Hello? Good evening. Hi, my name is Robin Brown. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Um, I wanted to make a few remarks based upon the questions of council members. Um, landmark building, I don't think the title of this building is a misnomer. It is going to dominate the scene. It's in the middle of the ocean. I don't think it's very good to compare it to Coconut Grove, which is a building on the land. The photos do not show how it will appear when walking on the wharf itself. It will be predominant and eliminate a wide vista view of the water. You will see more buildings than you will see ocean. The presenter um, from the city said it was to entice a person to walk the length of the wharf uh, and so increase the commercial possibilities. They walk the full length, they'll buy more things. Um, I mean, be more commercially productive. I, I would like that the enticement is to see the unlimited view of the Monterey Bay uh, Marine Sanctuary. Uh, one of the council members mentioned enjoying seeing the lit up boardwalk. Um, this uh, landmark is having weddings and venues into the wee hours of the night. It's going to uh, increase the impact on the uh, marine sanctuary as far as noise and visual pollution. Um, this is going to disturb wildlife at night, which used to have the night to itself. We don't do that in our state parks, um, so why should we do it in a national marine sanctuary? Um, we wouldn't put a landmark building like this on Sunset or Manresa Beach. We shouldn't have it on the wharf either. The city representatives say it's just a placeholder. The building doesn't have to happen. That means punt the ball down the road. You have the authority to set limits now. Please do so. And I do believe the commercial space has increased about 60%. That's way more than just a deck on top of a restaurant. So thank you. We did have one more hand go up, and this is going to be the last comment. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. It's Ron Pomerantz. And uh, I, I just find the city is spending a diminishing tax dollars to push this incredibly staff-driven, unnecessary and wasteful project. The Wharf Master Plan proposes to construct three new buildings, one of which is going to be well over 40 feet, obscuring the iconic vista into the bay at the end of the wharf. I highly recommend that you require putting up story poles to really see the impact of what this new construction will look like. The plan eliminates the pop that will most likely eliminate the popular and educational sea line viewing area. The master plan reduces fishing areas, which was the original reason the wharf was, was built. The plan calls for reducing already too small parking space. 
parking space sizes in, and there's no additional parking provided, which which will in the in the high season will create potential gridlock on the wharf and at the entry to the wharf. <clears throat> and, um, and I don't know how you're going to control cars and and other traffic issues. There's nothing addressed there. Structural improvements to the wharf are continuously necessary and highly supportable. But to spend millions of dollars for tourist amusement is is out of the question for me. City revenues are essential to cover the, the ever need for COVID uh, world to support basic and essential services, which is the primary function of the city. The wharf is a holistic structure with charm and character that would be destroyed by the proposed master plan. Do not accept the IR as presently laid out. Spend what it takes to keep the war structurally safe and sound and maintain the feel and historic charisma. I thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. I know there are a few questions that came up, so um, maybe if staff could is available to answer a few of those questions. I know um, two that uh, come to mind. I know one. Um, there was a member of the community who asked about sources of funding for kind of these other aspects within the project. And then the other one was um, whether experts were contacted regarding the nesting bird habitat. So I was just wondering if you could address those questions that came up in the community. Oh, and Dave, if you're muted. There he goes again. Uh, I think for the first one, uh, I think we've been fairly clear that we're looking largely to outside funding, uh, grants and things like that. Um, we have limited uh, redevelopment bonds that could be used to leverage some of that funding, but you know, at, at short, I don't think now is the time to think about a, a ballot measure, uh, you know, uh, for it, let alone uh, for improvements. Um, but uh, grants and stuff probably makes the most sense. Uh, as far as um, the, the expert analysis of birds, I'm going to ask Stephanie Strilo to, to speak on that one. Sure. And this is also included in the response in your staff report, but the biological resources section of the EIR was prepared by uh, five different biologists, um, and there was a technical bird nesting study prepared by uh, local biologist Gary Kilson and Brian Morey, and then the EIR section where uh, GDEC biologists the nesting birds uh, setting impact section and responses to comments was prepared by David Thompson, who has over 20 years experience as a biologist specializing in ornithology. And then we had Dr. Michael Henry prepare the setting section impacts and um, all the response to comments related to the marine environment and other uh, wildlife issues. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Yes, thank you. Um, I am actually, uh, if the questions have been answered, I'm prepared to go ahead and make a motion to um, move forward on this. I first want to say um, I, I want to commend all the <laughs> 16 years of work or however long it's been going into this. I mean, it's uh, obviously the, the uh, well-being and future of the work has been a concern for a long, long time. And um, I think the degree of community involvement all along, but particularly most recently with the EIR um, publication has been very helpful. We got lots and lots of comments um, uh, all along the way. I will point out that we did get letters of support from uh, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, among others, so that was mentioned. Um, but the comments raised from the public um, did um, cause us to take a little extra time, make sure the issues were covered and um, uh, many callers will know, but not perhaps all, that many significant issues were um, um, reviewed and we have revised language that's come forth uh, from staff in, in response to some specific concerns that were raised. I want to just mention those briefly. Um, I, uh, I think I'll mention them first. Um, in the... Um, the revisions that have come to us since we, we heard this recently, um, pro, uh, proposed modifications include 
Uh, one about the uh, historic review process that was mentioned in the staff report. I'm not I'm going to go into detail, but just the issues. Um, the issues of not explicitly not accommodating large vessels or their shuttles is covered in uh, additional language. The uh, issue of the entrance sign uh, has been revised. This, this was mentioned, but these are recent changes in response to public comments. Um, that language has been changed um, and made uh, much more flexible with the uh, direction that it be simply inspirational. Um, the uh, section of height um, ex uh, explains that it's consistent with uh, the underlying zoning, but it is not a mandate to do anything. And that, I think, is what's important. These are, these are um, uh, guidelines and maximums. Um, regarding the sea lion viewing, uh, uh, added language is very clear. Um, and I, I will have to say, the staff report, the agenda report mentioned that there is a fair amount of misinformation that has circulated on this. So the um, revised language is very explicit. Any potential development at the end of the work shall preserve to the greatest extent possible or relocate to a place of greater access and viewing quality the popular sea lion viewing. I mean, it's made very clear in the um, presentation that the uh, locations have moved and there, um, in fact, are even greater um, possibilities under the revised plan. So I just wanted to start by saying that the, uh, I feel the um, community input has been very valuable and the uh, staff recommendation has um, been responsive quite explicitly to the um, issues that have been raised. So having said that, um, I'm going to move that we uh, adopt the recommendation presented, which includes adoption of a resolution certifying the final EIR, including the amended language that was suggested earlier um, in this meeting um, by the, I believe, city attorney, but maybe with that language up there. Um, it was shown to us once. Um, that we adopt a resolution approving the findings of fact and mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan and the CEQA. That we adopt the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan subject to the modifications proposed by staff and I'll descri describe some of those. Those are included in our um, agenda material starting on page 23.11. And that we, number four, direct staff to prepare a public works plan with the California Coastal Commission for implementation of the work master plan. So that's my motion. Okay. I have a motion by <clears throat> Councilmember Matthews. Councilmember Brown, I see your hands raised, but I'm looking for a second to the motion. So, Councilmember Brown, are you? Councilmember Watkins. I'm happy to second the motion. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Watkins. Councilmember Brown. And you're muted, by the way. You unmute. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say a couple of things. First, I I want to be clear that I I absolutely support this master plan. I, um, you know, I appreciate all of the work that's gone into it. I appreciate, I really appreciate the work that staff has done concerns. And so I'm, I'm really glad to see that that has happened. Um, but as staff has repeatedly reminded us today that we are being asked to approve a, a placeholder that will, uh, set up the parameters for an acceptable, uh, envelope for construction for, for new building and um i'd like i just would like to see an envelope that is a little bit smaller that actually um you know does not insist on including the really objectionable elements and um and for me that is because i've heard it over and over from uh, not from poker tonight in uh communications to us the landmark building that is where my um my significant opposition lays, for, for me at least. Um, and, but also, um, given that there 
some potential, there's some gray area here about um, interpretation of CEQA with respect to the, in particular, the landmark building and aesthetic uh, impact. Um, we are going to see a lawsuit. We will if we don't remove that landmark building. And um, and so I, I would like to see a motion that um, includes that. I have, um, so I'd like to put this forward as a substitute motion. I want it to be clear on the record. Um, I have sent it to Bonnie, to the city clerk, and I'm, if you could put it up, that would be really great. Um, and I'm, I'm just, to make this clean, I'm going to offer this as a substitute motion. Um, Sandy, before you go, do you do want the additions added? That staff, this part right here to the. Sorry, I gave, I sent it to you before the. Okay, I, I plugged it in just in case. But there you Thanks. I, I, I sent it to you before that. Um, that was changed. So I'm going to make a substitute motion, um, get it on the record here. Um, and it's essentially the staff recommendation. Um, and we, so you can, you, we've read all of that, but just going down to number three. Um, with respect to the adoption of the Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan, um, subject to modifications proposed by staff, um, with the following revisions. So, uh, and I'm I'm looking at the master plan itself, um, that document on page 11 of that document, summary of policies and proposed actions in section one, paragraph three. Um, I would propose that be deleted. And that paragraph says, construct a new landmark building on access with the main vehicular circulation drive, uh, reminiscent in scale and industrial form uh, to the large warehouse structure. Um, so that, um, and then, so, and these are just kind of going through in the master plan uh, places where I think if we just eliminated the, this length, um, we, we, might, uh, we might feel, we might get a lot more community support. Um, so on page 12 in section four, uh, construct a landmark building uh, that punctuates the bayward end of the wharf, um, celebrates its deep water extension and southwest orientation into the wind for optimal mooring and recall of historic warehouse structure. Again, um, to uh, delete that paragraph. Um, on pages 29 and 30, uh, there is language um, regarding the landmark building, and um, I, I propose that that be removed. Uh, lastly, on page 49, um, amending design standards as follows. Um, building height, second floor uses, and rooftop dining are encouraged um, with a maximum height for all buildings, not to exceed two stories or 35 feet, uh, not including special appurtenances and architectural projections. I, I can never pronounce that word. Um, so then the rest of it is um, the, the staff recommendation. So that's uh, my substitute motion, and I will stop there. Okay, so we have a substitute motion by Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Byers. Um, does that take a second to this motion? Yes, they'll need, they'll yeah. need a second. Yeah. Yes, I second the motion. Okay, so we have a, mo a substitute motion made by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Byers. I'd like to speak to it too. Sure, go ahead. Okay, fine. Uh, I think uh, removing the landmark building is often referred to as if there had been a landmark building at the end of the wharf. There was a good sized building, absolutely true, but that's where all the fisher, fish came in or the fishermen and women came in with their fish. And it was a util, utilitarian uh, part of the wharf, so absolutely needed, it made sense. But if we've long passed that this is any longer a fishing wharf, it is a tourist wharf. And, um, and for the other reason, increasing the commercial by 57%, it, you've got to think of that's where half it would, a lot, of, a lot of it would be in that landmark building, totally out of scale, not necessary. The views, I think we already talked about the views of it, uh, just walking by it would not be a pleasant experience. Uh, you can walk in, the, if, if we, one of the historic pictures was wonderful. There was nothing on the wharf. I, maybe there was that, just that building. And I thought, you know, if you just walk out there, which a lot of people do, they hear the 
lions barking, all kinds of birds, and look at the sea. That should be the experience. Yes, there has to be some buildings because people want to eat and restaurants and stuff. But it should be overwhelming taking taking that experience of of a place where you can see the sea and hear the birds and hear the barking of the lions, and it's just become uh, we become an overbuilt, totally overbuilt um, place, uh, no longer a wharf, no longer a place that has been here forever with all of its historic significance. There's really nothing left that would be of historic significance, maybe a couple pockets or so. And I just think the community uh, has no sense of what the structure and 40 feet of uh, buildings all would, would break up that ambience totally. So I'm more, I'm so happy to support, and I thank you, Sandy, for bringing this forward. Be so. Uh, way too much it's just way too much and it could be a thing and walk on the wharf back at low sea i hate to go on about it but it is just changing at 150 percent okay uh council member brown then council member matthews yeah thank you i, I just want to make one more comment about this uh because there um there seems to be uh, a real insistence that we keep this uh this element in the plan and at the same time we are hearing well it's you know it, that it's not a mandate it, it could be and so i guess i'm just wondering um how, how to reconcile the um you know what i'm hearing kind of the pushback seems to suggest that um that's a linchpin for the master plan and if we don't have it you know, you know, I mean, we're not really talking about, well, what happens if we don't have that particular building um, included in the master plan? So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little, um, I, I just feel like that's a little contradictory, and I, I wanted to um, put that out there. Um, if it is so critical that we have it, um, then saying that, well, it's not, it probably maybe isn't going to happen is not really an appropriate argument for, to, at least it's for the community to feel more comfortable about it. And that is what I am, you know, I don't want to see the work change, and, but that's not my decision to make, right? I understand um, that there is a need for, um, you know, doing things that are going to help augment the, you know, the, the business and uh, provide some resources for, uh, you know, for the, the repairs, which I do believe need to be done and all of it. Um, but this particular piece just seems to be uh, what is, so, is really objectionable. And so I'm, I'm, that's why I made the substitute motion. So, thanks. I'm done. I'm going to see if maybe um, if there's members on the staff who wanted to respond to that. So maybe Mr. McCormick, if you have any follow-up comments to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and Bonnie may or may not want to add anything to it. But uh, as I as it, when I when I reference the idea of placeholder or or a, not a mandate, it's in large part because the the master plan is a programmatic analysis of potential uh, for the most part, for everything but the East Promenade and the Gateway. Under CEQA, it's looking at a program, which is what is sort of somewhat nebulous, but an idea, and analyzing that idea for its, uh, its merits and its potential impacts. Um, once a project comes along, that'll have to be analyzed further to see if it fits more or less than the impacts evaluated at the program level. As far as the building itself, uh, it, yes, it, it could potentially be built up to 40 feet and the 6,000 square foot, you know, floor plate uh, under the current master plan. Um, but it will evolve based upon community process and needs at the time that, you know, funding and or coalitions and or a project comes along that wants to do that development. The fact of the matter is the engineering report found the end of the wharf to be among the highest needs uh, for reinvestment. Uh, I believe it said uh, upwards of 50% of the fasteners on the end of the war were failing. Uh, we know it's been around about 60 years since there's been major investment in the end of the wharf, and it's getting the brunt of all of the damage. Uh, we know that uh, the Dolphin uh, is one of the sites that was of greatest concern uh, among the engineering team when they evaluated things like the, the Miramar, which has since come down. So we know we will have to redevelop that at some point. Um, as we go to do these things, we need to have maximum flexibility as a community to determine what goes there. 
what will change, how we, we meet the needs of the future as far as uh, how we, we shore up the end of the wharf and how we provide all the recreational, aesthetic, and, and uh, investment opportunities that are needed to sustain the end of the wharf. We already lost 45 feet in the 60s. Do we want to lose more? You know, that's certainly a question. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, doing those major improvements at the end of the wharf, having an, uh, a, a project placeholder allows us to go and get the design money and the funding money that we need to determine what we're going to do there to best meet the various needs that will evolve. And without that, it will be that much harder. It will be only basically trying to fund deferred maintenance. And that is not something that it's easy to get outside money for. It doesn't come along often. And it's highly competitive when it comes along. So having a project there, whatever it is, uh, whether it's a landmark building or some much reduced version that the community develops later, is an important placeholder for us to ensure the end of the wharf stays standing. Councilmember Brown, you have the floor. So I'll just, if you have any further comments, and then we'll move on to the other council members. Yeah, thank you. I just, um, just a follow-up question there because, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, Mr. McCormick, and I, you know, I don't want to um, sound combative at all because I'm really just trying to understand um, how, I mean, how a, a building of this scale is necessary to um, the, you know, shoring up or, you know, doing any work at the end of the wharf. I, I just, I mean, why couldn't it be a smaller footprint or envelope for that build. I guess, I guess that's just where I'm, I'm, I'm still confused. The insistence that it must be of that, uh, potentially of that scale, and that otherwise we're going to not be able to do anything except for deferred maintenance. So I, I, that just doesn't, I, I'm still not understanding that, um, why we couldn't do a smaller, um, you know, envelope there. Yeah, and, and I couldn't say for sure, not knowing what the, the eventual use would be as to what envelope it needs to be. Um, and that's kind of the point, right, is, is we don't know what the community is going to need 10, 15, 20 years down the line uh, to serve the needs down there. I mean, it very well could be that we see a return of some commercial fishing. The, the stocks have, have uh, recovered. The addition of landings and new davits might allow us to have some commercial fish landings at the wharf, in which case we might need refrigeration units. Uh, we might need, you know, an expanded fish market. There might be any variety of things that change uh, out there that we can't anticipate. Uh, the current zoning allows 40 feet, and while we might be able to do a lot with less, uh, we just don't know at this point. Um, and so keeping it as it is gives us the most flexibility, and it also allows you the opportunity to ensure that whatever is proposed will have the flexibility to secure the financing it needs not just through grants, but potentially bank financing and things where stuff actually has to pencil. Um, you know, it's it just, it, we're, we're trying to argue over something that is, is necessarily nebulous at a program master plan level, um, but it's there to ensure that the community really can develop the type of project it needs when the time comes. And maybe Bonnie's got a little bit more to say. She cut her camera on. Yeah had some camera issues. I, actually, you've said everything really very well that I would have added to it. Um, and the last part of what you just said was what I was going to add is that it does provide us maximum flexibility through the planning process, uh, the public outreach process. The master plan that's before you today is actually a lower height than what was originally recommended through the public process and through the architect's visioning. So there has been, um, you know, really some thoughtful approach to this in hearing some of the comments, many of the comments that we received from a public standpoint. I think the critical point from our perspective is that flexibility. We know that the dolphin has to come down at some point in the not too distant future. And if we don't have some building um, with, that's included in the master plan at the end of the war, it's going to be really problematic from us. From an economic viability perspective, we know we need commercial activity. We know we need to bring tourists to the wharf. And as a, 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 a member of the public commented earlier who owns a business on the wharf, um, you know, be, bringing a new demographic to the wharf is going to be critical for long-term economic success. We need to do that. So I think from my perspective, does it need to be 40? Can it be 35? You know, it could. 
it absolutely could. The 40 foot is in line with current zoning, which is why we sort of felt like we were compromising on what's allowed under current zoning. If council wants to direct it, uh, you know, a lower height, they could. It's not the staff recommendation, but um, that is something you could do, absolutely. I think the critical thing is that um, we are able to move forward with a master plan, that it does include a building of some sort, uh, direction to include of a certain height and massing at the end of the wharf so that we can go forward in the future. And to your question, I mean, David addressed this as well. We don't have the funding right now, um, but we do need it in our planning document. You know, as David mentioned earlier, and I mentioned at the beginning, the last master plan we, we had was in 1980. So that's why we feel it's so important to include these elements now, um, because we may not have another opportunity to bring another, a plan to you again once we get this approved for, you know, 30, 40 years. This is a document that's supposed to stand for the next 20 or 30 years. So we want it to have the maximum flexibility. Um, hopefully we'll be able to apply for grants and we'll do more community outreach and go through a future public process for what any future building does look like. And we recognize if there is, you know, the majority of the public sentiment about a lower building on the wharf, that ultimately is, is what will be built on the end of the wharf. But right now for the planning document and the visioning, we really do recommend that we stick with the uh, current height that's allowed in, in our current zoning. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Matthews and Vice Mayor Myers. Um, are we now discussing the proposed amendment? I think that's correct. Or if there's any other or comments. It's the replacement motion. I guess that's what we're talking about. That's correct. Okay, well. I'm going to speak against it. I do think we need um, the master plan, big picture, with no specifics required. And I just want to point out, we have had in the past a downtown plan, a beach plan. Those don't say, downtown, you have to build a building of this height on this parcel. It's not that specific. It gives a framework. And then every project that comes along is reviewed independently and specifically within the context of the plan. I think that's what we need. The, the work has evolved from day one that it was built. It needs to be structurally sound and commercially successful, environmentally responsible, and contribute to the visitor experience. And I think what we have before us achieves that. So I'm going to be opposing the substitute motion. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'll chime in here. Uh, it's been a long day, so I'm trying to, uh, trying to keep comments brief, but um, I will be supporting the, uh, the substitute motion. I, I do believe that we have put together a very solid master plan, and that is what it is. It is a master plan for the wharf. As many people have mentioned today, that this is, you know, this sets a direction. It does not confirm exactly what is going to happen in any of the um, particular buildings that are in the plan. Um, those buildings may be smaller, they may be um, architecturally different um, than, you know, not requiring 40 feet. Um, so I, I think what, um, what we do by doing this is that we leave that ability for not only additional public comment and public involvement, but we also leave the flexibility for um, creating the kinds of spaces out there that I think we all hope will live on, you know, into the future. So, um, you know, the technology around green building, the technology around um, how uh, buildings are designed, the, the, the look and feel of some of the things that are being built around the Bay Area with regards to uh, refurbishing these, with these working wards. Um, I, you know, you think about the, um, you think about the um, Presidio in San Francisco and some of these other historic sites that are being uh, refurbished and redone. I mean, these are, these are national, um, you know, features now. These are places that people travel to come to. Um, Christie Field, all of these, these opportunities where we didn't tear it down, we didn't let it fall down because of neglect. Um, we didn't say, oh, it's okay to just sort of let it sort of fall into the ocean little bit by little bit. 
um, we acknowledge that we have new technology, we have new way of designing buildings, and we created spaces that people people enjoy and people people embrace. Um, so I, I think, you know, keeping in mind what we can do in the future and really acknowledging that um, this is a really important part of our infrastructure in the city and um, we need to be thoughtful about it. We need to be uh, opportunistic about it. We need to be visionary about it. And um, again, this will all play out again in multiple community meetings. Uh, and uh, as we get proposals and those come forward, we'll be able to shape these buildings. We'll be able to understand exactly what their impact will look like. Um, but at this time, I think it's premature to start limiting buildings. Um, and I think the main goal of this is that we need to get um, this uh, completed, get it to the Coastal Commission, um, and actually get, be ready to invest in the infrastructure, which is really the most important thing, as well as the economic um, revitalization of the wharf. Uh, I walk on the wharf every day. Um, it's gone. It, it's been it's been really rough since COVID hit, and um, I really, um, you know, I really hope that we decide to invest in the future and invest in the future of that uh, a, a wharf that people will experience in the future, which I think um, will be fitting with the environment and with the um, with the scenic resources. So um, I was I'm very glad to hear the Marine Sanctuary is, is supporting this as well. Um, the wharf is an amazing place to interpret the marine sanctuary as well as the history of Santa Cruz. So uh, those are my comments. I unfortunately will not be supporting the substitute motion, but um, I am interested in wrapping this up and setting the wharf on its new course. Thank you. Okay. If there's no further questions or comments, uh, why don't we go ahead and we'll take the vote on the substitute motion that was made by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Byers, and then if there's a need to, we can. Um, and then we'll, based on the outcome of that, we can um, continue moving forward with subsequent actions. So with that, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote on the substitute motion. And just to confirm, this is to accept it? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. um, Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? No. Brown? Aye. Holder? No. Watkins? No. Vice Mayor Myers? No. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that fails with uh, council members um, Byers, Brown, Mayor Cummings voting in favor, Matthews, Golder, Watkins, and Vice Mayor Myers voting opposed. And so we'll move on to the um, motion that was originally made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Watkins, uh, to accept the staff recommendations and also include the language amending the resolution as proposed by staff. I think that captures that correctly. So with that, um, we'll, I'll go to the clerk to call the roll call vote on the item. Um, Council Member Byers? No. Matthews? Yes. Brown? No. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with Council Members Matthews, Golder, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, Mayor Cummings voting in favor, Council Members Byers and Brown voting opposed. And I'll just say that, you know, as we move forward, I hope that I'm, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of opportunities for the community to weigh in on this. And so I think that when we get to these moments where we're discussing the different types of buildings that are going in, the heights, that there'll be further opportunity for the community to um, voice their opinions and we can take their opinions into account when we're making those decisions. But overall, I want to just thank all the staff and community members for mm -hmm. all of the work and support that's gone into getting us to this point. And I really look forward to us, you know, being able to apply for grants and really, um, you know, work towards preserving and maintaining our wharf. Thank you. Um, with, with that, I know that we were going to start. Um, we were going to start oral communications at seven o'clock. I do want to acknowledge that we have been sitting here for a pretty long time today, and I know that council members um, may need to take a break for a while. So why don't we reconvene? 
um, at 7.45, and that'll give us um, about a little bit over 45 minutes to um, take a break, and we'll start 7.45 with oral communications, followed by our evening item at 8.15. Okay. <clears throat> All right, if once council members are back, if you can turn your video on, we can go ahead and get started with oral communications and then move on to our last two evening items. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just get started with oral communications, and hopefully um, once we get started, we'll have a few of our other council members joining. So uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for your patience. Uh, we've had a long day of meetings, and so um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our evening session. Uh, next item on our agenda is oral communications. So for members of the public who are streaming in this meeting, if you would like to comment on items that were not on our agenda today during oral communications, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Um, if you're interested in addressing the council, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Once you've been called on, you'll have two minutes to address the council. And again, this is for items that were not on our agenda th today. Um, when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. Uh, please press star six on your phone to unmute yourself. We request that you clearly and, and slowly state your name before making comments so that we can accurately capture it into the meeting minutes. However, uh, it is not required. So with that, uh, if I could uh, yeah. take roll really quick. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So um, before we do that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Byers. Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? <clears throat> Council Member Brown. Okay, Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. So again, if uh, there are members of the public who would like to comment during oral communications, Now's the time to call in. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes. Hi, it's Kyle Davenport. Um, I am, I believe everyone's a leader in their own small and big ways and I uh, see the city council as the county leaders to me so I'm just here to talk about what I want to talk about um, homelessness and racism um, I believe both of these things stem from a mindset of categorization and I just wanted to get that into the minds of our leaders uh, I've studied this <laughs> for a long long time inside of myself and others around me and read and read and read about it and read philosophy from the last 3,000 years and leadership from the last 3,000 years um, of what has been written. I I think it all stems, comes down to categorization. So I'm asking our leaders to think about that and keep it in your minds. How can we stop um, as a community categorizing other people and uh, instead of manifesting negative qualities, <laughs> how can we manifest positive qualities and dream of those things and make them happen? Uh, acceptance, prosperity for all. Um, I believe we can all win in our individual unique ways. And if we focus on that, 
um, that it can happen for everyone. And uh, to me, it comes down to an individual mindset of integration, um, integrating wounds from the past, integrating left hemisphere and right hemisphere, um, <laughs> just having an integrated mindset. I think we all want integration on the outside. I think it starts on the inside of each of us individually. Um, that's my dream. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Tonight there was a peaceful and quite audible protest outside the house of volunteer police officer and right-wing activist Deborah Elston. A dozen or so activists with bullhorns braved the evening cold, expressing outrage and amazement. Elston had used her police position to issue citations to people living in RVs, resulting in numerous tows. Her hostility to homeless people is also clear as a next-door moderator and a Santa Cruz neighbors organizer. Last Monday, Huff received reports, that's Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, that on duty she drove her police vehicle into a man. The man was trying to photo her behavior to defend his vehicle against one of her unjustifiable tickets. After hitting the man with her police car, Elston then reportedly attempted to leave the scene. The man and his friends demanded she stay. When Elston's police friends arrived, they cited the man for false imprisonment and refused the man's request to cite Elston for a traffic accident. In the past year, Elson has issued over 200 tickets costing $6,700 to RV and vehicles in spite of shelter and place safety precautions as the COVID-19 pandemic grows worse. Driving homeless people onto the streets by ticketing and towing their vehicles is cruel and costly. It is also foolish and threatens not just the health of the poor outside, but that of the general public. Our police condone and defend this kind of abuse. It takes place under their authority. City Council funds these outrages. So get out your cameras, speak up for those in your community. It falls to us to oppose the perpetrators and support the victims. And thanks to the community for listening to me. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Uh, following up on that Amamutsen Coast Diaries letter, I still think the notion that planes flying at 10 to 20,000 feet would disturb the cultural ceremony stretches believability. I quote perhaps a different justification for a flight objection from the monument proclamation itself. Quote, other rights of way shall be authorized only if they are necessary for the care and management of the objects to be protected. Uh, unquote. Uh, perhaps that's a different way to go there in that letter of support. Uh, but in general, uh, I was uh, fascinated some by the Amamuts and Chairman Valentin Lopez's autobiography book title, Assimilation is Surrender. While there can be truth to that taken literally, America's cultural ideal is not the colonialist culture of Spain or Mexico. Americans should embody the uniquely special e pluribus unum concept that is now, anyway, uh, the most culturally accepting, diverse, successful, powerful, and long longest lasting democratic republic in history. Though many subcultures can and are largely accepted and preserved here, but accepting the American made a culture is needed for e pluribus unum to work. To me, a combative assimilation as surrender stance and denial of today's realities may be responsible for the extreme Native American mass poverty. While cultural identity has almost a religious reverence, the real-life consequences of differences in subcultures within the Meta culture are a reality, and those aren't all due to the old racism, sexism, homophobia, or their oppressions like the leftists would have us believe. Cultures are continuously invaded all the time, as the American original European culture continuously has been for decades and still is being uh, invaded now. By invaded, I mean not accepting the made a culture of speaking English, advocate social, advocating socialism, communism, or misusing parliamentary procedure of democracy to overthrow belief values like capitalism, private property, or not accepting separation of church and state. Uh, in that sense, I get it that cultural invasion is a most disturbing uh, event if it succeeds in destroying what, what was a well-functioning society, but without accepting the U.S. made a culture uniting different peoples, we are left with an endless, divided, warring tribalism, resentment, and dysfunction. Bye. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Jay Sarichi. I am a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz, and I'm very proud to present to you guys very briefly. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Mayors, and other councilors. Um, recently, a letter written by our police chief uh, came to my attention, and I'm deeply, deeply alarmed by it and the rogue vigilance that it seems to uh, promote and the notion that police officers in our community need vigilance, uh, rogue vigilance, uh, shooters from uh, hidden corners of our community to come out and protect our officers. I understand that this community has been tragically affected by uh, violence against police officers. Our community is, however, much more significantly impacted by violence against our marginalized community members namely our homeless community and other marginalized people uh, whom we share uh, land, space, and values with. Uh, it is within that vein that I beg the counselors to consider uh, specifically the recommendations from uh, lawyer Jay Rorty, who made some really con concrete, productive, constructive considerations and delivered those to you as an alternative, as a community representation of the values that we hold dear and the values that contrast apparently quite significantly the alarming uh, militarized uh, values that our police chief seems to be presenting to our community at this time. I really hope that we can take into consideration the scope greater than a few uh, leaders who've been given the mic and return the mic to our community uh, at this time of reconsidering the ways that uh, we here are policed and the ways here that we are uh, protected. Uh, thank you so much for your time and please uh, consider more deep reforms to um, the police as opposed to simple cosmetic reform. Thank you so much. Take care. Hi, my name is Chelsea Clore, and I'm a Santa Cruz resident, a homeowner, and a mother. Police accountability means that it needs to be easier to bring lawsuits against the police for misconduct. As written, the language is most, and most, is most too vague to actually increase the ability of people to bring those suits. I urge you to take seriously the very concrete suggestions made by Jay Rorty in the letter he sent to counsel. This current moment is not about trusting police to reform themselves. They can't. It's about reducing police presence and power in our communities and installing, funding, and constructing new systems of community safety that aren't rooted in histories of slavery. At a minimum, police should be accountable to a civilian review board with the power to independently investigate, discipline, and fire police officers and administrators. Chief Mills' recent blog post glorifying vigilantism and promoting a warrior cop mentality is disgusting and disturbing. I hope that we can all agree that a citizen training his laser rifle sights on a police officer and a suspect grappling for control of a knife is not actually a good example of the mindset a public should show towards police. If this is the mindset and narrative that permeates the department, there is little hope for approval, uh, approving. Have you already forgotten what happened in Kenosha? When two men were murdered there, their chief blamed them for their own deaths because they were out past curfew. This is who you are calling with your dog whistles, Chief. It's the Kyle Rittenhouses of our community. Their sheriff referred to citizens being arrested as garbage people. This is who you are associating yourself with, Andy Mills. Do you know who else comes running to your shrill screams of dog whistles? Father and son duo Travis and Gregory McMichael and their neighbor Roddy, Roddy Bryan. It's people like that. They are emboldened by those words. You need to stop. You need to do better. We are all counting on you, and you are failing. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Joan Peterson. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. I'm speaking about the policy, the, the police policy proposal. So I'd like to I'm going to I'm, I'm going to stop you because that's actually the next item on our agenda. This is oral communications where members of the public have an opportunity 
to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. So um, if this is regarding the policy, that's the next item. And so we just ask that you kindly wait until that item's heard and then we'll open it up for public comment. Okay, next caller, 9858. Uh, please press star six on your phone to unmute, and you'll have two minutes. Please press start. There you go. Hello. Last week, more vehicles have been towed. Thank you for putting more people onto the streets during the COVID crisis and now having absolutely no shelter and the rains are beginning. You kick everyone off the bench lands because you supposedly care about people getting flooded by being in a flood zone, yet you don't care about kicking them out of their tent shelter, forcing them to move while raining. And those who received no notice on the bench lands were asked to leave with no other shelter options. I know there's a lie being purported that there are 15 available beds in a supposed shelter program, but you have to go through a referral process. And right now they're currently backed up talking to individuals back from putting themselves into the referral process back from May. So this is not true. When you kick someone out of their tent and tell them to move during a COVID crisis, there are no other places to go. And, and this, this, what you're doing is pretending you care that there's a flood zone and people get flooded. If the rains come, they can move. The amount of money that you're spending on fencing off the city could be more wisely spent in helping those individuals. Continuing to fence off the city reminds me of Trump building the wall. And the number of executive also orders remind me of Trump. Additionally, um, Deborah Elston, Hit a, uh, she's in the volunteer police program. She hit an individual with the police car. She should be fired from the program immediately. <laughs> Lastly, please fire fascist anti Elspeth Martin Bernal. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other members of the public who would like to comment during oral communications, I'm going to go ahead and close oral communications, and we can move on to our next item of business. <clears throat> All right, so the next item of business uh, this evening is item number 24, uh, policy changes related to racial equity and social justice in the criminal justice system. And we have presenter tonight, uh, Chief Andy Mills. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now's the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Uh, we will have a presentation of the, or of the item by staff, followed by questions from council, and then we'll take public comment and return to council for action and deliberation. And um, just to, to get us started, um, I just wanna reflect back on you know what's been happening throughout this year. And so shortly after the murder of George Floyd on May 29th, Chief Mills reached out to me uh, to inform myself and other council members, I would imagine about an action that was gonna take place that Saturday. Um, and that was what ended up being an action that was organized by Joy Flynn, where members of the public came out. And it was the first 
kind of call to action to acknowledge uh, the mistreatment of African Americans in our community, well, in our society as a whole, and a need to be begin, um, you know, and, and continue with ensuring that there was equal justice and equal rights for um, African Americans in our nation as a whole, and to begin discussions in our community. Shortly after that action, um, the summer was followed by numerous uh, protests and actions that took place around the city. Um, but it was really clear to myself and Chief Mills the need to engage with our community and begin to hear the perspectives of the African Americans within our community and to begin to address policy changes that would help better the lives of marginalized people within our community. Um, we held ex numerous, I'd, I'd say from June 3rd through September, um, we held numerous Zoom meetings with the public. Um, we held numerous meetings with members of the black community to really understand what was impacting them, especially since this discussion was around Black Lives Matter. And if we're going to say that we want to support Black Lives Matter and that's something that we care about, then it was really important for us to reach out to the black community and hear their voices and ensure that their voices were at the front of this conversation. Um, I'd want to thank uh, Council Member Watkins, who joined us early on in many of these meetings as well, listening to the black community uh, to hear their concerns. And I want to thank all the community members and staff who, well, the community members who have been working with us and trying to figure out ways that we can move forward together. And I want to thank Chief Mills for, you know, being open to listening to the community and trying to bring forward changes that can, you know, it's, it's not everything, but it's a start. And I think that this is something that we hope we can continue working on moving forward. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Mills uh, to start the presentation for this evening's item. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, council members. Uh, with me, I also have uh, several people uh, representing uh, parts of the community. Uh, we have uh, Joy Flynn and Taj Leahy, Reggie Sanders, um, Stevens, excuse me, uh, uh, Brenda Griffin from the NAACP, and then Joy Slotsky. Uh, these are just a few of the people who really helped uh, drive this forward. Uh, but I really am indebted to them, and they'll be uh, adding into this conversation uh, when appropriate uh, uh, as part of this conversation. And I just really wanted to take a couple seconds and thank uh, the mayor, Justin Cummins, uh, for his uh, assistance and help and leadership uh, to help uh, over a sustained period of time to help drive this forward, uh, including even editing uh, the staff report that went out and, and so forth. Um, and Martine Watkins was there from day one also. And so I really want to thank uh, the support from not only you two, but all the council members who have contacted me both privately and publicly to offer assistance and, and even sometimes cheerily behind the scenes. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I do believe that this is an opportunity for us uh, to begin the process. I'm gonna ask for three things today. Um, one is to affirm and support our policy amendments at the SBPD, which are items uh, 1 through 16. And then two, to direct staff to incorporate policy changes uh, at the uh, council policy changes, items B, uh, 1 through 4. And then provide direction and support uh, to the chief of police to further items C, 1 through 3. And uh, we'll break those down uh, a little bit as we move on. <clears throat> Hey, Chief, you know, I wanted, I wanted to ask, are we, are we supposed to be seeing your screen? Uh, not yet. Okay. Um, okay. Why don't you check? Sorry I about think that, that uh, Bonnie is, uh, is, I think that's ready to go, so you can turn that on at any time, so that would probably help uh, some of the council members see uh, what's going on. Uh, you can advance to the next slide, please. Um, it has been said that culture eats policy for breakfast. In my experience uh, in policing, that is certainly the case. So the idea behind the policy amendments that you see here is to chisel some of these policies in stone so that they cannot be altered without going through city council or changing law. And that's the purpose for this been broken up as you see it. And uh, we've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this with multiple community members, and we think that this is the best way to go. This is an effort to change and influence the culture of policing here in Santa Cruz 
and hopefully in other places uh, as well as people watch what we do here in Santa Cruz. Could you go ahead and forward, please? I first of all, I wanna uh, congratulate and, uh, and think about what council has already done. Uh, you've already uh, removed our ability to do predictive policing and prohibited face recognition technology by council edict. And I think that's important because it was the first step in a series of steps to make sure that we're policing in a very just manner here in Santa Cruz. So I applaud the city council for that. But I also want us to recognize that this is a process. It is not an end step in, in achieving equity in justice here in Santa Cruz. As the mayor pointed out, we have met with multiple community members multiple times in multiple venues to get as much input as we felt that we could. Some of the input you agree with, some of it you don't. But the point was to listen and to thoughtfully consider what can be done. On September 22nd, I posted online and we did through all the social media account uh, to Joyce Blaschke, the, um, uh, the proposals that you see today to get feedback from people, and we got plenty of feedback in that way also. I think the important thing here is to understand that uh, this is a first step effort in a long series of steps. But we're getting pushed back, as we expected, from both extremes. We have people in Santa Cruz who are commenting that there is no such thing as bias or racism in Santa Cruz. And we get people on the other extreme saying that this doesn't go nearly far enough and they want to be able to noodle out every word uh, that is being presented. So this is an effort to be in the middle and to push forward now and get some things enacted so that we can improve uh, so, uh, racial equity here in Santa Cruz. And I think Joy Flynn had a comment about this as well. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. I just want to say thank you for having us here today, and um, I'll, I will chime in as, as needed. Um, but the main thing I just want to reiterate um, and, and stand behind what Chief Mills is saying, because we've been in multiple conversations, and really what this is about is um, setting a precedent for our community and a precedent for change, a culture change. And this is something that is going to take time. And you as a council have already taken some of those steps with um, eradicating the per predictive policing. And so I also wanna thank you for that. And this is a continued conversation while we're asking for specific things tonight, um, there will be things that will be uncovered as um, the paradigm shifts and as the culture needs to change. And again, this is really working towards a culture change within how um, policing has been over hundreds of years. And um, why not start and have that example come from Santa Cruz? Thanks, Joy. I, I go ahead, Bonnie, if you'd advance. Um, let me uh, start out this presentation by telling you how proud I am of the men and women who serve our community. Uh, we have some wonderful people, some very thoughtful people who I can say were partners in this process. Uh, some were part of our committee, some use of force experts sat down, it was a report over policy, and the POA also, the Police Officers Association also uh, chimed in to make sure that uh, this was gonna be done correctly working with us and uh, all of us uh, rowing in the same direction. While we say that, we also recognize that each of us, each and every one of us holds personal bias. And we wanna make sure that we're doing everything, everything we can to reduce that. We also recognize that there's a need for racial equity and justice in the justice system and the healthcare system and the education system and housing and employment, this is our slice of the pie, what we believe we can influence. And so our goal is to uh, push this forward uh, together. We truly believe that we are safer as a community and we are safer as a profession when we, when we bring the levels of tension down. 
and there's plenty of tension between the black community and the police. And so if we can reduce that tension and that hypervigilance, we honestly believe that makes all of us safer, including our police officers working the street. We also recognize that we police in a very violent society and that sometimes our people have to get con are confronted by things that they don't want to be part of. Uh, just this last, in the last couple of weeks, we've had a police officer and a firefighter kicked in the face while trying to help people who are having a medical uh, uh, episode. So we do police in a situation that is violent. We expect that we are going to have those violent encounters. What we really want to do is be able to de-escalate everything we can possibly do uh, to prevent uh, people from being injured. Having said that, I think it's also important that I need to stay clearly in the front side. Not everything can be de-escalated. De and we wanna make sure that we're doing all that we can through time talk and tactics, through uh, interpersonal skills to make sure that we are uh, reducing that. Bonnie, if you'd advance, please. The process that we use is we listen to thousands of Santa Cruzans who are marching for change, engaging people in conversation in those, some of those marches, as well as in the community meetings afterward. We met with many members of the black community, certainly not all, but one thing I discovered and learned, I'm sure that everybody else already knew this, is that this is not a monolithic group. There are many different people with many different views, many different desires. And so we try to look at consistent themes through the information. And when you identify those themes, those commonalities, and when it falls within the sphere of what we think we can do as a police agency, that's when we decided to uh, make the changes that we thought we could make. And just again, wanted to recognize a lot of people who are involved in this, and there's some special people uh, that you can see listed here. Uh, not listed is Ashton Davis from the New York Jets, and Coach uh, Weems from the Santa Cruz Warriors, as well as uh, Chris Murphy and many others. So again, I can't thank you enough. Uh, go ahead, Bonnie. Can I say this clearly for everybody? Black Lives Matter. There's no uh, equivocation or minimization of that statement. It's just important for us to say it clearly, pure and simply, Black Lives Matter. You know, I'm reminded of a story that I heard just recently of a, of a man who was talking about Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount. And when he said, blessed are the poor, he didn't, you know, quickly say, oh, blessed are the middle class and the wealthy also. It was blessed are the poor. They were the ones who were hurting at that time. This is what's going on with the black community in my estimation. And so our responsibility is to gather around that community, do whatever we can to uplift that community, work with that community, and, and make sure that there's inclusion. Um, and if you look over the history of policing, from 400 years ago, some of the first police officers were actually hired as people to track down runaway slaves. And then you go through the Jim Crow era where policing developed even more power through the enforcement of Jim Crow laws. And then when people walked over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, who were they met by? The, pe the police. And when um, Brown versus Board of Education, the first uh, child to be integrated into a white school, who could have protect her? Well, it was U.S. Marshals because the police wouldn't do it. And I can go on and on with examples, but the point is things that have to change, things are changing, I truly believe, but these are things that we can do to change even more and, and in a better way that truly is inclusive. Go ahead and advance, please. Many members uh, mentioned to us the eight can't wait campaign. And uh, I know that the mayor was going to uh, chime in on this one as well. So uh, if, if you had some things you wanted to mention, uh, Justin. Yeah, no, you know, one of the things I really wanted to mention was that, you know, when these came before us, we, you know, we listened to the community as a whole. And this was one of the items that was brought before us um, shortly after, again, the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, was one of the templates that we were able to, to use as a starting point. And, you know, as we learned, there's a number of these items that the Santa Cruz police had already been implementing, but quickly and shortly after um, we, reviewing these, there were um, additional um, items from this 
that we'll discuss later on this evening, but, but where changes were also made. And so, for example, the banning of the chokehold was something that came shortly after. Um, and as we'll listen to tonight, there's a number of other um, items on here that were, if they hadn't been implemented already, uh, were taken into consideration and were either acted upon or still under consideration. Thank you. So this was a template, and we could look at these and have something visual that we could take a, that we could study and see what others had done, and then see whether or not this would fit with what our community needed. And so, go ahead and advance, please. So these are all of the th all of the items that we have considered and are moving forward. Now it's color coded for you. The items in black are things that we felt that we could do at the department. And that, uh, and that we could get done fairly quickly and in a permanent fashion. The ones in orange are things that we're gonna ask you to take action on, to give uh, direct and approved changes to city uh, policy. And the ones in yellow are the ones that uh, you're gonna provide direction on uh, to me. And then the one in green is what's already been taken care of. And by the way, if somebody would like a copy of this PowerPoint, that can be provided to them uh, after the uh, after the uh, session. So these are what we're going to go through one at a time. Uh, it'll be a little bit arduous, but uh, I think that it will uh, it'll be helpful to to thoroughly understand that. Uh, Bonnie, please go ahead. Uh, you can go through two. This is to affirm and support policy amendments by SDPD. Step one is we ban the carotid restraint. And the reason we did that is because it can slip easily from a control carotid restraint hold, as you can see in the picture, to a choke hold. People just don't stand there still when you're trying to apply this. You're normally fighting with somebody. So the risk became too great of doing significant injury to people for the minimal positive effect that it could have. So we banned it and then incurred. Uh, Santa Cruz police officers can no longer use the carotid hold restraint. Uh, Joy, I think you were going to comment on this as well. I just wanted to say this came um, from a direct result from the action that I held on May 30th. And um, I, it just was something that happened really quickly. As you can see, that action was on May 30th, and then this went into effect on June 3rd. Great. Uh, Bonnie, could you get in advance? Second thing that was done is we prohibited no-knock search warrants. Um, think of the Breonna Taylor case in Louisville. And uh, that was a no-knock search warrant served at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, our department has been good at not using them for a long period of time. However, we're making a formal policy that is prohibited. The only uh, exception to that, and only I can approve it, if it's a bona fide hostage situation, where we need to make a uh, entry without making notice so to protect the hostage. Uh, unlikely to occur, but we still do need that flexibility to do that. So in effect, all no knock search warrants were, uh, were pro are prohibited. And Taj, you were going to make a, a comment on that, I think. Yeah, this was a, thank you, uh, Chief, and thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, this one was really important to me because I think there's, you know, from where I grew up, there was a lot of people who are afraid of these um, police forces coming in, and there's a, a fair amount of trauma that happens in the black community from these type of events, even if they're not witnessing or experiencing it themselves, not just the black community, actually, many communities. Um, and so this was, this was a great thing to be talking about with you all, and I'm thankful that, that we have this now. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and advance if you would, Bonnie. Uh, we've curtailed dynamic entries on search warrants. A dynamic entry, and you see the door knocker there, is when the police run up to a door, use a heavy object to burst open the door, and then they run out uh, into the building uh, with weapons uh, pointed to, uh, most often, to prevent the flushing of, uh, of drugs. Um, there are some reasons for this to take place but very, very limited. And so what we've done is we've curtailed it by making a deputy chief of police or higher approve uh, and, and authorize this before it takes place. Uh, and we're telling them they need to use other less intrusive tactics. 
And, uh, and so our officers are prepared to do that. Our officers are doing that currently. And then the second part of that is that a uniformed police officer with a marked vehicle will assist on every search warrant so that there are no mistakes as to whether or not this is the police. They will be visible uh, whenever possible. And um, so uh, this is a important uh, step forward. Remember the ICE raid that took place um, on Windsor Street uh, last year. Uh, that was a dynamic entry search warrant at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, we don't see a reason for that, especially on a paper crime of any kind. So our thought is a deputy chief will have to approve it and, um, and that will curtail almost all uh, dynamic entries. Uh, please advance. Warning prior to shooting. Now, whenever feasible, the officer will uh, shall, prior to use of force, make a reasonable effort to identify themselves as police officers and to warn that deadly force may be used. Uh, our policy, policy 300, is now up on our website, and anybody can go and inspect that policy to make sure uh, that uh, we are doing what we say we have done. That policy was amended just recently, and the way we use this is it has to go through Lexapol to actually get published. Then it comes back to us, and then we can post it. So it's posted uh, this uh, this week, and it is now on the um, um, website. A couple of things that are interesting in this policy, I think, that are important to point out. One is it discusses the proportionality of the use of force. That um, if you're if you're dealing with a person that you're and they're resisting, that your force your force must be proportionate to that level of force that they're resisting. And the second thing is that just fear alone is not enough to qualify uh, for um, uh, for the use of, of a high level of force. So there has to be actual fear that you can articulate, and uh, and we'll go into that in a little bit. If you advance, please. We are prohibiting shooting from or at moving vehicles. Now, it's not 100% clean, and I'll explain why. First of all, we demand that officers shall, not should, move out of the path of vehicles instead of discharging their firearm at the vehicle. An officer can only discharge that firearm when no other reasonable means available to avert the threat. So let's just stop right here for a second. The reason we left this in is because what if you're that officer who's pinned up against the wall and a person is gunning it and you really feel like you're going to be uh, killed? There has to be something you can do. Or, and we, I have seen this before, I've lost colleagues who have been run over by people who intentionally hit them with vehicles. If that's the only way you can defend yourself, uh, I will not do anything uh, to increase the mortality of our officers. So um, we want them to be able to avert the threat, but they shall move out of the path of the vehicle uh, if they at all possibly can. Or if the person is using deadly force other than the vehicle directed at the officer. If you're somebody's doing a drive by on you, uh, we give our officers the authority to shoot back. And then lastly, uh, they will not uh, shoot at a vehicle uh, in an attempt to disable the vehicle. Uh, the only exception to that is if somebody is using the vehicle to inflict mass casualties. An example of that is Nice, France, where a terrorist drove into a crowd and, and injured scores of people and killed many, as well as other places that that has happened in the United States. So those are the exceptions to that. Uh, and all the shoulds in this paragraph have been changed to shall in the new policy, which has been posted. So just to make that uh, perfectly clear to everybody. Uh, Chief, Don, if you, anybody want to jump in on that? I don't want to. Yeah, go ahead, I just wanted to say that this this protects uh, officers and it also protects citizens. Because when I go to a march, one of the things that I'm thinking about now is the times when people have been run over by by people trying to murder them, and so it makes me a little bit it makes me feel safer if I know that you guys can use deadly force if need be. So this is for everyone. And Andy, I'm glad to hear that you changed the language from uh, should to shall. That's very important. Thank you, Brenda, and that is correct. It has been changed. Um, uh, go ahead and uh, move forward with the next slide, please. 
uh, required de-escalation. Uh, this has been a very heavy focus for our department uh, for uh, several years. And in the top left corner of the photograph, which you can see is a little pin that says D with a lightning bolt and an E next to it. That means that the officer has successfully de-escalated a situation where a high level of force could have been used. And these are lapel pins that they can wear as a sign that they have de-escalated. We do training every year. Uh, we also uh, have equipped every vehicle with the equipment needed to de-escalate uh, rather than use lethal force. This is important. And now our policy has a separate section that talks about specifically uh, officers uh, are, are to de-escalate de uh, whenever possible. Um, and then also, we also take a look at monthly videos uh, through our patrol officers, uh, you know, through TikTok and, and uh, Instagram, where they assess other incidents that have taken place around the country and talk about how they might have been able to de-escalate that situation uh, without using force. And with the picture here is an example of a de-escalation that took place uh, down, at, down at the wharf some time ago. Uh, this is a pretty busy slide, and uh, this was uh, done with the uh, consultation of our uh, use of force experts. And um, one of the, you'll see a couple things in here. I won't go into every detail on the slide, but you can study it uh, on your own later. But the intensity of conflict goes up, and the uh, this is a uh, it's not really a step process; it's more of a fusion. So as the behavior of the person escalates, the level of force that an officer can use escalates all the way up to uh, potentially life-threatening uh, use of force. We want to do be as in number one as often as we can, which is to gain compliance with people or to use uh, minimal levels of force. But sometimes that is not the case. You might have to go to medium level of force or a substantial level of force, be, uh, depending on what's happening. But you can also see that we're talking with our folks consistently about de-escalation and de-escalating these conflicts and driving that use of force back down. That you, it, just because it goes up doesn't mean it can't come back down. And we feel very strongly about that, and our officers do as well. But uh, we need to, need to point out that the use of force is not static. You don't go from point A to point B to point C to point uh, D. Uh, you, you, um, it can go from one to five very quickly, and uh, if the threat uh, warrants that. But our expectation is, is that they will do everything they can to use the lowest amount of force necessary uh, to complete the task that they've been assigned. Um, if you advance, please. Um, Duty to intercede. This has its own section now in our policy. And uh, our little mantra is if you see it, you own it. No longer can an officer stand by and say, well, it wasn't me. Um, I wasn't part of it. If you're there and you see it, you own it. And our policy says that you shall intervene when another person has used excessive force. And, um, and, that, they're, and that they are to report that excessive force uh, to a supervisor including the decision-making process that they have to go through, which is, do I want to go against my colleagues or in a potentially risk up to and including termination uh, from the police department if it was a serious enough event? And Reggie Stevens, I know you're on the, on the line here and you were going to comment on this. Hello? You're there, Reggie. Do you hear me? Yep. Uh, definitely. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Mills, for having me, Santa Cruz Council and Mayor Cummings. Um, I definitely want to talk on this because me being living in Santa Cruz for so many years, I've been in a situation like this uh, several times. And one time I came out on the end of it where I felt that when it happened to me, I didn't have any more hope or faith in the Santa Cruz Police Department. And um, when the situation happened, it was just one of those things like you felt helpless that someone that knew me basically act like they didn't know me in the situation. They could have helped me in that situation. Now, on the flip side of that, as I went on with my career, and if you don't know, I played professional football for the New York Giants and went to Cabrillo College, Santa Cruz High. Um, there was another situation that came up 
and basically a judge was intervened and, and was able to help me in a situation that allowed me to go on and help uh, me to get my career going and help out. So that basically gave me hope again. So I think this is very important, and I think it's, there's something that should be done because I understand there's a code, but sometimes that code can leave a person in a bad situation. Oh, thank you, Reggie. Um, all right, moving on to the next slide, please. Independent oversight, uh, the city manager has approved this contract, and so our independent oversight is Mike Giannacco. Uh, Mike is a former U.S. Civil, uh, U.S. attorney in the Civil Rights Division in Los Angeles. He's nationally recognized as an expert on law enforcement reform and accountability systems. He already published his first report uh, to city council. And from there, uh, it'll be, as you'll see later, it'll be posted to our, um, our transparency portal should that be approved by council. And so uh, we're happy to have Mike on board and, uh, and uh, he's a brilliant uh, jurist. And I think that uh, this is very good. What he essentially does is takes our investigations, looks at them for fairness and objectivity, gives us feedback on the quality of our investigations. And if there's anything else we should have done or should do, he guides us through the process. Uh, and then he also takes a look at the discipline uh, that was imposed if something that was sustained. And, uh, and so we're happy to have Mike aboard and uh, that has already been approved. Uh, part of this though is to make sure that we're having discussions with the other chiefs in the county to make sure that we're all on the same page. And so I've had that, con that conversation with, uh, with several of the chiefs in the county and they're doing their things that are, that are consistent with their communities and uh, but I know that they're all uh, very interested in having further conversation and working together and being consistent in how we do this uh, throughout the county. So I applaud my colleagues for being thoughtful about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, Ty, this is all you, man, because you're the one, this was your idea. All right, well, um, I'll say that there was a time where I witnessed a situation with an officer um, kind of harassing a young guy and and i sat and i watched and um i got the officer's card and and most officers um have cards on them and it, it occurred to me that it would have been great if uh there would be something on the card that just said if you have a complaint or even a compliment here's exactly where you go in order to do that because i don't know that um all community members know that they can actually file a complaint when something happens that's sort of out of sorts um, and so I say, hey, why don't we just put this information on the back of every card? And it's just a really simple thing, but it may actually help uh, help someone's life. And so that's that's what this is. Um, just trying to get a little bit more uh, transparency happening and a little bit more uh, uh, feedback as well. And accountability. That's the word I was looking for. Thanks. Yeah, take it one of the crowd. Um, so uh, this will be put on all of our business cards. And so when we make uh, contact with people in the community, whether it's a citation or a, a radio call, we can hand a card. And our policy is that officers must identify themselves uh, by name and badge number should someone ask. But we, we want to be more proactive with that. And that's the purpose of this. Uh, next slide, please. Implicit bias training for all staff members. We have now... Um, I uh, presented implicit bias training to all of our staff members, and uh, and the next step will be to continue with uh, different forms of implicit bias training. This was based on the uh, book by Dr. Everhart. Uh, we went through uh, multiple police departments, and it's now post-certified course, police officers, standards, and training uh, course uh, on procedural justice, which leads to uh, police legitimacy. And so we've already accomplished that. Uh, go ahead. 72-hour release of body-worn cameras in critical incidents uh, when we can. State law on this, by the way, is 45 days. So our goal is to get these, to get these videos out within 72 hours. Uh, it does depend on who controls the evidence. Sometimes we don't necessarily control all the evidence, whether it's the DA's office or a different jurisdiction locally. But uh, when we have the control over it uh, and it won't harm the investigation, uh, we want to release this within 72 hours and make sure that, uh, that we're doing this. We had an interesting discussion on this this week with this group, and that is, well, what gets released? An edited version or an unedited version? Well, unedited version could be hours of videotape. Uh, so, and what does edit mean? 
Uh, if it's a juvenile, by law, we have to edit it. We have to blow their face. Uh, and so they can't be identified. So it won't be necessarily unedited, but I think that there are things we can do to make sure it's transparent. That's transparent. Then, and that's one of the things that we can have a discussion about after this. Go ahead, Taj. Well, yeah, this is one of those situations where, you know, we needed to really go back and forth about this because my first thought was, well, why not, why not 48 hours? You know, why do we have to wait so long? And, and you know, it was because there is, there is some sort of editing that does need to happen if it's blurring out a kid's face or something like that. Um, and, and it just shows that we, you know, we need to have this partnership because in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, this is how it can be. But in reality, it, sometimes it needs to be a little, a little bit shifted. And the whole intent behind putting this in here is that we have unfortunately seen police departments uh, throughout the country not actually give all of the footage. And so we're, we're trying to finesse this and get to a place where the footage that comes out can be seen by the average person and know actually what's going on. Um, so there's not anything shady happening. It's, it's pretty much that simple. And we concur with that. So we will get together and make this happen in a thoughtful way and maybe make policy that can come out so that uh, everybody can see that and be transparent. Uh, knows what is the, what's the normal turnaround time? It can be, de it depends. Um, like one of the things we talked about in our group is I've got one person who does this. If that person's not available, they're on, out of town, then I'm, it's, it's going to slow me down. Um, so we have to be able to uh, do this in a reasonable way, but it will take at least 24 hours to put the body-worn camera footage together uh, to uh, put that information out. You had said 45 days, I think, normally. Well, by law, we now have to put it out in 45 days without an extension by the courts. So 72 hours is a very short turnaround time, so thank you. Uh, moving forward to examine and adjust hiring practices. You know, once you start looking at the things that we do, um, you start scratching your head. And so there's a few things in our hiring practices that can be barriers to people uh, trying to get on police departments. For instance, um, uh, poor credit barriers. Now that was originally done to prevent corruption. But uh, you know, when my kids went to college, the first thing they got in the mail when they got to college was a credit card offer from a, you know, from a local bank. And of course, what do you think the kid did as soon as they got to college? They ran up that credit card and came home and mom and dad, I'm in trouble, I've got this credit card and we paid it off for them, but made them pay us back. Well, there's a lot of that don't have that ability. Um, and so that's one of the things we can take a look at is why is there poor credit? Uh, were they being, can be in a completely irresponsible buying boats and, you know, or was it they, were they putting school on their credit cards? So those are some of the things that we can do and take a look at to reduce that barrier. One of the things we've found in our policy is that uh, you, that uh, branding was prohibited. Um, well, who gets brands? You know, you see on the, in, the, in the NFL, Reggie, some of your old colleagues um, had uh, the uh, alpha uh, um, tattoos that were brands. Well, we don't see a good reason uh, to have that prohibition. So we're taking that out of our policy if that could give us one extra person who may be a person of color. And um, we are uh, going to now prohibit. And uh, Taj, did you bring this up? Uh, the excessive force one, no. I did. Okay, go ahead, Joy. <laughs> Uh, it's just is very important to me that um, people coming in from different uh, agencies that might, might be on um, probation or have been fired due to use of excessive force are not allowed to be um, brought on to the Santa Cruz County, the Santa Cruz Police Department. And so um, this is something that I uh, discussed with Chief Mills about making sure that um, this is something that uh, Andy, that Chief knows you said that you wouldn't do anyway, but I wanna make sure that it's also um, a policy within the, with the council that we make sure that even somebody who is under investigation for use of excessive force is not allowed um, to be brought on to, as, as a police officer to the um, police department. And this isn't just for the, the, the citizens, it's also um, for the safety of the police officers um, that they would be working with. We have a volatile um, 
um, partner that you're working with that um, might use excessive force, it puts the police officer um, in danger as well as the community in danger. Okay, great. Um, and then, uh, and then the last part of that is, you know, we won't be doing that. By the way, um, there will be there is written policy on that um, that uh, we will not hire people who have excessive force from other locations. And uh, and then we're, uh, the whole goal of recruiting uh, to hire people is through community policing, de-escalation, and diversity recruitment videos. Uh, go ahead and advance, please. Increased transparency. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, all of our CPRAs, our California Public Records Request Act uh, requests are posted to our portal when they're not confidential in nature. Uh, go ahead and advance, please. Um, up to this point, SCPD in the past has published uh, stop data, but we've actually published citation data, uh, not stop data. So because of AB 953, we will have to um, uh, publish starting in uh, 2022, uh, all of the stops that we make. And the first report would be out, uh, we'd be due in April of 2023. Uh, here in the county, we've all talked about it. We're trying to move that up, that timetable up uh, to as early as uh, in the early part of 2021. So hopefully we can get that done. Uh, but that is, there is a cost associated with that that we're all working on together with that comment. And then uh, create a recruitment video. I think this was the mayor had yeah, talked about this. I know, Justin, if you wanted to uh, pitch in on this. Sure, I guess the comment I'd make is that, um, you know, one of the things that has come up in these conversations is just how recruitment is going down. And I know councils heard about some of the troubles that the Santa Cruz Police Department has had with recruiting more officers, and one thought is that you know if we're moving in this direction of having a you know very inclusive, diverse police department that is really trying to ensure equal protection of all citizens under the law. That it's really important that we uh, communicate this when we're trying to recruit. And so um, one thought is that you know if we can really demonstrate the desire for our public safety department to change um, the way that it's conduct conducting public safety and really trying to appeal to a broader, more diverse audience that creating some kind of recruitment video that really demonstrates um, how our police officers are trying to make a difference and make a change and, and really highlighting the good work they do in our community could maybe help to um, increase recruitment and um, attract more people to our police department. Thank you. Uh, as you can might imagine, uh, there are some costs associated with a lot of these and we've cut pretty much what we can out of our budget. Um, what we're going to do is try to find pieces of our budget where we can move forward with each of these, like for instance, the business cards, reprinting those, uh, a video, there are a couple of other uh, cost items. We're gonna try to take those out of our current budget. If not, then we'll come back to council uh, with a budget adjustment at some other time, but that won't be right now. Uh, move forward, please. And then the last part of this particular section is uh, we have changed the policy from immediate threat uh, to immediate threat versus imminent threat. So an officer may use deadly force to protect him or, him, or, him or herself or others from what he or she reasonably believes to be an immediate threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. And the word immediate threat means a person has a present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause death or serious bodily injury. Um, this was a pretty big change. And, uh, and uh, um, we had many discussions about this uh, internally, but uh, we believe that uh, uh, this is a good change as part of the Sean uh, Alt lawsuit. And uh, we believe it's the right thing to do. And it's also consistent with the Supreme Court decision. So we believe that we're on a good track there. Um, that may not seem like a big deal to a lot of people, but I can tell you it's a big deal to your police officers. And we wanna make sure that they are, um, uh, understand that and, and they do. So uh, let's move forward. Council action directs staff to incorporate policy changes to council policies, uh, items B, um, one through three. Uh, change the standard of public safety unit IA findings. 
and um, and uh, go ahead and advance. At the suggestion of the independent auditor and the NAACP from the university, uh, change the evidentiary standard from clear and convincing to preponderance of evidence. And it will essentially mean this. In order to sustain an allegation against a police officer, you would have to have uh, almost the evidence, in my mind, of uh, conviction in court. Whereas the preponderance of evidence would be more like a civil suit. You're weighing the evidence to see which tips uh, to, uh, uh, to what one would believe. So in other words, 51%, you may sustain that allegation. Now, if it's 50, only 51%, uh, then your discipline may be adjusted as a result of that. It is the same standard, by the way, that is used by the rest of the city uh, and the city government. It's also the same standard used by most of policing in California. We did an informal poll of police chiefs all over the state, and every single one of them came back as preponderance of evidence. And effectually, it's kind of been what we've been doing anyway. Uh, so, uh, and the POA uh, supported this. Uh, so that is a, a pretty big change. Any thoughts from the panel on that? Anybody? Okay. Uh, go ahead and move forward, please. The uh, controlled use of military surplus equipment uh, in the city. Uh, this policy would mean that all of the 1033 program or the military surplus equipment being requested would have to go through city council. It ensures that the purpose of the equipment would be conformed to the standards of city council. I believe it would bring greater transparency to the acquisition process uh, that, uh, that would be helpful in terms of making sure that it's in line with what this community expects of us. I'd like to say something about that. Um, really to speak frankly, this speaks to the militarization of the police department, which all over the nation people have talked about. Um, and this would make it just one more step so that instead of the police department just saying, oh, we're going to go get this really big crazy thing, um, that it actually has to go through council first. And so that's why this one is, is kind of important. It may seem a little small, but it could help in the larger picture. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and advance, please. And then we're going to publish our, uh, PA, our public uh, um, standards unit findings uh, to the city uh, council and to the community. So it used to be a confidential memorandum the names will be stripped out to comply with the police officer bill of rights. And then it'll be posted to the transparency portal. And it would say something like this. Officer Mills uh, was accused of doing, I won't say, my, won't say the name, but Officer A was accused of doing such and such. And it was investigated. Uh, here's what the findings were. Sustained, not sustained, exonerated, or uh, unfounded. And, uh, and then that will go on the website for everybody to see. Um, according to law, we cannot give the names or the discipline uh, associated with that person, but uh, this is a, I believe, a significant step in accountability and transparency. Uh, moving forward, um, provide direction support to the chief of police for further items. Uh, one more step, please. Uh, we're asking you to pass the discriminatory reports to Law Enforcement Act that will be coming up in the next uh, session right after this. San Francisco has already done this. And, you know, uh, some people ask, well, why, why is this necessary? I can give you three examples off the top of my head in the last year and a half or so where um, people have called in based on a person's color. One was in front of Forever 21. Somebody called in and said there's two black men creating a disturbance. And so Rick Martinez and I were together. We, I think we had just grabbed lunch. We walked over there and we said we would handle this call because we knew what this was. There were two guys that were selling CDs and had shirts on that said, end white slavery now. Um, nicest fellows on the planet doing absolutely nothing wrong. There was no doubt in my mind that was based on race. First of all, by the description that was given out first. Uh, there was another call that went out not too long ago where there was a, uh, a quote unquote black man walking down the street in the Upper West Side. Um, and that's all the call was. There's a third call that went out. There's a Mexican man standing next to a car. 
not trying the doors, not looking in the car, not under the car, standing next to a car. Those are the kind of calls that cannot continue to take place that puts our people of color in a bad spot, nor puts our police officers in a bad spot for having to confront that. What good can come of that for either side? And that's what just creates that hyper vigilance on both sides. So uh, this would be a good step in the first direction. I don't think we can quantify how many calls we get, but it certainly is not unusual. Um, go ahead and advance, please. Improve, improve racial diversity and equity training. Mayor, did you want to cover this one? Sure. Um, as, as someone who came in and as someone who has done a lot of work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, there's been a lot of advancements in this kind of training, and there's been a lot of advancements in the types of trainings that, that are available. And having experienced um, different trainings throughout the community, um, um, I thought it was good that maybe we start really looking at um, the, the type of diversity training that we have for our officers, for our staff, and we really um, maybe consider whether it, we need to update or uh, consider um, just you know, improving the quality of the training that we receive. I think that um, the training that we receive is good, but I also think that there are other people out there. I've heard from members of the community a desire to, you know, consider whether there are different people who might be able to conduct this training, the frequency of the training as well, and so whether or not we need to consider um, really reevaluating the type of diversity and equity training that we have, and to see if there's a need to improve that. Thank you, and then we're currently searching for a vendor to present some of that, and uh, we'll, we'll evaluate that and then bring it back. And if you move to the next one, and I know that uh, Brenda has some questions that others have given her that she may wanna ask uh, at, at towards the end here, so I think that'll be important for uh, other panel members as well. Uh, but this with research. Uh, many people of color have commented that, um, that the arrest, there should be the word arrest in there, and incarceration rate uh, is much greater here in Santa Cruz than other locations. So why would that be? Uh, this would be a look at the complete system, not just the sheriff's office who houses them, but the, the complete system. And it's my understanding that the sheriff already has a study underway to find out the numbers that are currently uh, in the jail and so forth. Um, it's not it's certainly not an issue of, of his doing. It's more of an issue of how do we understand the entire justice system here in Santa Cruz and, and what does that look like? Um, there are a couple things that this will be dependent upon, dependent upon. One is collaboration and two is cost. A study like this won't be won't be free. Uh, we would want this to be from an academic institution uh, so that it has the rigors of science behind it. And so we would want to see where we can get money and then push it forward from there. Um, so uh, this would be a collaboration between all the departments uh, as well as um, the district attorney's office, the courts, the probation and parole, um, as, and maybe many other people as well. So this was a kind of a longer term perspective and certainly not the near term. Uh, you'll have to find money uh, to do this. And I would guess it would be pretty costly. Uh, then lastly, if you would move forward, um, next steps is we to, uh, to serve our community. Uh, we've got several things going on. Partner with the uh, Warriors and the Reggie Stevens Foundation to create a mentoring program. Uh, Reggie coaches a lot of young kids in the in the community, uh, and uh, and thanks for all the service that you're doing, Reggie. Uh, continue to listen to the community and make adjustments. This is not the end; it's the beginning, and so we want to make that clear. And then, uh, and then lobby for the changes as needed. So um, I'm gonna move it back to council in a second, but I really wanted to give uh, uh, Brenda and others the opportunity to ask questions should you have any that maybe aren't clear uh, in this presentation so that council can consider those. Thanks, Chief Mills. Um, I have more of a comment on the data, um, the data collection and publication. 
Yeah. I believe, to me, it's important that uh, the data that is published is not only demographic, but also it needs to include, you know, other information like the nature of the stop and what did you find when you when you searched a person. Also, I think it's important that you publish the use of force data. That's very important to the community as well, as far as the data is concerned. Mm, let's see. You talked about a, pol a, col a council policy for the acquisition of military surplus equipment. Isn't there already a policy on that? Or am I thinking of something different? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I thought that there was a policy developed uh, when uh, the department purchased the Bearcat. That, yeah, that wasn't a 1033 program. That was purchased through a grant, a, a UWASI grant. So that would be a little bit different. Okay. And then I guess my next uh, comment is regarding the procedural justice and police legitimacy train, training. I would recommend that you uh, post a curriculum online. That's a great idea. And I, I think that's it for now. Of course, you know, um, I do want to talk about the use of force policy, but that's a longer conversation. It, it seems to, it always does, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brenda, for those comments. Uh, if you would advance. So we turn it back over to council and we're asking you to affirm and support the policy amendment. One through 16, direct staff to incorporate policy changes to city council policies, items B one through four, and provide direction and support to the chief uh, to further council, uh, further item C one through three. So I turn it over to you, Mr. Mayor. All right, well, thank you very much for that presentation. I wanna thank all the members of the community who have been able to uh, join us on this panel and provide some feedback. Uh, chief, I did wanna point out, um, I was looking at the, agenda and it looks like there's 17 items under a that were in the report so i just wanted to make sure that was a clarification that's one through 17 for council um and with that uh i'd like to see if there's any questions from council members for the chief or in general regarding this item okay hearing none what i'll do is i'll open it up to public comment, so if there are members of the public who like to speak to the council on um, the item before us, which is poli policy changes related to racial equity and social justice in the criminal justice system, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen if you haven't already done so. Once you've entered the room, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and once you've been unmuted, you'll be given two minutes to comment. Hello, my name is Michael Shirley. I have lived in Santa Cruz, California all of my life. Um, I want to thank Mayor Cummings, uh, the members of the Santa Cruz City Council. Special thanks to Chief Mills and Ben Wright. Um, I would like to discuss or reiterate on improving racial diversity and equity training. Um, I have been through the justice system. Um, I have also done time in federal custody. And after post-incarceration, I have made um, very, very productive changes through academia. I am uh, currently looking to get into uh, Cal Berkeley and Stanford. And in doing so, I wanted to implement a program that can help with improving racial diversity uh, as far as making 
a basically a bridge between the community and uh, police. And I think by doing that, we can't just rely on uh, training in the classroom. There needs to be some type of volunteer work. There has to be a bridge where you can make a relationship, not just formal training. And I've had a unique situation where I left Santa Cruz Police Department and went over to Capitola to obtain a incident report and it resulted in a um, stop by a police officer and it was unwarranted. So if I can't feel safe at a police department, where can I be safe at? And there's instances like that that have to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Garrett again. Uh, I personally don't think most police departments are systemically racist or uh, the Santa Cruz police uh, commit racially motivated misconduct. I don't think disingenuous, violent, radical, Marxist, anarchist, any police mob chants alone are a basis for vast changes in policy. The reality of black people disproportionately encountering police is largely due to the vastly disproportionate violent crime committed by some black men, and yes, that is an ignored hard reality to accept for them. I personally believe the claims of widespread, systemically uh, racially motivated police brutality by the BLM are largely unproven and have other motives, and the BLM itself is really a destructive revolutionary movement who has and is using incendiary methods to sway public opinion with violent protest and mischaracterizations with a very different than stated political agenda, none of which uh, particularly apply at all to the police in Santa Cruz. That said, ex excessive use of force uh, always merits examination, and it does occur. As to the bloated numbers cited wanting major police reform, the survey said 33 percent of 18 to 34-year-olds favored abolishing the police. That is uh, purely a goal of anarchy. I blame squarely on the BLM anarchists targeting impressionable young people having already been brainwashed by leftism. A year ago, these numbers would not exist. In general, though, I applaud and support the bulk of Section A policy changes. As to item 13 and Section A changes, you know I disagree with any diversity policy, policy that would involve quotas that rejects a more meritorious candidate in favor of diversity because it breeds mediocrity besides being an unfairly prejudicial, uh, as unfairly prejudicial as if uh, that uh, what is hinted at may have occurred historically. The really shocking ignored justice system part not working here at the present is too many turnstile catch and releases of the same offenders, penny bail in some cases dozens of times, accused of some pretty serious crimes only to offend again and again and again, and really needs a high priority examination. Strangely, the justice warriors don't care about that. Okay, that'll be it. Bye. Thank you. Hey, Reggie here. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of Santa Cruzans are sort of watching this presentation and earnestly believing that these proposals will make a real difference in how the city treats our community. And I want to just acknowledge that, but I want to sort of remind the community that, um, you know, the standard for our policy was not, is not this, you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota, that's where George Floyd was killed and they are defunding their police department. And I wanna remind everyone what happened with Sean Arlt, the man who was shot and killed during a mental health crisis by SCPD. Uh, just like any of these other police departments, he was not charged with criminal offenses, or the, sorry, the police officers. And uh, the police union and Mills himself ran to the defense of those officers, uh, saying things like, we still bleed and victimizing the police in this uh, effort. Um, and under these new proposals uh, by Mills, Sean Arlt's death would still have happened and the officers would still be unaccountable. Uh, Jay Rorty, a local lawyer, has written a letter demonstrating how these accountability measures by the motion uh, Mills has presented are written intentionally loosely, leaving them largely unenforceable from a legal perspective. The thing is, Mills cannot be trusted to be entirely on the side of public good because He's a police officer. That is his role in society. And he's a member of the police union. 
And so it's this relationship that prevents him from being fully on our side. He just can't be. And you can see it in the watered down reforms that are being presented here. Or you can see it in why the police budget increases every single year, even during major budget deficits, like in 2019. You can see it when Mills suggests that we need to hold on to uh, extremely dangerous uses of force, like shooting at moving vehicles. Um, anyways, let me just end on SPP, uh, SCP and fun public business. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jace Ritchie. I apologize for having called in earlier to make my remarks now. Uh, I'm calling in to amplify Reggie's remarks uh, and uh, give a little bit more context to that. While I disagree with uh, Chief Mills' vision, I'm grateful to the Chief for recognizing the need, pressing need to act to improve our community and especially to uh, provide the safety measures that community members uh, who have been unfairly targeted deserve. That said, uh, Chief says that this is a process, but I'm not seeing the roadmap from where we go from here. Eight Can't Wait was great. They were well-branded proposals, but they couldn't wait. Now we've waited months, and now I believe it's time for the next step to consider the legitimate plans of non-reformist feedback and look at the path forward beyond what can't wait and look towards the future we want to see for ourselves and live in. Chief Mill says that he's found the middle path for our community to come together between those who deny racism and those who seek to eradicate it. I cannot believe that we're settling for the middle path when we spent a year of travesty watching time and time again the exact actions that he is proposing fail to actually materially protect community members across this country. I'm deeply ashamed of anyone who seeks to charter the middle path between those who deny racism and those to eradicate it. Community members are kidding themselves to think that anyone with a vision in this country is looking towards his vision, the one that aligns with glorified police violence and blog posts about fictional crimes against officers and violence in the community as a roadmap for what the future of community safety looks like. There is a vision for that. There have been proposals to this council along those lines, and I plead and beg community members, uh, or council members, please, to listen to the community members on this Thank issue you. and defund the police. Thank you. My name is Jasmine, and I am a woman of color in Santa Cruz. This whole presentation was in bad taste, in my opinion. He, uh, Chief Mills surrounded himself with a few BIPOC members of the community with whom he had already been working and uh, was already working with Mayor Justin Cummings, so it feels like this was limited to people who already agree with him. Also, are you even trying to listen to the public, to other people of color, to what we, the people of Santa Cruz, want? You give lots of examples of reforms that seem to have all too many loopholes. There are some things that are now banned, like carotid restraints and no-knock warrants, but they can be overridden. Where's the accountability when that happens? And you said black participants from the community were not a monolith. Indeed, they aren't. However, you didn't listen to or convey the opinions of black folks who demand defunding of the police. You had level conflict of a four, meaning uncooperative and posing a threat, which could justify strikes, kicks, and use of weapons. The way this was written could encapsulate individuals with a mental health crisis. We really need a CAHOOTS program instead. They would never use force to de-escalate a situation like that. I'm a therapist and know how erratic people with mental illness can be, and I would never even consider an option to be killing them. These reforms barely sound good, and they don't seem likely to lead to meaningful change. And they certainly don't represent what the public wants. I can say that I, as a person of color, who has many friends of color who agree with an abolitionist perspective, do not agree and do not feel heard. Thank you. Hello. 
Um, hi, my name is Vicki, and um, I'd like to thank all the community, community members uh, for engaging in this process. Um, but particularly what Joyce Lynn said about needing to change the culture of the police department really resonated with me. Um, that's why Andy Mills' recent blog post, which the uh, police department paid to promote on Facebook, really troubled me. In this post, Chief Mills describes um, a story about an attack on a policewoman in which a citizen, a veteran, convalescing at home, trains his sniper rifle sights on the attacker. Um, it's not clear whether this incident happened in Santa Cruz or somewhere else, or if it happened at all. Uh, my question um, about this went unanswered by either Chief Mills or the department. Um, but many commenters assumed that it, that it took it at face value and assumed that it had happened here to a Santa Cruz police officer. Um, and so my question is, this type of post really doesn't seem to um, be something that someone who really wants to de-escalate tensions and bring the level of tension down um, that they would post. And I just want to quote um, what a fellow police officer who um, actually killed a drunk person waving a box cutter in San Diego in 2015, he reacted to this post by saying, um, I applaud citizens who take action to jump in to protect and save lives of officers who are being violently assaulted, even if it means taking the life of the assailant. Now, I think we have enough trouble with police killing um, civilians. I don't think we need to bring into this armed um, citizens into this melee, just shooting whoever they feel like. This is not the escalating tension. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'd like to uh, just echo what the last couple callers have said, especially Jasmine. I really agree with her and her point of view. I think at its root, policing is a system designed to uphold oppression. I do not believe that anyone deserves to be caged. I don't prescribe to the state's notions of innocence and culpability. I recognize that the system of policing is heavily intertwined with the military industrial complex, both here and abroad. In abolishing policing, we seek to abolish imperialist forms of police, such as militaries responsible for generations of violence against black and brown people worldwide. As abolitionists, we recognize that reforms that do not reduce the power of the police, including those proposed by Eight Can't Wait, simply create new opportunities to surveil, police, and incarcerate black, brown, indigenous, poor, disabled, transgender, oppressed, queer, migrant people, and those who work in street ec economies. We believe in a world where there are zero police murders because there are zero police, not because police are better trained or better regulated. Indeed, history has shown that ending police violence through more training or regulations is impossible. Um, I think to, the, to build an abolitionist world that prioritizes the lives of black people, we have to draw upon the dec decades of abolitionist work to compile the list of demands targeted towards city and municipal powers. And I think these are, one, to defund the police, two, demilitari demilitarize communities, three, remove police from schools, four, free people from prisons and jails, five, repeal laws that criminalize survival, including here in Santa Cruz where 80% of the calls for police are regarding homelessness, Six, invest in community self-governance, governance, like Jasmine said, the cahoots, and provide safe, accessible housing for everyone, and invest fully in care, not the cops. Thank you. Thank you. In the essence of time, because we still have one more item after this item, um, I'm going to ask that we reduce the time for public comment to one minute. So we've got about 10 people who are lined up. Um, so if we can get through these folks, um, we'll move on to action deliberation. And then we have one more item, and it's 920. So hopefully um, we can continue moving through and get through these comments and 
uh, deliberate and move on to the next item. So if we could change the clock to one minute, um, we'll go ahead and continue on with uh, public comment. So 9858, you're on the line. We can hear you. Hello. If you're last. Hello. Did, yeah, you're on the line. We can hear you. Oh, hi. Hi, this is Joan Peterson. Um, speaking about the, the uh, police policy proposal, I'd like to urge the city council to adopt the amendments detailed in the letter written by the concerned expert attorney, which we have, um, I'm sure you have a copy of. Um, the proposal states, require officers to exhaust all other reasonable alternatives before resorting to deadly force. Now, this would be changed to amend use of force policy to incorporate as a core principle that deadly, that deadly force will be used as a last resort and only when other reasonable alternatives have been exhausted first when feasible. Also, in addition, an additional thing added to the proposal could be require use of force reporting, including threats with a firearm. Post SCPD use of force data regularly, including race, ethnicity, gender, age, weapon, force, injuries, underlying crime, contact, on its website, including analysis of trends, policy, and training issues. These details matter because it's important that police make substantial improvements and are accountable. Thank you so much for the work you're doing, and I think that um, more work could be done. Thank you. Thank you. This assembly line process of not allowing the public to speak is really deplorable and bad news. Missing from the recommendations, the homeless harassment ordinances, empowerment and funding, which even Mills admits takes up a large chunk of police time and money, Missing any serious consideration of even token shifting of resources to the nonviolent alternatives like the CAHOOTS model in Eugene, buried in last Monday's study session. Missing any real examination of racial discrimination in the SCPD. Instead, the SCPD continues its policy of not summarizing racial data. And missing is the mention of the word H, the homeless word. Any corrective measures to end the stay away orders from the parks the empowerment of vehicle seizures by right-wing ideologues like Deborah Elston and her next-door vigilante volunteer cops, missing is any real input from the public instead of the closed meetings with Cummings and Mills behind closed doors with a select group. Instead, you have a laundry list of self-promoting claims by Mills rushed forward. Even the conservative local ACLU has urged you to wait until the community gets more time to examine these. So don't be fooled by this cosmetic clown's mask of pseudo reforms. As long as lethal force continues to be funded, we must be on the streets demanding real change that this council refuses to even consider. And thank you, community, for listening. My name is Madeline. Uh, I want to start out by expressing my appreciation for all the community members who gave up their time to go through this process with Chief Mills. As previous caller Jasmine said, there were other community members involved in this process but didn't seem to be asked to appear tonight, some who have different views about these proposals. And I noticed something me that is really missing from Santa Cruz. I believe we need to have a civilian police review board to hold the police up to more accountability. We have volunteer cops in Santa Cruz going out, doing cop things. I think we need just some regular community members reviewing police actions, especially if these uh, so-called reforms are passed. Thank you. Uh, hey, can you guys hear me? Uh, if you could speak up a little bit, you're a little faint. Uh, okay. 
How about now? Oh, that's better. Okay. Um, so I'm calling, I'm a community trainer in town, uh, and I just really wanted to specifically touch on the discussion of including implicit bias trainings, de-escalation trainings, and racial equity trainings. I don't think that these are sufficient because the system that we have for policing itself is flawed. So if you're having things like implicit bias trainings, but you have somebody who's armed, it's not enough to completely remove the biases that lead to disproportionate people of color that are being killed by police officers. So the, the, the real reforms that are needed are not surface level, like recru recruiting more diverse police officers, uh, you know, recruitment campaigns, feedback, you know, email addresses on the back of business cards. It's really about completely uh, re-looking at the system that we have, uh, defunding and looking at something like a the HOOTS program that doesn't, like by bringing a cop into the situation, you're automatically escalating the situation. So de-escalation is kind of a uh, an oxymoron in this scenario. Next call, last four digits are 3173. Uh, you're being asked to unmute your phone, so if you can unmute your device, you'll be given one minute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, good evening. Sorry. Okay, it's Peter Gelblum calling. I sent a minute an email urging the council to put this over for more study for uh, to release the next meeting. And I reiterate that based on what I saw, which was uh, just put up, I don't know when it was put up, it wasn't up when the agenda came out. This is in the use of force policy that's now on the transparency portal. Uh, section 300.3.1, the uh, de-escalation section, it's just complete garbage. Um, the first half of it has nothing to do with de-escalation, it has to do with protecting officers better. The second half is so qualified, uh, when reasonable, when feasible, consider alternatives, uh, it needs to be wordsmith, it needs to be studied, it needs to be looked at. This was put up maybe yesterday, today, I don't know when it was put up, but the public has not had a chance to review this and the council needs to study this without just rubber stamping it. Thank you. I just wanted to call in and uh, go what a lot of other people have said, that these changes mean almost nothing, that a lot of the time when you have someone reform themselves, they're going to choose what's in their own best interest, not what's in everyone else's best interest, that it's just giving them more funding and more power through that, and that what we're failing to address is why police are responding to these situations where there is a racist call into 911 or where there is a uh, issue of homelessness or mental health that should be addressed. And that's not being talked about here. And I would like to see something more like the CAHOOTS model, something towards defunding and de-escalating in that way rather than counting on people who are trained to look at us in ways as a threat to handle the situation. Thanks for listening. Mills, I'm wondering if you've had a change of heart. In 2017, three years ago, you complained about firefighter Matt McFarlane wearing a BLM pin while you continued to wear your Blue Lives Matter bracelet. When you arrived here in Santa Cruz, you said you cared about our houseless population, would not give them camping or sleeping tickets. I'm going to pause you for a sec. Um, we're commenting on items that are on our agenda related to um, police's changes related to racial equity and social justice. So. I think if you have personal comments about the police chief, maybe uh, there's another venue for that. So I, if we want to talk about the policy, I think that's appropriate. Um, otherwise, maybe you can find another time to call the chief mills and, and talk to them about these other issues. So if you'd like to continue, um, happy to 
um, allow you to, to continue your comments so long as they're related to what's on our agenda. And so if you'd like to press star six, you can unmute your phone. Can you give me one minute, please? Yeah, you can have one minute to comment on the agenda item. Um, these reforms that you're presenting are unenforceable. <laughs> What good are they if they're not forceful? Please refer to many of the emails you, refuse, you received from several different attorneys. Um, Mills blogged recently about certain stories, um, including the last blog regarding vigilantes. Um, it's like, it's, it's, uh, I won't go into that because you told me not to speak about things that uh, personally about him. But um, Brenda Mills commented that there's a current policy in place regarding after the bear cat, um, and Brenda Mills is correct that there is a policy in place already, whether or not it's part of the 1033 program. Please check on that. I know that Mills became chief of police after that policy was put in pl place, but it worries me that you're not aware of this policy. I watched a young black suicidal man be surrounded by 10 cops with absolutely no mental health officials present. I've seen this over and over again. None of you are going to make a change. I'm white and privileged and pretend not to know what it is like to be stopped by the police, but there are many members of the black community who are not. Sorry, we've got to move on. I appreciate everyone's comments, um, but we're We've been meeting since 9.30 this morning. It's now 9.30 p.m., and we need to – we still have one more item. So next caller. Hi, my name is Lisa. Uh, I'm calling about the police department's proposal for the reforms. I read the city's proposed ad, a sponsored ad promoting Chief Mills' horrifying cop fan fiction blog post where he advocates for an increase in vigilante violence in support of cops. This is deeply disturbing. A police department that believes that they need vigilantes a la Kyle Rittenhouse or warriors, as the chief calls them, out in the streets obviously doesn't have any interest in actually implementing any checks on their officers. I urge you to listen to the many BIPOC groups in town when they say that the police's presence, even with the proposed reforms, leads to increased violence and harassment against community members of color. More needs to be done to hold the police accountable and to find alternatives to their presence. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hey, I'm Garrett Stevens. Um, I wanted to uh, put an idea out there. Uh, I've been talking to some friends about several of these issues and one thing i think would help with a follow-up in terms of uh what's on the agenda today is if um i i know police ride-alongs are a thing that are possible and i'm not sure during covid how possible that is uh wearing masks obviously would be a part of it but it would be great if community members uh, were encouraged to do ride-alongs so that we could get a more uh first person knowledge about what goes on throughout a shift and what goes on out there on the streets so that that can inform the conversations we're having. We can have uh, better informed community conversations around policing and possible reforms. So I wanted to put that out there and we'll hopefully follow up and see what, what options there may be to do that. But I think it would be great if more community members got an experience doing a ride along or something of that nature to try to just inform, um, have, the, have the community as a whole individually become more informed. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, this is Emery. I'm a Santa Cruz community member and uh, calling to echo what a lot of people have said here as long as, as well as uh, Reggie and the NAACP's letter to Chief Mills and the SCPD. Um, we need to defund the police. These uh, reforms outlined here are a half-hearted stab in the dark and really don't achieve much as far as what the community has been suggesting. Um, I think the Chief Mills blog post was disgusting and dangerous, and we need to defund the police and refund the community. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and close public comment.
and we're going to bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. Uh, I'd first like to thank um, all the panelists for joining this evening. I'm going to ask if the panelists can all um, turn their cameras off and their mics off and uh, just listen for the rest of the meeting as we um, take action on the following items. Um, in addition to that, I do want to, just based on some of the comments that we just heard, I do want to stress that last week we did have um, an extensive presentation by CAHOOTS. We had an entire afternoon dedicated to mental health crisis response and alter like what we're doing in the city, what we're doing in the county, and then hearing from CAHOOTS on an alternative model. Um, there was direction given that we would ex continue having those conversations. And just like with anything that we're trying to address here in the city, things take time. There needs to be an opportunity for us to have discussions with the community, work with our partners throughout the community. And so um, regardless of what happens, there's going to be a lot of time that's going to need to be taken in order to make um, further changes. But this, um, what's before us tonight, it was in response to what we were hearing um, from recently after when George Floyd was murdered uh, throughout the summer and throughout the fall, and which is where how we've gotten to the place we are tonight. Um, there's nothing stopping us from continuing to move forward with having discussions with the community and finding further ways to improve public safety. Um, but this, as we mentioned before, is a step in the direction of trying to implement changes that will make our, uh, our community safer and make people from um, underrepresented and diverse backgrounds be, uh, have a better relationship with our public safety officers. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Council Member Watkins. Well, I'll just um, thank you, Mayor, for your comments, and then I want to also extend my gratitude and appreciation for Taj and Brenda and Joy and uh, Reggie and Chief Mills for your presentation this evening. And I um, just really recognizing the, you know, the historical um, context of race relations in this nation and the deep-rooted uh, racial. Uh, systemic racism that we've seen throughout a housing education and, and, police, and policing in our nation. Um, where we are today is a step in the right direction. And uh, it does, uh, there's always room for continuous improvement and uh, training and better understanding how we as a society can remedy and, um, and create more equity uh, and improve black lives uh, from all the spectrums. And I um, recognize also, though, we have to start with, with what we can do right now. And I appreciate the thought that went into creating the policy recommendations before us. Um, recognizing that we also have had a very long meeting, I'm happy to kind of keep the agenda moving and, and go ahead and provide a motion to um, accept the recommendation as presented in our staff report. And um, and welcome any comments or uh, further discussion amongst my colleagues. Okay, so a motion by Council Member Watkins, Council Member Brown. Sorry, hand was up. I, um, I do have some comments and, and actually a couple of questions now. Um, and so I'm gonna hold off until there's a second on, on that motion. I, I'd like to see us go a little bit further. Okay, Council Member Matthews. I'll go ahead and second the motion. And um, uh, I, my comments can be very brief, so I'll make them now. I just want to thank everyone involved with this, the chief, the mayor, other council members, the community. From what I could tell, I was not deeply involved in the process. It seemed to me that everyone approached it in genuine good faith, a genuine openness to listen, to hear, to try and understand and move forward with some significant process. So obviously this is not an end point, but I just want to personally, personally thank the, um, the spirit that everyone approached this very challenging situation with. Thank you. Uh, Council Brown, then Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I want to start off by appreciating the efforts of uh, the mayor, I know you've you've um, had an, uh, quite a ride <laughs> your term as mayor, um, and you managed to kind of keep this, uh, you know, this real, you know, in front and center for you and um, for our community. So I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, Chief Mills' efforts to uh, kind of move uh, move things along here. And I know there's a lot of uh, you know kind of 
conflicting, uh, you know, or not necessarily conflicting, but different perspectives on how, how it is that we proceed and what uh, meaningful change might look like. Um, a lot of community members have turned out. I really appreciate all of you for, and those of you who are here tonight um, and, and weighing in as well. Um, and I, I really wanna echo um, Brenda Griffin's comments uh, related to um, reporting. And I'll get back around to that in just a second. Um, I also wanna appreciate all the community members who have come out and, um, and, and have weighed in, who have weighed in um, kind of pretty consistently uh, for the past uh, many months now um, about the limitations of this kind of incremental policy uh, change and kind of, you know, and the, the generalized um, policy changes that, um, that, that are difficult to um, kind of pinpoint what specifically will cha would, would change and, you know, how to evaluate that, what kind of metrics, how will we know um, that these efforts have been effective or successful. Um, and, you know, and I, and people have, you know, there's this, this um, insistence that this is a process and this will be ongoing and I absolutely support that and I agree, but I worry that we don't have uh, any real structure panel or, or structure uh, to um, ensure that there is ongoing engagement and deliberation about this, these issues. So um, I'd like to see us uh, do something that, that kind of helps reassure, um, you know, me, certainly me, but um, members of our community that there will be ongoing dialogue. Right now, um, it's like, we can walk away from this meeting, we'll pass the policy tonight, but what's, you know, so then what? Um, how do we how do we decide and how do we actually get to a place where we can keep moving this forward? Um, so that's a real concern for me. Um, you know, I take very seriously the comments that have come in from the ACLU and um, others, uh, um, civil rights attorneys and others who have are ex are really experts in these matters. Um, and and I do want to um, you know try to try to get us to a place where we can acknowledge that those are legitimate concerns and that we can do better, we can do more. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not gonna um, uh, belabor this tonight because I, I you know, I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, offering up a bunch of amendments and giving you a big talk about all of the ways that I think we, you know, other things we should be doing. I think you all know, I, you know, I made the motion about cahoots on Monday, last Monday, didn't get there, um, but, um, you know, for now, I would like to see um, or hear more, I guess. So this is the question, um, one of the questions. Um, with respect to uh, reporting, which is, I think, a huge piece of, um, you know, getting us to uh, broader accountability, not just around specific incidents and where there may be misconduct and that's reported, but kind of generally trends and how the department is doing um, and we have a transparency portal and there is a lot of information that is, is being shared and I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I've had a lot of requests from folks over the last few months uh, asking to try to get access to information that is not readily available, um, even with the, uh, the transparency portal and, and it's great and I, I'm, I'm really appreciated and I, I talked with um, Deputy Chief Escalante, I've asked some, for some additional information. And some of it, um, I've been told, is not possible to get because it's not recorded. And so I'm just wondering, you know, given, uh, you know, I think Brenda just said it, reporting on demographics and outcomes, um, there's information that people would like to have. And I'm just wondering um, if, you know, Chief Mills, if you could talk about your thoughts and how we get there. Um, because I think that I think it's, it would be really helpful, and it would it would help our community um, kind of uh, have have you know in trust building. So thank you, Councilmember Brown. But I think and I think that uh, this information is available, and that we can get much of it. It depends specific, specifically on what you're asking for. Uh, obviously, the devil's always in the details. Uh, but uh, every time we use force of any kind that's recorded. Uh, and I know that some members of the community have commented on things like, well, anytime a gun is, is displayed, well, we, we capture that. Um, and that goes onto a form 
and that all that data can be collected. Now the issue is because of the budget shortfall, I cut my crime, an crime analyst position out of the budget. Um, so there is nobody to do that right now, but I'm always willing to improvise and maybe we can find a volunteer or somebody else that can capture that data, uh, an intern or whatever the case may be. So we can be creative and come up with those kind of solutions. I'm not opposed at all um, about um, uh, being more transparent and giving as much information as we can so people can make thoughtful decisions about recommendations to policy. And that's the whole goal here is to make the best recommendations that we can. Thank you. So if I could just add, that, so the, the demographic areas of interest that I hear, that I, I hear consistently about um, are, uh, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, age, um, and, you know, and, and more recently, I think, um, you know, housing status and, and really observable um, uh, mental health status are, you know, and, and those are, demographics that would be collected at the, the point of interaction with um, with folks in, you know on the ground and so I guess um, I'm, if I could ask is, is that information that is possible to um, you know, is that recorded is it possible if the resources were made available to make the, the process that yeah we certainly can put the data, the forms together to make sure that data is captured it just becomes a matter of will and and cost and uh, but I'm not I'm not opposed to that at all. Great. Um, and I guess on the just as, as a follow up uh, in terms of you know evaluation, we you know we spend a lot of time kind of trying to come up with metrics to evaluate programs that we fund and you know um, and you know, on the community. And wondering if your thoughts on you know evaluation. How do how are we going to know? Um, like what is the what does success look like? You know, how are we going to know that we're on the right track? You know, just what your thoughts on how to deal with that? To which topic? Reducing uh, bias or to reducing use of force or what are you referring to? All of the above, I would say. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's important for us to capture, and one of the reasons we have the use of force form that we have our officers fill out is because we want to assess what uses of force are effective and which aren't under what circumstances. And so we have our officers fill out that form. If tasers, for instance, don't work and are, aren't effective, then we don't want to use them. Or if uh, uh, let's go to a different tool that might be more effective. So there are things that we, that we do take a look at uh, to try to capture that data. And, uh, and I do believe in evidence-based practices. So you take a look at the evidence, you try to uh, do it in a, in a way that identifies what's most effective. And, uh, but again, that takes time and, that, and an effort and staffing to do. And right now, uh, because of the budget shortfall, we are down a lot of bodies. Thank you. Um, and then one last question. Um, I have a lot more, but I'm not going to keep asking you all night with those. I, I know I can ask you those offline, and, and it was great to talk with you yesterday. Um, in terms of the de-escalation policy, um, you know, I see the word require in the, um, the material that we have in the agenda report, and, but when I look at the policy, I, it, it doesn't really match up with request requiring um, de-escalation. And I know that it's qualified with when possible, and there's some, you know, uh, language around, um, you know, what's feasible, what's possible elsewhere. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm just wondering how you see, um, you know, how the, this requirement, how, you know, how, how to evaluate that. I think somebody mentioned with the policy proposal um, what happened in the Sean Earl case, for example, um, could still very well happen. And I don't think there's any policy that you can put in writing that would guarantee that something like that isn't going to happen. So I, you know, I totally understand that. Um, but I guess I, I, I am wondering how, um, you know, how that, the, you know, what's written in the policy matches up with this idea of like requiring the escalation. So how do we, I guess, understand that that's actually occurring, um, you know, as needed, as, you know. Yeah, so I know that one member of the public, um, you know, mentioned it was, quote, garbage, uh, and that's fine if that's his opinion. Um, 
it's easy to sit at home and uh, you know and leaf through this leisurely. But when you're in the midst of a very difficult situation, uh, and we have gone to great extent to train, to educate, to practice with live bait, live scenarios. Uh, we regularly do these videos for our officers that they have to work through these problems and uh, and look at those things. But it's interesting to me that the policy actually states an officer shall consider action that may increase officer safety and the need in the let and reduce the need for using force. Uh, so it's not an option for them. They shall do that. And because in our whole goal of communicating with our officers is that we want to pull them in because there's normally something in it for you. And what's in it for you is that you're safer if they're safer. And so um, we believe that certainly we can always improve our policies. And now that people have them, they're welcome to give us their, uh, their thoughtful opinions and how that can be um, improved. Uh, but we want to start someplace rather than sitting on our hands for the next six months why, um, why people debate it in the public square. Debate it in the public square. But let's get moving on something now. And we also have to do it in a way that uh, brings along the officers who are actually out there doing it every single day. They've got 40 millimeters in the cars now. All of them have tasers. All of them have body-worn cameras. All of them have had the training. We've gone to a great deal of expense, time, and training to do this. And so there's no doubt in their minds that the requirement is, both in policy and in practice, is to do everything they can to de-escalate. And they're doing it successfully on a regular basis. I applaud them for that. Sometimes even taking risk, uh, like a man that threw a knife at them over at the staff of life. So um, I, you know, I have an unbelievable amount of respect for the men and women who are out there doing it every day. And I think that uh, the policy is in a good position. Certainly can be improved. Thank you. And that's a lot, final question. Um, just bring it back around um, and I, you know I, I also have tremendous respect for the work you do and you know I, I, I um, so I don't mean to sound um, like I am just looking for something to critique here um, but I do want to you know I do want to reflect the community concerns that are expressed to us and uh, the last question I have is just your thoughts on um, given that this is a starting place um, how you see a process you know the process continuing and you know how it is that um, people can give input, um, you know, decision points, and kind of how we move forward, just what you're thinking about how, what that'll look like. Well, I'm certainly always open to any community member that has criticism for the police department or me personally, um, and they're welcome to voice that. Uh, but I think that we need a structured process in place, and uh, I would suggest maybe knocking heads together with uh, some of our you know, city manager and the council members to come up with a process that would continue to consider policy changes that would affect and improve uh, the way that we as a government interact with people of color, especially African-Americans in our community. So um, whatever that might look like, whether it's the mayor continues with this or, or others on council, then uh, I'm wide open to that. And, uh, and, you know, uh, again, we wanted this as a beginning point, if not the end point, and uh, as, we, as we work together. Thank you. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Myers, and before I, I give you the floor, I'll just say as well that, um, you know, as I mentioned, this was kind of a first step and something I'm really committed to is continuing to work on this over the course of the next couple of years, and so, I mean, I think it's something we can probably talk about after our new council gets seated, but, you know, if it's something that the Public Safety Committee can, you know, play a role in, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to continue working on this. So I just wanted to put that out there first and foremost. So, but um, moving along, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, and then um, let's hopefully continue <laughs> on to our next item soon. Yeah, I'll keep my comments um, brief. Many of my comments have been asked by other council members. Uh, I just wanted to take the time to just thank you, Mayor uh, Cummings and Mills um, and uh, Joy and Joyce and Brenda 
and Taj, and um, I know I'm missing somebody, um, or a few people here. Um, I just think that the work that you've done is uh, important, it's timely, uh, and I, I, you know, I, to the extent that um, we acknowledge this is a first step or a first set of conversations, a first set of um, policies, uh, it's, it's a conversation that had to happen in our community, had to happen throughout the uh, country and throughout the world. And um, so I think to the extent that um, you, um, you know, you recognize the work that you put in, uh, the work ahead, and, um, you know, just thank you for, for taking this on. And it's incredibly important. And um, I'll leave it at that, but um, just wanted to express my thanks. And happy to happy to continue the conversation and uh, work towards the motion. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Matthews. Without trying to amend the original motion, I just have some thoughts about that third category um, and and just general concerns about how are we going to measure, how are we going to track some of these items. It seems to me uh, in that third category, um, improved diversity training and assisting with research, um, those are areas where um, interim reports back, information reports, memos back to council and community um, will give the feeling that <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> and um, I think sometimes that, that um, procedure or that, that interim step doesn't happen. You know, the council will give direction and then we think, where is <laughs> but the work being done? So um, this is on people's minds, so to the extent there can be just update progress reports on these things, um, will, I think, give confidence that work is being done. Um, with the research, um, it mentions um, possible involvement of the courts and the sheriff, so that's obviously complicated. I think you mentioned that there was some conversation with kind of the broader regional public safety um, entities wanting to ask these same questions. So there again, uh, there won't be a um, final uh, final product in short order, but progress reports on that would be helpful. Um, I would think going forward, maybe engaging the public safety committee on tracking some of these things, and I haven't met the new police auditor, but he seems particularly well grounded in civil rights and so forth. So he may have also suggestions um, to bring forward. And again, just a, a personal observation. I know this because of the events we lived through uh, of this year. Um, there's been the particular focus on Black Lives Matter. I can think back in police trainings and trying to even start with awareness of bias and then moving um, to uh, uh, reduce that bias. There have been focus trainings on GLBT. I'm talking about policing back over time, you can. Uh, GLBT, uh, victims of domestic violence, Latinx, et cetera. And I, I think also, Mr. Mayor, I think you've talked about um, um, expanding the net a bit on that topic as well. So that's, that's I think, a good a good place to move, good direction to move in in the coming year. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Uh, I too will keep my comments short and I appreciate the remarks made by my colleagues in regards to um, thinking about metrics and how we're gonna move forward with, with continuous improvement and definitely am supportive of going in that direction. And then we'll just also add that you know, one of the things that this presentation was prefaced with was that this needs to be a holistic approach to how we're um, how we're factoring equity into all of our decision making. And that when we had our interim recovery planning conversation uh, occur several meetings back, but also talked about briefly today, we really talked about how health and all policies and integrating health equity and resilience into our decision making throughout all sectors of our. Uh, role as government, and that too really will enhance, I think, the broader hopes and efforts that this as one element also includes. So I hope we can not lose sight of that broader uh, framework as well as we move forward with tracking how this is improving our, our government system. 
Thanks for those comments. I did, before we move on to the vote, I did have a couple questions for the chief that um, related to some of the comments that came up. Um, so chief, I was just curious, I wanna just run through a couple of these real quick. One, um, based on the letter we received, one comment that came up was requiring that officers de-escalate before using a force when feasible. That's kind of my understanding of what the policy is that we've had before us and the changes that have been made. I just wanted to confirm that that's the case. Yes, it is now standalone policy and it says they shall consider it. Uh, it's not always going to be possible, but they shall consider it. Cool. Uh, the next was um, deadly force will be used as a last resort and only when other reasonable alternatives have been exhausted, first when feasible. Is that currently the, I, the I believe that's, policy? Or? Yeah, I believe that's pretty clear in our policy, uh, all the way from the escalation uh, to the matrix to everything else that's uh, in the totality of the of the policy. Okay, and then when it comes to the um, use of force reporting, my understanding, I guess, based on the conversation we're having, that's not, that's something that we don't currently do, but we could potentially do in the future. So I'm wondering if as an amendment, we might be able to add that as something that can be, you know, worked on moving forward. Certainly at the council's pleasure, uh, we can uh, add that to it, uh, to report out to the public safety committee or to full council, whatever your choice might be uh, on the data concerning the use of force. And that okay. can be adjusted as we go to make sure it captures all of the information that you want. Uh, but as you can recall, that's what I mentioned that we'll have to figure out how to do it since we don't have a crime analyst now. Right, okay. Um, so maybe if the maker of the motion and the second of the motion, I was just wondering if maybe we could add to the, um, sorry, I don't have the, looking for the agenda. Um, with regards to- I, Yeah, I actually have a thought on that too, as for the future direction for that third category. We just ask the chief to report back on um, what would be required to uh, begin compiling reporting on different um, different um, metrics. Because I remember your comments that uh, you were cutting your record staff for, for, for doing, or the animators to end. Also that the, I think there was an app that was gonna make the recording better and we couldn't afford that. If I recall correctly, it was, you know, two strikes. And so um, I think just giving the chief direction to report back on what are, what are feasible next best steps that we can be making and what would it take to do it, whether it's um, um, qualified volunteer or whatever, grant money, et cetera. So that would be a, a number four there, would be to ask the chief to report back on the potential for uh, improving collection of uh, staff on various measures. And does the maker of the motion accept that amendment? Yes, no problem. Okay. Um, are there any further comments from council members at this time? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Um, there's a motion made by council member Watkins, seconded by council member Matthews to pass the staff recommendations and then also to add um, another item which was to have the police chief report back on what could be feasible next step to um, report on various um, statistics. Councilmember Byers is absent. Um, Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Mutkin? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with council members. Matthews, Golder, Brown, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, and Mayor Cummings voting in favor, and Councilmember Byers absent. So with that, um, let's go ahead and move on to our last item, and hopefully we can move through this one um, fairly quickly. I think we've heard 
a little bit about it in the last presentation. Um, but the next item is discriminatory reports to law enforcement ordinance. Uh, the presenter on this item, again, is Chief Mills. And so I'll, uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff followed by questions from council and then we'll take public comment and return to council for action and deliberation. Uh, once you've called in, if you would, it, when we open up for public comment, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And after you've been called on, uh, you will be given one minute to speak on this item. Uh, but before we go there, I'll turn it over to Chief Mills. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council members again. Uh, I'm actually going to turn this over to uh, our city attorney, uh, Tony Cadotti and Kathy Bronson, who, who actually wrote this. But uh, we talked about, we addressed it a little bit in the slide presentation that, from the last uh, section, but uh, this is a problem that has not only occurred here, but in other parts of the country where people have called in uh, based on a person's race or other protected um, uh, classes according to the Constitution. And this is one way we can re have hope to reduce the conflict or the potential of conflict between people of color and uh, and the police. So, um, Tony or Kathy, are you there? Yes, thank you, uh, Chief Mills, members of City Council, Kathy Bronson uh, uh, in my office has done uh, been working uh, extensively with the police department on this matter. The ordinance itself is modeled after a, uh, a San Francisco ordinance adopted by their Board of Supervisors recently and passed this year on the Zoom conference, and I will turn it over to her. Hi, good evening. Um, it's a pretty straightforward ordinance, um, pretty much taken word for word from uh, the city of San Francisco. Um, who adopted this under the name, uh, I believe they called it their, the Karen Law. Um, in this instance, we haven't decided to name it the Karen Law because there were some complaints about naming it that, but it's essentially the same ordinance. Um, what it basically does, it's fairly straightforward. It just calls out um, that it's unlawful to knowingly cause a police officer to arrive at a location to contact a person with some sort of improper discriminatory intent. Um, the beauty of this type of ordinance is it creates a civil action for somebody who's aggrieved in this cir circumstance. Um, it says that um, they can maintain a civil action and um, get a thousand dollars plus attorney's fees. Uh, so this is um, a nice little remedy for an improper thing that um, has been reported to happen to people um, across our country. And um, the nice thing is, you know, folks can take it upon themselves to enforce it and it doesn't take a lot of city attorney time or, you know, um, prosecution uh, to enforce this type of law. I mean, you may know already that um, it's already illegal to make a false police report, right? The problem is that um, these types of crimes aren't ones that are commonly prosecuted by our district attorneys because they're really quite busy. Um, and so this sort of leaves a, uh, opens up an additional legal option to folks um, seeking a remedy in civil court. Great, thanks. And uh, I'd really like to thank the police chief and the city attorney's office for bringing this to us at this time. Um, are there any questions from council members? Uh, Councilmember Golder. I just have one. I mean, I know Chief Mills shared with us a few circumstances that um, he had some anecdotal um, information about, but is there any quantifiable data that this is a problem in um, the city of Santa Cruz? I mean, every time that I've called 911, the first thing they ask is, what am I reporting? Not like, who am I reporting? And I, re you know, state whatever the issue is, and then they ask you to just, at first they ask if there's any weapons, then they ask what, what the person looks like, and they, they ask like height, weight, ethnicity, clothing, vehicle description, all these other things, it's just in this broad context, and I just think like, 
um, the dispatchers at NETCOM would be able to weed out calls that are not worth sending out to the police department. And so I'm just curious, is there any quantifiable data that this is a real issue here in our community? I'm not denying that it's an issue around the country or the world, but here, is this an issue or is this um, something you think is important? Well, to me, if there are three examples that I just came off the top of my head and I'm, I'm not on the radio that much because I'm sitting in my office, I think that's too many uh, personally. And, uh, and so, yeah, that does present a problem to me. Uh, however, I do agree with you that um, certainly some training at NETCOM can handle some of these problems uh, by screening a little bit more effectively and asking why are you calling on this person. But uh, when we get radio calls of a person walking down a street just because of their color and they dispatch officers on it, that's not right. And uh, we, we answer those by telling our officers they're not going to go to those calls. Um, but there's an expectation unless the person can articulate some kind of crime being committed or likely to be committed. Uh, and uh, that would be different. So that's what, that's what I'm kind of curious about. So if someone calls in and they're making a report of something like the ones you shared, would right now, would they dispatch officers out to a call like that? Or would they say, what would they say? I'm just curious. Yeah, we've asked, we sent them a memo over a year ago asking them not to dispatch us on those calls for service. Uh, it's pretty tough to train their folks in that area when people call and demand an officer respond. Uh, so uh, this will, I believe, take us the rest of the way there. I cannot quantify it for you the number of calls we get a year for this kind of thing. But there seems substantial enough to me to warrant this kind of, of ordinance, along with training for NETCOM to make sure that they don't dispatch officers for just race calls or um, LGBTQ rights or whatever the case might be. Uh, we wanna make sure that, uh, and that our supervisors have been informed uh, if they hear those calls to cancel those calls without sending an officer, uh, if, it's, if it's solely based on race and it's not a crime that's present. All right, are there any other questions from council members? Okay, seeing, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. And you're, and you're muted, by the way. Uh, Cassie, you mentioned it would be, um, so the damages, I just wanna make sure I understand, um, would be awarded if the, if the um, person that, you know, experienced this actually filed a civil civil suit is that how this would be awarded in terms of that um uh let's see it's under yeah 9.86.020 uh item c uh, identifies a thousand dollar um uh attorney fees and costs um so i just wanted to make sure that that was clear Yes, I, that, I think that's the idea behind the ordinance is um, it creates a civil cause of action. Um, presumably, the, the, many of these, if they are ever filed, um, would be filed in small claims court, um, which is a, a low barrier to entry for people. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Golder. Sorry to be annoying. How, how is this different than now if someone was to file a false police report and let's say like I was just walking along and someone called on me and then, I mean, how is it any different? I don't understand what's the difference between now and what we have. That's a really good question. So presumably now, if you were to, somebody called the police on, on you improperly, um, it would be a hard to prove that you were damaged in any way um, if you wanted to file suit, um, especially if nothing resulted from it. Um, it, it would just, there would be a barrier um, to creating, to having a theory that would support a legal cause of action. So what this does is it recognizes that there's um, harm in and of itself and that's entitled to compensation. Uh, so it basically 
just sort of clears the way for um, most likely a small claims action um, as um, sort of um, um, in order to get some sort of um, justice in the situation. Councilmember Matthews. I think I know where Renee was going with this, and um, we haven't really had the full discussion, but um, I have on occasion called NETCOM 911 for a whole variety of reasons, and I think they are good about saying, what's the issue? First of all, do you feel in danger right now? And, and there's a whole sequence, and Races down down the list a bit. <laughs> what what are they wearing? How tall are they? Male or female, etc. Um, it almost seems like this is on. This deals with what's the initial description and concern coming out of the mouth of the caller, and it almost seems like it, it's it's uh, an opportunity. I mean, you walked through that video on the Karen thing. I mean, that's enough to drive you crazy. So. Um, in this case, I think this is an area where um, community education can be. When you are reporting a concern, the first thing is, what's the activity? What's the behavior? Then, do you feel threatened? Then, describe the person. That's kind of the uh, sequence that the dispatch people go through. And it, that, that's just my observation. But, and I, I think that's kind of what you were getting at. She's shaking her head yet. All right, so are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, seeing none. Um, if there are members of the public who'd like to comment on this item, now is the time to call in using the number that's on your screen, uh, if you haven't called in already. Once you call in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett uh, Phillip. Uh, this law attempts to define a violation for specific intent to cause any of six harms based on any of 15 different personal characteristics. Those harms do not even have to occur. Specific intent requires proof of a state of mind, intent to harm, and an act. In this case, it's calling 911. The act of phoning itself in no way supports a claim of a particular specific intent, and otherwise the caller is engaged in what we would normally call protected free speech as the basis for intent. Trying to define speech as a civil violation, assuming intent for any speech, including references to almost any personal characteristic, is an attack on the First Amendment. This violation of specific intent to harm also allows for damages, even if there's no listed harm actually done and police merely show up. This doesn't acknowledge the officer's responsibility to protect, but instead assumes they are solely, for lack of a better phrase, no, run, no responsibility obedient robots doing the caller's bidding, no matter those harms without cause are 100% a duty preventable by the officer, and the caller cannot compel the officer to perform any of those harms. Wow, we. Uh, it's very unlikely the 911 caller flat out confesses and precisely connects the dots with these specific intents and explains listed personal characteristics are the basis to get a judgment. Chief Mills 911 feelings are irrelevant. This either tries to define legally non-existent hate speech or a much too broadly defined disallowed speech as intent to cause harmful outcomes somewhat vaguely described that are based on personal characteristics commonly mentioned in 911 speech. Discriminate against the person is very vague. The phrase based on is very vague. Feeling harassed, humiliated, or embarrassed are a person's feelings. I can think of a lot of speech that might hurt someone's feelings uh, that will never be called a crime because we have for better or, or, you know, or we better have free speech. Also, 911 callers are not trained observers, and false perception should not be a crime. 911 dispatchers routinely ask for descriptions of people. There must be laws against calling 911 with false complaints. Somehow, true, even perceived true, speech should be legal. There are infinite reasons to and not. Sorry, I have to cut you off, but the alarm went off. And, but thank you for your comments. Okay. Um, looks like Taj has raised his hand. So, Taj, if you can 
leave your video off, but you'll be also given two minutes to comment on this item. Um, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. So I just want to give a little bit of a personal view on this. As a black man, um, the Karen Law, at first I thought it was a joke. Um, I know that it's, it's going to be uh, named something else with lots of numbers and uh, letters, but uh, I'll call it the Karen Law for sake of brevity. But um, this, this is a, a step in the right direction. I will say that as a young man, I got pulled over by police and harassed by police far too often. Um, what we have seen around the country is that these, these stops and, and harassment have led to the death of, of, of many of my people. And this is one thing that's going to help codify into law that this, this, that particular thing won't happen. It, it's going to give some of us a, a breath of fresh air, hopefully, and uh, cause a little bit of pause um, so that... <clears throat> When I'm walking down the street, it's not just going to be another traumatic incident. When a when a when a police officer gets called to my side when when I haven't done anything, it's a traumatic event. It it causes me to feel less safe in my own body. It causes me to be less feel less safe around police, which um, strains our relationships, as you have seen, as many people have commented on. There there are very big issues with police being called um, on, on, on people of color. Uh, and, and we've seen it play out throughout this country since 9-11. It it's, it's been a very, very big issue. And so um, I just want to give you my perspective as a black man that this, this law is something I'm fully in favor of, and it's a step. It's not, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item? Good evening, my name is Jace. I gave some feedback earlier. I want to make this super brief. Thank you so much for your now 13 hours of service on this uh, Tuesday. Really appreciate each and every one of the counselors, truly. Um, I really appreciate and want to lift up uh, Taraj's comments and uh, amplify the fact that I'm hearing several counselors mention how they feel safe when they're able to call the police and explicitly ground this conversation and the one that we just had in the reality that many people, uh, including queer people like myself and black people like previous speaker, uh, do not feel safe and do not feel like they can contact the police when a crisis or issue arises that also is relevant to the many homeless members of our community who are important voices whom we need to center when we're considering public service uh, priorities. I hope we're able to pass this. I uh, hope we're able to call it a Karen law to identify the appropriate problem that this is responding to uh, and move quickly forward after today with immediate actions uh, to continue this conversation towards defunding and ab abolishing the police. Thank you so much. Take care. Good night. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then uh, it looks like we have one last um, speaker. Uh, Joy Plan, I'll just ask you to unmute, and then you'll be given two minutes as well. Thank you. I just want to um, reiterate what Taj had said, and um, this, again, um, sets a precedence and aids in the culture shift that I sent out an invitation to everybody to um, participate in on Thursday, May 21st. That invitation resulted in about a thousand person action, and then again, created a larger conversation, which is leading to this moment now and many moments before, again, with a greater conversation around um, black lives and how we are seen and perceived in our own home of, of Santa Cruz, the city and Santa Cruz, the county. Um, it is not illegal to walk around our town in black bodies. And this, again, sent sets the precedence to um, non-black people 
who um, may be uncomfortable by a black person walking around riding a bicycle, just being, just simply being in a black body. So I am in full support of um, this law to move forward, call it the Karen law, call it whatever you want. But I, um, as a black woman with black children, don't want people calling on um, my, me or my, my son or my grandson um, just because they happen to be living in a black body. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment and then bring it back to council for uh, further discussion, deliberation, and action. And so I'll start with council member Golden and then council member Brown. I just wanna be clear. It's not that I take issue um, with the notion that um, people should be held personally accountable if they're making false police reports and making um, false claims about people for being in neighborhoods or whatever based on their race or other um, protected classes. It's just that, um, like the way I see it, the, the community is kind of the eyes and ears for the police department. And um, I, I, I know that there's a difference. It's like we teach the kids. There's a difference between tattling and reporting. I don't want people going around being a bunch of tattletales, but reporting things that, um, like for example, one of the calls, the times I've called 911 this year was I was taking a walk along the levee and I saw a man two men actually beating up a woman. And so I called 911 and um, and I just have to say, like, I think that in those descriptors, when they ask you those questions, when you call, I, I don't know it by heart, but race is down there pretty darn low um, in the in the description. And so in a, to the extent that this will make people feel more comfortable then I'm fine with it, whatever um, we decide to call it. But the only other thing I have a problem with is calling it Karen, because I get it that it's a funny name and this, that, and the other, but I have a dear friend, her name is Karen. I, my daughter has a friend on the wrestling team, who's, you know, only in ninth grade whose name is Karen, and I feel like they get teased, and I just think it's not really fair to, to, to bully someone just because that's their name. That's also something they didn't choose. Okay, that's my, my feel. I will just say that the the ordinance is the discriminatory reports to law enforcement. So um, I think if we leave it at that, we don't have to get into the yeah. conversation around Karen. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Uh, so yeah, I'll just go ahead and move the recommendation to introduce for publication an ordinance adding chapter 9.86 uh, the discriminatory, discriminatory reports to law enforcement to the Santa Cruz Muni Code and appreciate everybody's efforts to bring this to us and uh, those who weighed in. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. And you're, you're muted, by the way. You keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and just a, a final comment regarding the um, concerns that Renee brought up. I'm, I'm trying to think of permissible and not <laughs> impermissible activities. Impermissible would be you call 911 and you say, I want a police response. There's a Latino guy who's been sitting in the park. No, that's not illegal to be Latino sitting in the park. 911 says, well, why are you calling? Well, he's been there and he's acting weird around some kids that are playing. And I mean, you know, if there's a reasonable suspicion of something awry, that would be a reason. I'm, I'm just, if others understand what I'm getting at here, there has to be a, a justifiable reason. And this is about specific intent based on, on um, characteristics that have nothing to do with a crime or a problem. 
And even I'm, I'm totally comfortable doing this. <laughs> but that's what I was saying is the first thing that they say is what is the reason for your call? And then they ask the weapons and this and that and the other. So that's, that was my point. Yeah. If, if I can just make a brief comment, um, you know, people can ask the reason for your call, but if the first thing that comes out of that person's mouth is their race and a behavior right. that's not an actual right. crime, and then they insist on the person, um, you know, the dispatcher taking that call because of that person's race or ethnicity, and they're not actually doing anything wrong. I think that's, that's what this is getting at. Yeah. And I can Absolutely. also say that yeah, I've experienced this as a, as a teenager frequently in Chicago where police would come out just because there were kids hanging out in the park and a few of them yeah. happened to be black. So this is really what it's getting at. And if it's, you know, hearing from the police chief that if there's three calls, that's three too many. And that means that if he's heard those three, there's probably many more that are happening. So, um, and so there's a motion by Councilmember Brown. I'll go ahead and second the motion uh, to move the staff recommendation. Oh, you did? Okay. Seconded by Councilmember Matthews. So um, if, is there any further discussion on this item? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Matthews to move the staff recommendation um, to introduce for publication an ordinance adding Chapter 9.86, the discriminatory reports to law enforcement to the Santa Cruz uh, Municipal Code. With that, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Councilmember Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. So I will make note, uh, Councilmember Byer is absent. All right. Um, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with council members Matthews, Golder, Brown, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, Mayor Cummings voting in, in favor, and Councilmember Byers absent. And so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude our um, meeting today and hope that everyone can join us for the last meeting of 2020 on December 8th. And so with that, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Thank everyone for being here today and thank all the council members for, for being on this meeting for the 13 hours we've been here. So. Take care, everyone. Have a good night, and we'll see you soon. Happy holidays. <laughs>